Welcome to the Kringle family the family for Christmas. Frost Kringle must find her secret pen pal and get him to fall madly in love with her in order to save Christmas in this fun holiday romance from USA Today best-selling author Lucy McConnell. Christmas magic is dangerously off-balance, forcing Frost Kringle to musters up the courage to meet her longtime pen pal in person with the hope that they can marry and save Christmas. Only it's not all that easy especially when she'd exiled from the North Pole for breaking the rules. In order to make it home for Christmas, Frost has to bring Christmas cheer to those who need it most. Tan and Cebu has decided to sell his paper mill and retire to a quiet corner of the forest where he can raise his son in peace. His announcement, right before the holidays, creates an uproar as employees wonder if they'll have a job in the new year. No one in town feels like celebrating and they have little hope of a happy holiday. If Frost can get Tannen and the town of Elderberry to believe in Christmas once again, she'll make it home and save Santa's workshop from turning into a block of ice and ruining Christmas for children all over the world. With her whole world out of balance, Frost must look deep inside herself to bring about a Christmas miracle. Marrying Miss Kringle, Frost Prologue Many years ago. Dear Santa, I haven't exactly been good. I yelled at my dad. I threw a food tray at the wall. And I peed on the bathroom floor on purpose. But, if you can, I'd like my leg back for Christmas this year. That's all. Tannen. Eight year old Frost Kringle clutched the handwritten letter to her delicate chest. The schoolroom paper crinkled in the great big silence in the North Pole's mail room. The elves were off to dinner. She should have been on her way to the dining room, but she couldn't leave mail unsorted. That was unthinkable. And this letter in the cream-colored envelope with a gold outline had called to her, even though it was in the regular mail pile and not the approved mail she was allowed to read from pile. She couldn't seem to leave it alone. And now she knew why. This boy needed her. Heavy tears pulled in her amethyst eyes at the thought of Tannen waking up on Christmas morning without a leg. Her mind tripped over the questions his letter brought up. How does a child lose a leg? Does it hurt? Is he hurt? Can they make the hurt stop? She swiped the moisture from her heavy lashes with the back of her hand and climbed down from her perch at the incoming letter's desk. The stool was just the right size for Dad, but it was too tall for her, allowing her feet to dangle and kick as she opened and sorted letters. An urgency to get the letter clutched to her chest to Santa sped her spindly legs faster and faster still, through the ornately carved wooden door, down the carpeted hallway, past the production facility, and into the quietness of the family library. She slowed to a gangly trot and stopped at her father's flannel, plaid-clad elbow. His snowy white beard and hair matched her mane, which hung down to her belt loops. Perhaps it was the lack of color in her hair that propelled her to choose clothing in every color of the rainbow. Then again, her nanny was a Christmas elf who loved to sew doll clothing, so it wasn't much of a surprise that she dressed like Barbie's little sister. Frost cleared her throat, sounding like an upset chipmunk. Dad turned from his perusal of the naughty and nice lists. His eyebrows climbed up his forehead. What have we here? His arms lifted, allowing Frost access to his lap, a place children from all over the world had whispered their wishes into Santa's eager ear. A letter. She sniffed and loosened her hold, allowing the letter to slide out of her grasp. Instantly, she felt as though an ice block settled in its place, and she wanted it back. With all her eight-year-old fortitude, she refrained from grabbing it out of Dad's large hands. Dad adjusted his gold-rimmed, half-moon glasses before silently reading the letter. As his eyes moved down the page, his eyebrows sank lower and lower. Was this in your approved pile? She shook her head, her chin almost touching her chest. Kringles weren't supposed to lie, it was part of their heritage. Frost found that she had the ability to stretch the truth, but not the desire. 
With her white hair and small stature already setting her apart from her sisters, she didn't want to stand out because Christmas magic hadn't included the compulsion to tell the truth in her genetic makeup. So the truth tumbled out like children down a sledding hill. I couldn't help it. The envelope was so pretty. She patted her tummy, thinking she tucked the beautiful stationery between the envelope and her shirt. Too late, she realized she'd left her excuse in the mail room. Dad patted her, his hand so big it covered her whole back. You need to stick to your letters, Frost. Or I can't let you help Sword anymore. She cringed away as if he'd struck her. Not sort letters? That was like not being allowed to eat Christmas fudge or give a gift on Christmas morning. Sorting letters was part of her DNA, and she loved sorting. But what will happen to Tannen? Dad stroked his snowy beard, the curls pulling into waves and then bouncing back into place. I'll have your mother look into this one. Perhaps we can get him a prosthetic. What's a prost headache? Dad let out a soft ho 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 it's a replacement leg that will allow him to walk. But he wants his leg back. Frost pointed at the letter. Hadn't Dad read it all the way? Tannen doesn't want a fake leg, he wants his leg. I know, sugar. But there's some things even I can't do. He kissed her hair. The comforting smell of peppermint wrapped her up like a warm blanket. Promise me you'll stick to your letters? I promise. Frost swiped her fingers across her chest to make an X. All right, then. Clean up your workstation and wash up for dinner. He set her on her feet and patted her head. Frost dragged herself out of the library. She'd never imagined that her father, Santa, couldn't do something. He'd always been able to fulfill children's Christmas wishes, assuming they were on the nice list, of course. While Tannen may not behave well, he had a good reason. He did sound like he felt bad for what he'd done. Dad didn't say anything about putting him on the naughty list, thank goodness. She passed the production area and plodded down the carpeted hallway towards the mail room, her heart heavy knowing Santa couldn't fix this for Tannen. There were things Santa couldn't do. The knowledge tipped her world on its axis. All her life, Santa was full of magic and mystery and goodness. He was perfect. Or at least she thought he was perfect. A chink in his armor was disturbing, to say the least. Once back on her stool, a glitter of gold drew her out of her contemplative haze. She reached for the envelope, neatly opened and forgotten on the table in her rush to find Dad, and turned it over to brush her fingers across the address. Santa Claus. North Pole. In the upper left-hand corner was Tannen's name and address. Frost looked and looked at that address. She chewed her lip and she squirmed in her chair as an idea began to form. A naughty list idea. Frost got a wonderful naughty list idea. She reached for a pen, a paper, and stamp. She wrote a letter by the light of a lamp. And she folded it tight, stuffed it into a lobe. Her eyes burning as bright as a heliotrope. The letter went out with the evening mail. And Frost kept her secret and chewed on her nails. Not a week went by before Tannen replied. And Frost answered that letter and she lied, 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 lied. She lied by omission, denial, and mistake. She lied over dinner and breakfast and cake. But with each letter that came from Tannen Cebu, she fell for the boy and her heart grew and grew. Chapter 1 Present Day I hereby call the first meeting of the single Kringles to order. Frost Kringle, age 23, jumped as her sister, Stella, clanged a Christmas bell. The sound filled the family room and bounced off the rock fireplace. A yule log burned bright, its yellow warmth muted by the overhead lights. The North Pole was running on full power, for now. Frost discreetly covered her ears in case Stella decided to ring the bell once again for fun. 
Having worked in the mail room her whole life, Frost was used to the soft sounds of paper shuffling and else typing and not the loud clanging of Christmas bells. Stella was in production, where she often shouted to be heard over the toy-making machines. Plus, she was a loud personality. Across from Frost, Robin groaned. Peppermints, Stella, don't call us the single Kringles. Robin was the oldest and most sensitive about their single status. She dated a man for six years only to have him break her heart. Then, her heart went through an earthquake two Christmases ago when Christmas Magic picked Ginger to be the next Santa instead of Robin. She'd been through a lot the last two years, watching Ginger and then Lux fall in love and get married, always the bridesmaid and never the bride. This should be her year to find a husband, and yet Robin hadn't left the North Pole in six months. Maybe she'd given up on love. That would be catastrophic for them all. According to their math geek and resident scientist Lux's calculations, all five Kringle girls needed to find true love, it was that love that fed Christmas magic, which in turn powered the North Pole. If even one Kringle failed, their home would fall into the sea, the elves would disappear into puffs of elfin dust, the reindeer wouldn't fly, and children would wake up to empty trees Christmas morning. Robin pinned Stella with a look that said don't mess with me today. Her auburn hair was tucked into a beautiful chignon, and she wore a simple white shirt with a quilted teal vest. Her lipstick was perfect and stayed that way all day long. Frost rubbed her dry lips together, doing her best not to compare herself to her older sister, a difficult task on her best day. While Robin was a classic beauty, Frost was an acquired taste. Her snowy white hair didn't take color from a bottle, no matter how many times she tried dyeing it brown, black, or red. She wore it halfway to her waist in loose waves. And instead of wearing serviceable clothing, she dressed like a Barbie doll. Designing and sewing clothing was one of her favorite pastimes, second only to reading. Today she had on zebra-striped leggings and a chunky hot pink cowl neck sweater with matching ankle boots. What? asked Stella, her chestnut-colored eyes dancing with mirth. I thought it had a nice ring to it. She clanked the bell, this time much softer. Robin made a sour face. Frost giggled behind her hand. She loved a good punny joke. Eat a chocolate, Stella commanded Robin, or your face will stay that way. Stella was the wild Kringle daughter, the one who flirted with the naughty list on a weekly basis. She had short black hair that she used to spike up on a swoop, but she'd grown it out so that one side was longer than the other, tucking just under her chin and accentuating her striking bone structure. She had on olive green hiking pants, a black t-shirt, and black army boots that thumped on the hardwood floors, sounding an awful lot like their dad when he tromped into a room. Don't mind if I do. Robin reached for one of the hand-dipped chocolates in the middle of the table. They were beautiful, nestled into mom's favorite candy dishes. Frost's eyes darted from the blank pad of paper in front of her to the open computer in front of Stella and the cup of eggnog before each sister, Stella knew how to hold a meeting. Frost took a sip, enjoying the extra dash of cinnamon and sugar across the top. Stella rubbed her hands together. All righty, then. Robin, you're in charge of coming up with a name for our little group before the next meeting. Robin shook her head and muttered, when reindeer skate. Frost lightly kicked Robin in the shin. You'd better not pout. I'm not pouting. Frost's lips twitched with a smile. Your bottom lip is so far out, Ginger would put you on the naughty list. She snatched up a piece of fudge and tossed it into her mouth to suppress her giggles. Stella wrapped her knuckles on the tabletop. Let's get right to business, we need men. Frost choked on the fudge. The backs of her eyes prickled. She took a deep breath and then drank a long pull of eggnog. Stella continued as if she hadn't pointed at the elephant in the room. One of us has to say I do before Christmas. Since me and Snake broke up, and it's November, things are desperate. Did you really think a guy named Snake was going to work out? asked Robin. She eyed the chocolates before selecting one with a rum butter center. Talk about desperation. 
Stella's nose wrinkled. I am desperate. You're still moping over what's his name who broke up with you three years ago, and Frost doesn't leave the mail room. I'm carrying this family, and the survival of Christmas as we know it, on my shoulders. It's time you two step it up. Robin's eyes took on a faraway look. I can't imagine loving anyone else. Elmer was perfect. Frost reached across the table and patted Robin's hand. A six-year relationship was nothing to get over quickly. They all thought Elmer was the one, except for Dad. But Dad didn't like any of the men they dated, so that wasn't saying much. Since Elmer had broken their sister's heart, the Kringle women all thought he was a tool. Stella was less understanding. You've had two Christmases to get over him. What do you do with a broken candy cane? Throw it out, answered Robin. Well? Stella tipped her head, saying so much more with her attitude than she could ever get out with words. I know. The pain in Robin's voice caused Frost's heart to ache in sympathy. Part of her Santa gift was an understanding of people and their motives. She could read between the lines of the letters children wrote and know exactly what they meant. That ability often transferred to conversations. That was one of the reasons she didn't like to leave the North Pole. The opportunity to take upon herself others' problems got her into trouble. We can't give up, Stella insisted. If Ginger and Lux can find good men, then we can too. Frost pressed her palms together in front of her chest. Every time I think about Ginger's Christmas Eve wedding, the coordinating dresses, the magical twinkling lights, and the giant snowflakes falling softly, I'm giddy with the romance. And Lux's elopement was just as romantic, but in a totally different way. She sighed contentedly. I can't wait to see you two married. Stella and Robin exchanged looks that said they were so much more mature than their youngest sister. Something shifted in Robin. She sat up taller and lifted her chin. Stella's right, we need to make this happen. But we aren't going to find men by hiding in the ice palace. Her eyes darted back and forth between the two of them. I think we need to head south, maybe even stay a week. Frost's heart fluttered like a bird caught in a cage. South? She didn't do south, unless you counted Easter dinner in Mexico with their grandparents. Stella leaned in. It's mid-November. Robin ran her finger in circles on the table. It's hard candy-making season now. The elves have done that for centuries without me. I could take a week. You? Production is busy all year long. Stella blew out her lips. Although I could manage things remotely thanks to Lux's new system. If she could set me up with text alerts, I think I could go. They both turned on Frost. She shook her head, making her white hair shake in front of her face. Why you two go on ahead? Both their heads tipped in sympathy. Frost felt it, and while she was grateful they tried to understand, she needed to stay home. We'll be with you the whole time, offered Stella. Sure, until you see some guy with more muscles than brains. Robin smirked at her sister. But I promise to stick with you. Frost rubbed her arms. It's not my year. I'm the youngest. You two should find your husbands first. Robin huffed. Apparently, Christmas magic doesn't give a partridge in a pear tree about birth order. And I don't either. Come with us, just to get used to being Souther. Frost hesitated, searching for a polite way to tell them to jump out of a flying sleigh. Stella took her hesitation as a silent agreement and forged on. Perfect. Where should we go? I was thinking of heading back to Alaska. No thanks. Robin popped another chocolate. We need someplace new. Frost puzzled the question of where they should go. She puzzled it high and she puzzled it low. And while she puzzled, a strange thought came to be. 
a thought she thought just might be the key. She tried to hold it in, did her best to be good. But there was a part of Frost Kringle that never quite could. Oregon, Frost whispered, staring off into space. Elderberry, Oregon. That's the place. Both her sisters stared at her. Why there? asked Stella. Frost cleared her throat, breaking through the fog that had clouded her mind while at the same time giving herself clarity. She mentally stumbled to come up with an excuse that wouldn't reveal her biggest and best-kept secret. It's got a large populate of single men. There's a, um, paper company and mill and they make beautiful stationery. Like cream envelopes with gold trim that bring the most wonderful letters. Stella shrugged. As long as it's got men, I'm game. Robin poked Stella in the arm. That's your problem, you need to be pickier. Do you have a better idea? Frost held her breath. She dreamed and dreamed of going to Elderberry, of meeting Tannen, of finally seeing the man whose words had captured her heart. If she was a romantic, it was because each mail delivery included a little bit of romance just for her. No, admitted Robin. Okay, then. Stella slapped her hand on the table. Meeting adjourned. We're going to Elderberry the day after tomorrow. Have your bags packed. Frost threaded her fingers together under the table, holding her hands tight, tight, tight in an effort to hold in her excitement as her sisters left the room. She was going to meet Tannen. I'm going to meet Tannen, she said out loud. With a squeal, she threw her hands in the air. This trip may be the best thing that ever happened to her, or it may be the ending of a long and special friendship. Either way, the time had come to meet her crush face to face. Chapter 2 Dear Tannen, Thank you for the paper samples. They are scrumptious. I'm particularly fond of the purple sheets, which is why I've chosen to write on one of them today. I believe you spoil me, Mr. Cebu. If you were here, or I were there, I would grant you a Christmas wish. What would you wish for if you could have anything in the world? I could fly to Germany and bring you spritz cookies or Russia for tiki maloko. Or, I could pick you up a ukulele from Hawaii. Say the word and your wish is granted. In answer to your question, I adore children. How could I not? The whole purpose of life at the North Pole is to make children happy. I, more so than anyone except for possibly Santa, feel connected to them because I get to read their letters. I suppose any one of my sisters or brothers-in-law could walk into the mail room and pick up a letter, but none of them do and I'm quite all right with that. In answer to your other question, I dressed as the Ice Queen for Halloween this year. I know you think adults aren't supposed to dress up and trick or treat, but my niece encouraged us all to make this Halloween a real one, and since none of us can say no to the little fairy, we did just that. We had a Snow White, a Cinderella, an Ice Queen, a Belle, and a Rapunzel. We weren't allowed to take pictures of my brothers-in-law in costume, which is a shame. My parents and the elves answered doors for our troop of royalty. I must say, I'm particularly fond of my gown. I won't bore you with the sparkly details, but it's stunning enough that I truly feel like a princess when I slipped into the satin. I left a trail of glitter behind me, no doubt. I'm sure the elves love to clean that November 1st. How is work? You sounded stressed in your last letter, and I'm worried for you. I have to go, the mail sleigh is leaving soon and I'd like to get this letter in the bag before it flies off. I don't want you to think that I've forgotten you. I couldn't do that even if I tried. Have a merry day. Miss Kringle. Tannen Cebu closed his eyes and let out a contented sigh. Ever since he could remember, he'd felt lighter after reading one of Miss Kringle's letters. This time was particularly enlightening because he'd worried something fierce over asking her about children. He'd never told her of his teenaged antics, of the time he'd spent making himself and his parents miserable. 
No, she believed the best of him as a child, teen, and now adult of 26 years, and he'd withheld information in order to keep it that way. He opened his eyes and glanced at the picture of his seven-year-old son, Connor, riding on the tractor with his grandpa. They loved to putter around the forest together on that thing. Tannen shook himself. Miss Kringle was a fantasy that could never happen. Heck, he didn't even know if she was real or some psychologist his dad had hired to help him through a tough time. He wouldn't put it past the old man to have read his Christmas letter all those years ago and sought help from a professional. The more he thought about it, the more unlikely he found that to be a plausible explanation. For one, a professional psychologist wouldn't encourage him to believe in Santa as a 26-year-old man. And Miss Frost most definitely perpetuated the Santa myth. For two, someone hired when he'd had his leg amputated would have been much older than him. He'd read and reread all of Miss Kringle's letters over the years. While her penmanship was excellent at eight years old, it was not that of an adult. And it had gotten better over time, so gradually that it was impossible to think she was faking her age. Therefore, as much as he would have liked to end the secrecy surrounding his unidentified woman by saying she was hired by his father, the mystery remained. His other theory was that she'd been in his class at school, or perhaps the hospital ward where he'd had chemo treatments and eventually his leg removed just above the knee. He'd done an exhaustive search of all the people he remembered from back in the days of antiseptic smells and prosthetic fittings, and none of them seemed capable of pulling off an elaborate ruse such as this. He should be reading through the eco-reports on the effluent treatment line, but his soul was tired, tired of the fight to keep this company thriving. Instead, he removed a sheet of paper from his drawer, along with a matching envelope, and penned a reply. He'd stopped wondering if Miss Kringle would answer back years ago. She would. She always did, though her answers often surprised him. If he asked for her first name, he got a no. If he asked for a picture, he got a no. But if he asked what she liked best about her work in letters, she'd tell him that she loved reading Christmas wishes because wishes were honest. He carefully penned her name and address on the outside of the envelope, adding his name and return address as always. Each letter looked the same on the outside. He wondered if Miss Kringle waited on bated breath for his letters as he waited for hers. One moment he was sure he was in love with her, and the next he would question if any of this was real, including his feelings. Mr. C. Boo? Tannen looked up from his task to find his secretary, Mrs. Guerin, clutching a folder, her bulbous knuckles white in the folder in serious danger of being crushed. She had a toy turkey pin on her jacket, the only sign in the entire office that Thanksgiving was less than a week away. Yes? I have the recommendations you asked for. A cold sweat broke out along his bald head. Curse chemo for stealing his hair anyway. He was an exception in the medical community, staying bald after the treatments. You can leave it on the corner of my desk. He nodded, indicating which corner. He had no more of a desire to glance through the list of people to fire than Mrs. Guerin had to hand it over. He wondered if her son-in-law was on the list. Jesse was one of the latest men hired to work in the plant, which meant he would be one of the first let go. It probably killed her to type his name, but Mrs. Guerin was honest to a fault and he was a tool for asking her to compile the list. Had he thought before speaking, he would have given the assignment to someone else. Who? He had no idea. Besides being honest, Mrs. Guerin was discreet, a quality he valued more now that he may have to do company-wide layoffs. She walked slowly to the desk, dropped the folder as if it were a hot lump of coal, and backed away. After a moment of glaring at his floor, she cleared her throat. Your three o'clock is here. Tannen retrieved a handkerchief from his suit pocket and dabbed his forehead. Send them in. He stood, checked to see if his tie was straight, and tugged at the bottom of his suit coat. He wasn't sure who this guy was, but he'd made the appointment over two weeks ago and it wouldn't do to keep him waiting. A man who couldn't be much older than Tannen strode into the office with his hand outstretched. Tannen C. Boo, 
It's good to finally meet you. Brad Goodfellow. Brad. They shook hands and went through the pleasantries. Tannen noticed his letter on the desk, the North Pole address clearly visible. As Brad complimented him on everything from the product to plant efficiency, he tucked the letter into his outgoing stack and then leaned back in his chair, waiting for the real reason this guy had waltzed into his office. Which brings me to why I'm here. It's about time, Tannen thought. Brad set one ankle on the other knee in an effort to appear relaxed. He didn't. I represent the Huffman Lumber Company. As I'm sure you're aware, lumber prices have been climbing the last few years. Tannen nodded. The fact was common knowledge in Oregon, where lumber companies were king of the hills. His paper mill was tucked up into the mountains and was the heart and soul of elderberry. 75% of the people who lived in the town made their living off the plant in one way or another. The weight of that responsibility could crush a man's soul in a few short years. Which was probably why his father had taken the first shot at retirement he got and didn't look back. While Dad was busy being the world's best grandpa, Tannen was stuffed into a suit and shoved into an office every day. We couldn't help but notice that you're sitting on some fine land up here and have trees ready to harvest, and we'd like to make you an offer. Tannen lifted his hand. I can't sell you our trees, Brad. I'd be seriously hurting our future. Brad's two big lips spread into a too big smile. I'm not asking to buy your trees, Mr. Cebu. I'm offering to buy your land. What good does that do me? Without his land, which was paid for, the paper company would go under in less than three months. It would do you quite a bit of good. Brad pulled a business card out of his pocket, placed it on the table, and pushed it towards Tannen. You would be set for life, Mr. C. Boo, as would your children if you were stupid with the money and your great-grandchildren if you're smart. Tannen stared at the little card with more zeros than he had ever seen in his life. With that kind of money, he could be a full-time dad. He could attend every little league game, every parent-teacher conference, and every family dinner. Doors would open for him and his son all over the world. He could meet Miss Kringle in Germany for that cookie or in Hawaii for ukulele lessons. He could marry her. Which, up to this point, had been a dream his heart made and one that he'd only alluded to in his letters. But that was flirting, knowing full well she'd shoot him down. What would he do if he really saw her? If she said yes? His fingers glided over his scalp. What would she think of a man with a stump for a leg and no hair? It was one thing to read about them in print and quite another to see the look in person. He glanced up to find Brad leaning back in his chair and kicking his legs out in front of him as if he owned the place. For the amount of money he offered, he very well could own the plant. Tannen pulled out a blank sheet of luxurious 100% cotton stock paper and picked up his fountain pen. Talk to me about particulars. Brad sprang forward in his seat. Really? Was this a joke? Tannen scowled. He hated being teased, had had quite enough of it during junior high school. No, but Brad rubbed his hands down his pant legs, no doubt sweating under the pressure. I didn't expect you to say yes. I said I'd listen, so start talking. Brad scooted so far to the edge of his seat it was a miracle he didn't fall on his backside. Here's what we had in mind. Mr. C. Boo? Mrs. Guerin stood at the door, her face ashen. I don't feel right. Tannen sprung upward. His limp was more pronounced when he was in a hurry, but that didn't stop him from racing across the room. He didn't make it before she grabbed her arm, her face contorted in pain, and she tumbled forward, landing in a heap. He stuck his prosthetic straight out to the side and landed hard on his left knee. Her chest moved up and down, and he found her pulse racing against his fingers. Call an ambulance, he barked at Brad, who was watching the whole scene through his fingers like a kid at a horror flick. He scrambled for his cell phone and made the call. Mrs. Guerin? 
Tannen lightly tapped her cheeks, afraid to move her in case she'd injured herself when she fell. She groaned and tried to roll onto her back. Tannen helped her get more comfortable. It's going to be okay. Help is on the way. She didn't appear to be fully conscious, but he talked about her daughter anyway, just in case she could hear him. The paramedics arrived quickly and Tannen was pushed out of the way. He used the door handle to pull himself to standing, aware that most of the eyes in the office were on him and not his dedicated secretary on the floor. That was a good thing. If he could save her some embarrassment by looking awkward, then he'd gladly do it, because the prim and proper woman would die if she saw herself sprawled out on the gray carpet. Within twenty minutes, the place had cleared out of emergency personnel and their equipment. Mrs. Guerin was on her way to the hospital for an MRI, her daughter en route to help. Tannen leaned against the wall just outside his office, trying to catch his breath. Brad gathered his shiny briefcase. This may not be the best time to discuss our deal. He offered his hand. I hope she gets well soon. I'll call, and maybe we can get together after the holiday. Tannen shook his hand and nodded. I'd like to know more about this. Thank you. A small crowd hung around, still talking about the excitement. Tannen watched as Brad walked through them. At the last second, Davy from accounting grabbed his sleeve. Brad's face lit up like they were old friends and they talked for a minute. Tannen was about to disappear into his office, he'd need to hire a temp until Mrs. Gannon was back on her feet when he saw Brad point a finger toward his office. Davy jerked back as if shocked. Tannen narrowed his eyes, willing Brad to keep the topic of their conversation under wraps. He didn't need the rumor mill, which ran as efficiently as the paper mill, to get wind of a potential sale. That could be disastrous for his family. He went into his office and shut the door, knowing there was nothing he could do about it now. He found the number of a temp office located two towns over and put in a request for a replacement secretary before picking up his stack of letters and heading for the door. Real life was heavy, and he was already looking forward to the lightness that came with Miss Kringle's next letter. Chapter 3 Dear Miss Kringle I try not to think about who you really are, but sometimes I can't help but wonder. I saw a commercial this morning. It was one of those public advisory things to teach children the skills to survive in this crazy world. The focus was online safety, and they covered the basics, not giving away personal information to strangers, be careful what you post because you can't take it back, keep your privacy setting high, and don't believe profile pictures. I've broken all the basic rules with you. Well, except for the picture rule, since you won't send me a photo. Hint, hint. As sad as I am that I can't put a face with the name, there is a certain freedom that comes from being anonymous, isn't there? Sometimes, I sit at the coffee shop in town when I need a break from the office, and I wonder if you're the woman in yoga pants who orders dairy-free hot chocolate and a gluten-free brownie every Thursday morning. Somehow, I don't think that's you. I feel like some part of me would recognize you. But, I have to ask, is that you? Are you that close to me and I don't know it? The idea that I could lay eyes on you at any minute gets me through each day. You are my hope in the sunrise and my faith when the world goes dark. Yes, work is still stressful. It's nice to know someone cares about how things affect me. Most people around here are worried about themselves. They see me as a statue, a body without feelings, a machine who operates on code instead of emotion. Trust me, I feel all the things they think I'm immune to. We aren't doing well financially. Companies all over the U.S. are going paperless. It's easier. Less messy. And, they claim, better for the environment. I can't convince them that we replenish the forest we take down and that paper is still of value. We harvest trees my dad planted before I was born, and we plant more each year. Sales are down 20% from this time last year. As hard as this all is on me, 
I fear it is much harder on Dad. I've let him down, Miss Kringle. I'm a failure in my father's eyes. I don't know if you can understand that feeling. Does Santa ever get disappointed? I can't believe the questions I ask you. We started this relationship on the premise that you're Santa's daughter, and you've continued the pretense so beautifully that when I close my eyes, I can picture your home at the North Pole. At times, I think I'm the only person over ten who still addresses their letters to the North Pole mailroom. These letters are far outside the reality of my life, and yet, sometimes they're more real to me than the shoe on my foot. You once told me that you are one of five daughters, that Santa's daughters are rare. Miss Kringle, you are more prized than one in five. You are a singularity. As always, my Christmas wish is to take you to dinner. Say the word and I will clear a landing strip for your magical sleigh. Just one date, Miss Kringle, one chance to offer you my heart in person. Until then, your secret identity is safe with me. Tannin. What Chug got there? Frost jumped at Robin's voice so close to her ear. She stuffed Tannen's latest missive into the Steria Rose purse hanging by the detachable shoulder strap that took her from evening chic to daytime fabulous. Today, the purse was the exact shade of taupe as her heels. And nothing. Nothing sounds an awful lot like something when your voice cracks. Robin pulled a small wagon to a stop next to the sleigh. They were taking a smaller sleigh with red velvet cushions to Oregon. The big sleigh was only pulled out for the Christmas Eve ride and practice runs with the top eight reindeer. Although, as Frost considered her rolling clothing rack and Robin's overloaded wagon, the larger sleigh may need to be dusted off and brought out of storage. She wasn't leaving behind one stitch of clothing. Options were a girl's best friend when meeting the love of her life for the first time. Frost tugged on the hem of her Christmas green sheath dress. The matching green and white checked coat hung an inch shorter than the dress. Oh, the internal debate about what to wear to meet Tannen. She'd spend hours at the sewing machine, making five new outfits, all of which she'd found reason to pack instead of wear. Tilly, her old nanny elf, had also hummed her way through bolts of fabric. She had thought useful while Frost thought romantical. Tilly supplied flowing pants and blouses, a tennis skirt and top, an evening gown, and a smart riding outfit in case Frost needed to ride off into the sunset on horseback. Tilly was practical-minded that way. After all, what woman doesn't need a riding ensemble? The dress she'd chosen for today, her last-ditch attempt at the sewing machine, had come out just right, and she felt confident, competent, and beautiful. The power of a well-fitted drapery was third only to Christmas magic and true love. Blitz stomped his hoof impatiently. Robin passed him a carrot, the green tops leafy and fragrant. As most reindeer were, Blitz was thrown off his train of thought by the treat. Dangling a carrot in front of them was the equivalent of yelling squirrel at a dog. Stella insisted on driving them to Elderberry. Their self-appointed single Kringle Committee chairwoman had assigned herself two jobs for the trip, find them a place to stay, and arrange transportation. If Frost had been thinking a little more clearly when assignments were handed out, and not thinking about Tannen's letter waiting for her in the mail sack, then she would have volunteered to drive. Stella and Blitz were a scary fast combination, both liked to take risks. Frost wasn't opposed to risk-taking. Hadn't she paired a Catholic schoolgirl skirt with striped leggings and a flowered shirt? Okay, so maybe she hadn't left the mail room that day. Maybe she wasn't a huge risk-taker. And maybe that's why it had taken her so long to find the courage to meet Tannen. She still hadn't come clean to any of her sisters. Telling them about her secret pen pal was a risk that wasn't worth taking. There were rules, both spoken and unspoken, and one of them was not answering Santa's letters. Ginger, her sister who'd taken on the Santa role, had told Joseph who she was before she married him. And Lux, her Avenger-loving nerdy sister, had spilled the jelly beans about who she really was and where they were going to live to quick, and then married him. 
While she may want to marry Tannen, nuptials weren't a done deal so she felt safer keeping certain details to herself. It's just a letter. She stored her bag on the velvet seat and began the pre-flight check of Blitz's harness. Selra, the head elf of the stables, had brought him out of his stall. She didn't trust anyone else with the spirited and mischievous animal, and Frost didn't blame her. Blitz stomped his hooves and her threw his antlers around like a big shot. Frost tugged at the cinch with a grunt. She wouldn't put it past him to bloat out when he was hooked up so he could relax and have enough room in the harness to take the sleigh into an unexpected roll. Don't forget my mailbag. I'm going to have to keep up on things while we're away. Robin continued transferring bags of groceries and ingredients into the sleigh. Accessible from the back, the empty space under the seat was, for lack of a better word, a trunk. She tugged the half-full mail bag off the ground and pushed it into the back corner. You work too hard. Like you're one to talk. Frost smiled to let her sister know she was teasing. You're bringing your work with you too. She lifted a bag full of canned goods and shook it to emphasize her point. Baking isn't work. Robin swiped her arm across her forehead. Well, except for carrying heavy ingredients around. Yeah, and I got these muscles reading. Frost flexed and made Robin laugh. They spent time ice climbing each week, a pastime their mother had brought them up to enjoy. Did you have a chance to order us winter wear? Robin retrieved her magical Kringle bag, a brown leather tote with an outside zipper pocket and two large leather tassels for decoration. She pulled out her recipe box and then put it back in as if she was worried she'd left it behind. Like she needed the box anymore. Her brain was a recipe search engine. A small trill skittered across Frost's shoulders and she hugged herself in excitement. I did! They should be there within an hour of landing. I got overnight shipping for free. Good. We don't want to stand out. Frost nodded. A Kringle's body temperature remained constant no matter what the weather. This was good for living at the North Pole, but not so good for blending in with the general populace. They had to remind one another to wear coats when it stormed, or t-shirts and shorts in the sun. Frost had the hardest time. Her fancy dresses didn't work well with ski coats. She'd found several wool skirts online for her sisters that had her clicking away. They would also get parkas, dress coats, ski pants, and lined leggings. Probably more than they would wear while they were there. But then again, options. Her fingers tingled with anticipation of opening all those boxes. Online shopping was so much more fun than going to a store because the goods arrived by mail. She wanted to giggle just thinking of the items being packaged, labeled, and passed from truck to truck to get to Oregon. Stella arrived carrying her black leather and silver zippered Kringle bag over one shoulder and her laptop case over the other. She tugged Blitz's ear as she passed, getting a friendly nip at her side for her efforts. Neither of them was being mean, that was just the way they showed their affection. I was followed. Stella's red lips twisted in a sour expression and her boots stomped in displeasure. Behind her walked Mom and Dad. Mom had on a candy cane striped apron. She'd be covering for Robin in the kitchens while they were away. Her cinnamon brown hair was pulled up into a high bun with wisps of hair framing her face in the front. She wore mom jeans, which thankfully were coming back into style. The high waists were Frost's teenaged nightmare. When she begged her mom to try low-rise jeans, she was told that mom knew her stomach had been stretched out by five pregnancies and she didn't need the muffin top to remind her. High-rise jeans made that muffin top look like a pancake. Frost had ordered several new pairs the minute they hit stores, and though she still wasn't a huge fan, she was beginning to see the fun side of lengthening the look of her legs, especially since she was the shortest Kringle at the North Pole. Dad wore khaki pants and a red flannel shirt. His white beard was recently trimmed and his cheeks were rosy red. What's up with you? Robin asked Stella. I'm what's up with her, Mom answered before Stella could. 
I gave her a couple dating rules for this girl's trip you're all taking. Stella admired her black fingernails. I prefer the term manhunt to girl's trip. Frost and Robin groaned in unison. Being called the single Kringles was bad enough. Painting them as desperate women hunting up a husband only rubbed cinnamon oil into the wound. Please don't, Robin warned. Stella rolled her eyes. Frost turned to her parents. Stella would get over her pout. What rules? Since she'd already broken one of Santa's biggest rules by writing Tannen a couple times a week, she made up for it by sticking to every other rule like double-sided sticky tape. Dad put his hand on Mom's lower back in a sign of support. His gaze ran over his daughter's. When it landed on Frost, she only let their eyes meet for a brief moment, afraid he'd see inside her soul, find her secret, and put her on the naughty list post-haste. She angled her body to hide her bag where Tannen's letter waited for her. Dad didn't have X-ray vision, but he was connected to Christmas magic, and that was unpredictable at best. Tannen's words just one date raced through her head and made her blood pound. He didn't know it, but his Christmas wish, the same wish he had since that first Christmas, was about to come true. Of course, as a ten-year-old he hadn't wished for a date, he had wished to meet her. It wasn't until he turned twenty that his letters turned sweet, bumbling though they were at times. He didn't bumble through invitations anymore. He'd grown quite eloquent and convincing as of late, making her heart race at the sight of his golden envelopes. Rule number one. Mom held up one finger. No more guys with reptile, car part, or naughty list names. Frost covered her mouth with her hands to hold back her snicker. In the past two years, Stella had dated a snake, a gecko, a dragon, a python, and a skink. And then there was Axel, Ford, and Diesel. Frost had had to look up skink to prove it was a reptile. It was. She has a point. Robin closed the trunk and brushed her hands together. It was full, and they still needed to fit Frost's wardrobe. Maybe they could just take the whole rolling clothes rack. Robin continued, it's not working, so you should try another route. Maybe guys named after birds or something. Stella grunted and folded her arms. Rule number two, no kissing on the first date. A strangled gurgle came from Stella's direction. Everyone ignored her. Rule number three, dad has to like him. Might as well date a priest, protested Stella. Sorry, sis. Priests don't date. Ginger grinned as she headed for Stella. She'd come to see them off and had just walked through the door. Wearing a red sweater with a white reindeer silhouette on the front and black leggings, she looked comfortable and yet cute. Her brown, wavy hair was pulled back in a high ponytail. When she got to her sister, she hooked her elbow around Stella's neck and gave her a cherry red kiss on the cheek as a hello and a goodbye. Stella shoved her away and swiped at her cheek, but she did it with a smile. Frost envied their closeness. She kept Ginger at the same arm's length that she kept Dad at, because Ginger had inherited Dad's naughty-slash-nice-list radar. Even as kids, Ginger was the one who would work to keep them on the nice side of the list. Perhaps that's why she and Stella were so close, Stella needed nice-list tutoring. Layla, Ginger's stepniece, and Joseph, Ginger's husband, joined them. Joseph reached for Ginger's hand and brought it to his lips. Two Christmases of marriage while raising Joseph's niece and they still acted like newlyweds. They also made a great Christmas team, delivering gifts to children all over the world in one night. Frost turned away, the ache inside for that kind of acceptance, no, for the adoration Ginger and Joseph shared, was too much to watch when she didn't have a man in her life. She wanted that man to be Tannen, wanted it so badly that she was scared down to her green and white striped toenails. Frost pulled her snowy white braid over her shoulder and tugged on a few strands to loosen it. The fear of being let down by Tannen was barely outdistanced by Faith. She and Tannen had written back and forth for sixteen years. She knew him and he knew her. 
she believed that enough to put their professions of deeper feelings than friendship to the test. Don't you think, Frost? Luxo's question startled her out of her thoughts. When had Lux and Quick joined the impromptu farewell party? She'd been so lost in her thoughts of Tannen that she hadn't noticed their arrival. I, uh... She spaced out again. Robin patted her arm. Frost glanced quickly around the growing circle, certain the word guilty was tinsel tattooed across her forehead. Christmas magic had branded Ginger with a silver snowflake tattoo on the inside of her wrist, and Frost wouldn't put it past the unpredictable force to oust her secret in such a way. Robin took pity on her and said, Lux was just saying we should stop in at the post office first. She thinks a mail carrier would be a good match for you. And, added quick, post offices in small towns are great places to uncover secrets. What? Frost honked, rubbing an itch just above her eyebrow. Quick's brown eyes brightened. Just think of how much classified information you have stored in that mail room. As a former military man, he was always thinking strategically. And he noticed too much, paying attention when most people would let Frost disappear into the background, well, as much as she could. She kind of stood out without having to try. Like a crack in the ice that hinted at danger, an unfamiliar heat built inside Frost's chest. She pointed a finger at the word army on Quick's shirt. You stay out of my mail room. Her voice had a seldom heard edge to it, a warning. Quick held up both hands. Okay. He glanced at Lux for help. She lifted her shoulders, as surprised by Frost's tone as Quick. Frost was the perpetually happy one. She went along with things. She did not give out dire warnings. The one time she'd become frantic was last Christmas, when Lux and Quick were building a substation to convert Christmas magic into power for the production facility, the ovens, and pretty much the whole palace. They were running late and the mail hadn't come through because the magic withered as the two of them denied their feelings for one another. It wasn't until they finally gave in and kissed that the magic righted. Stella slid a pair of sunglasses on her head. As fun as it is to stand around the stables and chit-chat, we need to be on our way. There's a man out there, she glared at Mom. With a boring name, just waiting for me. Lux surged forward and wrapped Frost in a hug. Stocking stuffers, it's going to be so quiet around here without you three. Frost returned her hug, laughing lightly. Think of it as the calm before the storm. Lux nodded. You're right. Oliver will be here for Thanksgiving and Christmas break. We'll be worn out before New Year's. Lux's stepson spent most of the year with his mother in California. He'd started school this year, and she'd wanted him in a normal educational environment. She made a strong argument about having friends. Since the only other child at the North Pole was Layla, Ginger's niece, who had grown up in Alaska and was used to being with adults and not children, they agreed to not make a fuss about his departure. They did bargain for school breaks with the six-year-old. Bargain in one, since Amy, Quick's ex, preferred holiday parties and late nights to bedtime stories. Frost crinkled her nose. Make sure he writes Santa. Just cause he's your stepson doesn't mean he can ice skate by on traditions. I will. Lux moved on to embrace Stella and Robin too. Quick gave Frost a fist bump and followed behind Lux. The two of them were never far apart and were surrounded by a soft electrical hum. Frost had a hard time getting a red on her military-made brother-in-law. Mom was next in line for a goodbye. Keep an eye on your sisters. Will you? Of course. I can always count on you. You're such a good list girl. Mom's kiss was like a branding iron of shame. Frost wasn't what they believed her to be. If everything went well with Tannen, then she could finally be free of the guilt and the secret. Try to have a little fun while you're there. Don't lock yourself in your room and read emails to Santa all day, okay? Frost swallowed. 
okay. That was a promise she could make. She was getting out there. She was getting way out there to the one and only place she'd ever wanted to visit for real. Ginger was next, surprising Frost with a tight, tight hug. Frost wrapped her older sister in a squeeze, and Ginger shivered. The air in the stable grew heavy and time seemed to slow down. What? Ginger stepped back, her eyes going to Frost's bag in the sleigh. Frost? She whispered urgently. Frost's eyes widened and her limbs paralyzed. Ginger knew. Her mouth opened, but no sound came out. She stood there, unable to articulate a lie or come up with an excuse as she had so many times before. Curse the Kringle Jean for rising up now, of all times. She'd always been able to cover her tracks. Ginger's brow furrowed in confusion. Of course she was confused, Frost was the sweet sister who dressed like a 1970s housewife. She wouldn't violate one of the North Pole's most sacred traditions. Dad, oblivious to the tension, brushed Ginger and Joseph aside and buried Frost in his peppermint-scented hug. His beard tickled her forehead and his flannel shirt was soft against her cheek. His bowl full of jelly was wide enough that it blocked Frost from the family's view, relieving her of Ginger's piercing gaze. A tear fell on Frost's shoulder and she glanced up at her dad, certain he was crying because he'd sensed what Ginger sensed and was disappointed. Frost's heart stumbled. Are you mad? she asked. Dad ho ho hoed softly, his body bouncing lightly. Not at all. I just hate seeing my girls grow up. I thought, since you're the youngest, that you would stick around a few more years. But here you are, flying off with your sisters to find a husband. He sniffed, his straight nose going red at the end. Frost relaxed into his fatherly embrace. Maybe his radar was off, or perhaps she'd had him fooled for so many years he didn't bother tuning into her anymore. Whatever the reason, she was safe in his arms. I'll be okay. She lifted her shoulders. For all we know, this trip will be a huge bust and we'll all come back single as ever. Dad's lips turned down. Let's hope not. He stepped back, his arms dropping, to reveal Lux's and Quick's grim faces. What? Frost asked. The group quieted down, all eyes on the resident science slash computer slash Christmas magic experts. Lux lifted her glasses higher on her nose. Christmas is growing, quickly. Causing surges, added quick. Robin pointed at the two of them. That's why you guys built the substation. Lux twisted her long red hair around her finger. The substation is able to convert Christmas magic to electricity at levels that safeguard the equipment. It can handle power surges, but what we're seeing is sustainable growth. Quick took Lux's hand, a golden arc of light connecting between their palms before the flesh came together. The magic room continues to increase at a rate of 0 0.003 per day. Which would be fine if we had the proper foundation to accommodate that kind of continued expansion. But we don't. So, prompted Stella. So, the palace is tipping. At this rate. We need a new power source or the whole thing will capsize. How can it capsize? Asked Mom, her jaw tight. Lux glanced at Quick, her eyes brightening. Christmas is highly mathematical, and numbers play a big role in keeping it all level. One Christ child, three wise men, December 25th, seven geese laying, 17 million miles of flight on Christmas Eve, 321,000 tons of toys in Santa's sleigh. Quick picked up the tutorial. The Jones polynomial, also known as the knot theory, can explain why Christmas lights get tangled in storage. His face glowed with excitement and he and Lux exchanged a heated glance. What do knots and geese have to do with Christmas collapsing? demanded Ginger. She took the fate of the holiday seriously. It's off balance, blurted Lux. But two of us are married. Isn't that a balanced number? 
Quick held up two fingers on one hand and five on the other. Two out of five. Think of a pie with five slices. If you only have two in the pan, it's heavily one-sided. But if you add a third, it stabilizes. He glanced at Lux. We're doing all we can, but the closer it gets to Christmas and the larger the room grows, the more the magic tips. Lux bit her lip. If one of you doesn't find love before Christmas, we're in serious peanut brittle. So no pressure, Stella quipped with her usual light-hearted take on life. Frost buried her face in her hands, feeling all the pressure. Neither Stella nor Robin had the potential for love yet. They were starting from scratch. But she had more than potential, she had an invitation. It was up to her to find Tannen, get him to profess his love to her, and save her family, the North Pole, and Christmas for children all over the world. She might just be sick. Oh, Tannen, I hope you're ready to love me. Chapter 4 Around mid-afternoon Tannen was ready to spew curses at the temp agency. They had yet to send a replacement for Mrs. Guerin, and he'd had to field phone calls she would normally redirect as well as dig through her desk, a task he did not enjoy in the least, to find a package of paperclips. The only good news was that Mrs. Guerin herself was recovering nicely from a small stroke and should be back to work by the new year. If he survived that long. The volume of emails in his inbox was enough to make him want to throw the screen on the floor and stomp on it. His stress level wasn't helped by the picture his dad had sent over that afternoon. It was from Halloween, a night Tannen wished he could forget. He'd gotten home just in time to take Brody, all dressed in his Black Panther costume, trick-or-treating. But Brody didn't want Tannen to take him, he wanted Grandpa. Ever the indulgent grandparent, Dad had agreed to accompany the two of them as they paraded about the neighborhoods located at the bottom of the hill from their mansion. Brody had clung to his grandpa's hand for the first half of the night and skipped ahead of them, hyped up on sugar, the second half. Then, as they walked back to where their car was parked outside the iron gate with the family crest, Brody fell asleep on Dad's shoulder. Tannen had offered to take him, wanting so much to feel his son's weight in his arms. It'll be too much of a strain on your leg, he's getting so big now. Better let me do it, said Dad. Tannen hated that he was probably right. What kind of a man couldn't carry his sleeping child? No wonder Brody preferred Dad. Tannen had gone to bed feeling lower than a tree slug. The sense of uselessness had followed him to bed and haunted him this morning was because of his inability to weed through the e-garbage to find the daily weight reports on the logs coming into the plant. Why was he getting announcements for the weekend sale at Tom's Furniture anyway? He unsubscribed just to be nasty before moving on to the next email, and then the next, and the next one after that. Sitting up in his seat, feeling as though he were finally making headway, he didn't notice several men crowd his office door until one of them cleared his throat. Yes, he asked gruffly. Today was not the day to trifle with Tannen Cebu. Well, Mr. Cebu. A short man in a hard hat and a neon orange safety vest took two steps into the office. His steel-toed work boots were scuffed and scarred. We've been hearing some disturbing rumors on the mill floor, and the three of us decided to come up here and clear the air. Tannen brought in a breath, bringing his shoulders forward and bracing himself. He could only imagine what was on their minds. He didn't have time for this tomfoolery and made a note to try another agency the moment these men left his office. He needed an assistant and gatekeeper out there. Yes? Well, you see, sir, some of the fellas said there was a man here the other day offering to buy you out. Tannen's hackles rose. His family owned the mill and the land, what they did with it was their decision and theirs alone. That's none of your concern. We make our living here and that says it's our concern, said a burly man in the back. His cheeks shook when he spoke and his large hands hung heavy at his sides. Tannen was not one to back down from a bully. No decision has been made, gentlemen. Though he used the term loosely. 
If I decide to sell, I'll let you all know. About the time that I sign papers and there's nothing you can do about it. So that man was a buyer, said the short, stocky, and abnormally hairy man in the front. I knew it. He was too polished for his own good. An upstart, that's what he was. Tannen placed his palms on his desk and rose to his full height. I've had quite enough of this. As my secretary is sick today, please show yourselves out and shut the door behind you. Shutting doors was a novel idea and one he should have thought of three hours ago. The men looked at one another. The burly man's face stormed with trouble while the others grumbled their complaints, but they turned and made their way out of the room. At the last second, the stout man doffed his hard hat, bowed at the waist, and said, Whatever you need, Govna. Tannen set his jaw. The cheeky son of a gun. If he wasn't swamped with real work, he'd have the lot of them fired. The man looked over his shoulder to make sure his compatriots were out of earshot and then ducked back inside. If you need a secretary, my daughter is looking for a way to earn extra Christmas cash. Tannen suppressed a groan. Is she qualified? Yes, sir. She went to community college and everything. He wasn't all bluster when he was on his own. Which just went to show that mob mentality was a problem in his factory. But what was he to do about the problem? The workers had been talking about a union for years, since his grandfather owned the place. As long as they had good health care and reasonable standard of living increases in their pay, a union was just an empty threat. Tannen shouldn't hire this woman no matter what her qualifications. However, his misgivings, such as they were, could apply to a stranger just as much as a daughter of one of his foremen. Have her report to me tomorrow. Will do. He put his yellow hard hat back on his head and tapped it twice. Wait, what's your last name? Cratchit, sir. Very well. He now had a name for his new secretary. Miss Cratchit had better live up to your recommendation, or she won't last. I don't have time for foolishness. Noted. Cratchit sprang out of his office like a cricket. Tannen fell back into the seat, a move he hadn't done in some time because it showed exactly how awkward he was with his prosthetic kicking up in the air. That was too easy. The men left without so much as a threat tossed his direction. And he'd gotten an assistant out of the deal. He drummed his fingers on his desk, mulling over the last ten minutes. Of course, he said out loud. With Cratchit's daughter in his office, the foreman would have an informant who had access to his computer, emails, and personal conversations. Well, they'll be hard-pressed to get any information out of her, because he wouldn't let her find any. He'd place boundaries and keep her too busy to snoop. If she was interrogated, she could honestly answer that he didn't tell her a thing. Tannen's phone alarm went off, signaling the arrival of the afternoon mail. He scrambled to his feet and hurried to Mrs. Guerin's desk just as Tim, the office intern, dropped a stack of letters in the inbox. He nodded once at the surprised kid, whose sweater vest hung at an odd angle, before snatching the stack and disappearing into his office like a bear getting ready to hibernate. He didn't care how he looked. His heart was beating so fast it could have powered the plant. Miss Kringle may be in the stack of mail, and he'd be darned if he was going to miss a moment with the woman who had become his best friend. He skimmed the return addresses quickly before dropping the stack on the coffee table under the window, his heart now thudding as pathetically as a felled hollow tree. Nothing from Miss Kringle. A letter a day wasn't unheard of but there was nothing from her today. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Was it even possible to love someone you'd never met? He didn't know, but he wanted to believe it could be true. Wanted it as much as he wanted to be out of this office cage and free. Chapter 5 Frost was well aware that there were obstacles standing between her and Tannen. The first was getting out of the North Pole without arising suspicion. Check. 
That had come about rather easily, which only added to her confidence that she and Tannen were written in the stars. If Christmas magic didn't want the two of them together, it would have to put up a stink. The second obstacle was getting to Elderberry. Check. Stella had gotten them there quite easily last night. The home, with its four bedrooms, three baths, contemporary light fixtures, and light gray decorating theme, was perfect for the three single Kringles. Darn Stella. Her stupid name was growing on her. Frost grinned. It was kind of funny. The next obstacle was getting out of the house without being noticed and without her sisters tagging along. Frost cracked open her door and peeked through the crack. The hallway was empty. Stella had taken the master bedroom despite the fact that Frost needed the walk-in closet space more than her sister. In order to keep the peace, Frost smiled and did her best to arrange her clothing in the sorry excuse for a closet in the first guest room. She missed the ice cave at home. The magical palace expanded to accommodate her growing fashion designs. Just last week, shoe racks appeared, rimming the entire room. Her heart leapt at the sight and she set about reorganizing her closet so shoes and their complementary outfits were grouped together. The change had revolutionized the dressing process. Stella's door was shut tight. Perfect. Robin had taken the room next to Frost's. She didn't care about closet space, she just wanted to be closest to the kitchen. Robin's door hung open. A lump on the bed gave Frost hope that her sister was sleeping off their late-night unpacking session. Though they didn't need much sleep and could work faster than the average person, they did need to recharge their batteries. Robin liked to joke that Kringles came with batteries included. The extra room across the hall was chock-full of empty boxes. The stacks looked like present skeletons to her, a parent's worst nightmare after Christmas. Her sisters loved the clothing she'd ordered, exclaiming over each piece as it came from the cardboard and slithered out of plastic bags. Oh, the bubble wrap. Frost laid it on the floor so they walked across it as they unpackaged. She practically giggled herself to sleep last night. Tiptoeing down the hall, thankful they'd rolled up the bubble wrap and tossed it in the spare bedroom, she made it to the kitchen, her eyes on the door to the garage. Moving with stealth, she zeroed in on the goal, ready to head off on her own and track down the future Mr. Kringle. Whoa, where are you headed this morning? Robin's voice caused Frost to freeze in place for the count of three before she was able to adopt a casual stroll. Robin and Stella were at the table, tucked to one side so they could gaze out over the huge yard, the barn, and the woods. Snow was a plenty this time of year. Huge drifts brought on by a November storm made the landscape look as if were covered in frosting. Frost glanced down at her red plaid pants, white button-up blouse, navy blue cardigan with a belt in the same color, and pilgrim shoes. She reached for her Kringle bag, which she'd left on the counter by the garage door. The bag changed from tan to the exact shade of red in her plaid pants. She dressed down for her meeting with Tannen, knowing she was going to see him at work. If it were up to her, she would have met him wearing an emerald green gown with a velvet bodice and layer upon lovely layer of tulle frosted with glitter. She'd imagined popping down his chimney for just such a meeting last night but completely chickened out. From what she understood of men, they didn't take kindly to intruders. Tannen hadn't played baseball, but she was certain he could chase off a prowler with a bat should one surprise him. Besides, he lived with his parents, and who knew which of them would be near the chimney. The real reason she decided against even knocking on his door was that she wanted to see him before he saw her. They hadn't exchanged pictures. He asked, but she'd say, you first, and that was the end of the request. She didn't care what he looked like, but there was a part of her that wondered. She'd researched the effects of chemo on children as they grew and she didn't want to act shocked or hesitate because of a surprise in his appearance. Like she was one to talk. White hair and purple eyes made more than a few people stop and stare when she went to Mexico to visit her grandparents. Still, she got the impression he was more sensitive about his looks than she was about hers. 
Sure, men, women, and children pondered her odd coloring, but she'd come to appreciate the unique heritage that made her look like a Christmas fairy. Besides, as a Christmas princess, she was prepared to stand out in a crowd. This was one of those moments when her ability to stretch the truth came in handy. She had an answer that wasn't entirely false. That kind came out so much easier than outright lies. I thought I'd check out the town and see where Tannen worked, introduce myself, and propose. Frost pulled a tube of red lipstick in a compact mirror from her red purse that she lowered the mirror to see Ginger and Robin staring at her like a misfit toy. What? Robin wrapped her fluffy blue robe around her as she stood from the table. You don't explore, ever. She lowered her chin, pinning Frost with a look. Frost sucked in through her teeth, wary of lying any more than she absolutely had to. I'm taking this Christmas catastrophe seriously and am ready to do my part. Bravo. Stella clapped. I'm coming with you. Unlike Robin, who was still in her flannel candy cane pajamas and red robe, Stella was dressed in black and gray striped leggings, a black leather skirt, and a low-cut red blouse. She'd finished off the edgy outfit with a silver chain that hung to her navel and matching earrings. Her makeup was three shades of night sky, and her skin as flawless as Rockefeller's tree. That won't be necessary. Frost Jingle Bell hopped her way to the door that led to the garage and snagged a set of keys off the hook by the light switch for one of the three rental cars waiting in the garage. When Stella was over transportation, she planned for every alternative. You arranged for enough cars that we could go on our own. Stella frowned. I didn't think you'd actually drive. You're not experienced. Frost flicked her hand in a move that was characteristically Stella's, belying a sense of nonchalance she didn't feel. Inside, she was terrified of getting behind the wheel. She hadn't driven since she was 16, when Mom had said it was a rite of passage for a young lady and she wasn't going to allow her to miss out on the experience. She'd gone on to give her a history lesson on in Rainsford French, the first American woman to receive a driver's license in the year 1900. Of course, women had been driving horse-drawn carriages and wagons for ages, as Kringle women had been driving sleighs. She'd made it through the driving test with white knuckles and a heartfelt prayer. I have a license and the best GPS system on the planet. Unlike Ginger, who had a globe in her head, Frost had to rely on her cell phone. Thanks to Lux, who had linked their phones into several military bases from multiple countries, she could be anywhere in the world and know exactly how to get home or find a hot chocolate bar. However, for this little venture, she'd memorize the directions so no one could trace her search engines and know what she'd been up to. I'll be fine. Well, I guess I'd better get dressed if I'm going to keep up with you too. No time for dishes this morning. Robin swirled the last bite of her chocolate waffles through the whipped cream and popped it in her mouth. She set her plate and fork in the sink and made it three steps away before she flipped back around, rinsed the plate, and placed it in the dishwasher. Frost compulsively read letters. Robin was the world's finest hostess, homemaker, chocolatier, candy maker, and head chef. A dirty kitchen was a sin, and she never fell to temptation. Stella snickered. Robin pointed at her. For that, I'm buying a Lego set and only putting it halfway together. Frost grinned so hard her nose wrinkled. Stella's OCD was finishing. Santa didn't believe in giving gifts that came with some assembly required. Don't start with me, sis, Stella warned, her brown eyes glinting with challenge. I'll bake cookies. Robin's hands flew in front of her as if she could already see the piles of sugar and flour and the ingredients spread from here to the front door. Stella lifted one eyebrow. Sugar cookies. No. Robin wilted, conceding defeat. Fine, no Legos. But you'd better wipe the crumbs off the counter before I get back. How did you even see those? I... Frost took advantage of their quarreling to slip out the door. Once in the car, she buckled her seatbelt, tugging on it twice. 
She read all the gauges. Fuel. Oil level. Odometer. Battery. The buttons were next. AM slash FM, volume. Hot slash cold. She lowered the visor and skimmed the airbag warning. Having read the necessary words, she started the car. Her heart swerved worse than Dasher and Dancer after eating too many carrots, but the car went straight on the right side of the road. She double-checked online last night after they arrived to make sure it was the right side that she was supposed to drive on. One couldn't be too careful when taking their life in their hands and speeding along the pavement. She couldn't very well read while she drove, so it was imperative she do her research. Flying ten feet above the tree line was so much safer than these steel contraptions. A car had no instinct, whereas a reindeer would swerve around an obstacle to save his or her antlers. The closer she got to the bison paper mill, the harder her knees quivered. Blue street signs pointed her in the direction of the main offices, though it wouldn't have been too hard to find them on her own, considering the giant pipes rising through the air like reindeer hazards. The front of the office building was covered in mirrored glass, the company logo on the upper right-hand side of the building. A group of people gathered by the front doors. They had signs, but she couldn't make out the words from this far away. She sat in a parking spot, her hands still on the steering wheel, as she gazed up at the square structure. Inside those walls was the man she wanted to marry. All she had to do was walk in there and introduce herself. All the obstacles were out of the way, but she couldn't move. How many people had the opportunity to make their lifelong dream come true? Even as a little girl playing dress-up, her pretend date was Tannen. She'd imagine them walking into the living room together. He'd pick up a bucket of popcorn off the side table, and they'd sit on the couch and enjoy watching a superhero kick butt. She gasped for air. Okay, Frost. This is it. This is your moment. She shook out her fingers. With a mighty heave, she pushed the suddenly two-ton car door open and swiveled in her seat to plant both feet on the blacktop. A faded blue line told her she'd made it inside the visitor's parking spot. Okay. 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 It seemed she couldn't stop talking to herself. She pushed out of the seat and turned to face the building and her future. There were so many questions still unanswered. Of course they'd live at the North Pole, but how often would they visit his parents? When would she meet them? Was he a good kisser? The last question almost had her back in the car. On-screen kisses were magical things set to swelling music or hard rock ballads. She wanted one of those, preferably the magical kind. Stopping to sling her Kringle bag over her shoulder, she shut the car door and pressed the button on the key fob to lock it just like her mom had taught her. They never locked up the sleigh, but then, who would steal from Santa? With her first step towards Tannen, her lungs squeezed together. Why couldn't her mom have taught her how to break the ice with a man she knew better than any other and yet hadn't so much as shaken hands with instead of worrying about silly things like driving lessons? The parking lot seemed to lengthen before her like a runway, the doors getting farther away. She pressed harder, determined not to chicken out. Suddenly, she was right in the midst of the people marching and their signs. She read them all with a glance. Don't take our homes. We have families. My children need Christmas. You can't do this to Elderberry. And there were a half dozen more with similar sayings. What in the name of Whoville was going on here? She moved to ask the nearest man, who towered over her and had a beard down to his belly, but he turned on her, screaming in her face. Old man C. Boo isn't going to ruin my Christmas. Her Santa empathy sparked to life. The man's fear overwhelmed her, sapping her energy. Frost stumbled backward, running into a woman in a long coat with a red-knit beanie perched precariously on her stringy brown hair. We won't take this sitting down. We have rights, she yelled at the top of her lungs. 
Her anger surged like a roaring river through Frost's veins, heating her and causing her hands to shake. Shoving Frost off her side, the woman continued on her circular march. Before she could recover from the last two emotions, Frost tumbled between two men in plaid coats and gray mittens, their faces red with resentment as low as the temperatures that compelled them to bundle up. And used to carrying so many negative emotions inside at once, Frost scrambled for an exit, her footing unsure. The front door to the building fell open at the same moment she put her hand on the bar to push it open. Her heel caught on the metal threshold and she fell into yet another person. The impeccable blue fabric of his suit coat was soft against her cheek, and his body underneath was strong. Soft annoyance coated with bemusement came through her Santa senses. The scents of spruce trees, spice, and paper mingled together, making her stomach flutter like two turtle doves in a pear tree. Wait, that wasn't right. Firm hands took her by the shoulders and peeled her off the suit. She lifted her gaze from the beautiful jacket only to fall into the clear spring green colored eyes of her rescuer. Tannen, she whispered. How she knew it was him was beyond her, her heart just knew. Or perhaps it was her nose. His letters smelled just like him. She should know, she'd press them to her face often, wishing she were close enough to him to take in his scent fully. She closed her eyes and did just that, reveling in the fact that they were finally within the same three feet. He stared at her for a moment, his eyes taking in her shock of white hair, her pointed chin, and her purple eyes. There was a flash of attraction that was there and gone so fast Frost didn't have time to react. His hands dropped to his side and he cleared his throat. You'll address me as Mr. Cebu and I shall call you Ms. Cratchit, understood? She rubbed her forehead, still trying to get a grasp on her sensors. There are people out there screaming at you. He frowned. I know. They won't be there for long. But how? I don't have time to stand here and gossip. Follow me. He did a three-step turn and led the way past the receptionist's desk into an elevator. He pressed the up button. She rubbed her forehead, confused at his brisk manner as she joined him in the elevator. The door shut, and there was a black hole where holiday music should have played over the speakers. Frost frowned at the ceiling. The disgruntled group had done a number on her, and stepping off the roller coaster was difficult. You're Tannen C. Boo, are you not? I am. His curt nod and stiff posture as he pressed a button did nothing to invite her back into his arms. This wasn't the welcome she'd anticipated. Oh. Oh. He didn't know who she was. He thought she was this Ms. Cratchit person. How silly of her. She'd remedy that post-haste. She squared her shoulders. Tannen, she began. Mr. Cebu, he interrupted her. He was so funny when he was serious. He had this whole important businessman thing going for him, which was quite attractive. He was attractive. She hadn't seen many bald men, but she'd heard the phrase bald is beautiful. It was true. He had a wonderfully shaped head, not at all bumpy or oblong. Just smooth and well-shaped. It helped that his skin had a natural olive tone to it, dark and healthy-looking without trying. His shoulders were wide, first toned from the 18 months after his surgery when he'd had to use crutches, although he had to spend time at the gym to look so good now. He had the upper body strength to climb ice, and she couldn't wait to take him to her favorite spot. His eyes were a clear spring green, and a Greek nose adorned his features like the perfect ornament on the most beautiful Christmas tree on the lot. Stop interrupting. She smacked him playfully on the arm. I need to tell you something. The elevator doors slid open before she got a chance to stick out her hand and make proper introductions. A gangly teen was waiting for them on the other side of the doors, and he pushed his way into the small space and then dogged Tannen's steps as he exited. She took a moment to admire Tannen's gait. If she hadn't known he had a prosthetic leg, she would have thought he had sprained his knee with his slight limp. Mr. Cebu, 
the police are on their way. You were right, sir. The teen took long steps to keep up. This is private property and the protesters are trespassing. The doors started to close and Frost darted out to keep from being hauled back to ground level. She didn't want to go back there while the people were screaming. She shuddered at the thought. Good, Tim. See that they are gone within the hour. Tim blanched. I'll try. Tannen turned on him. Don't try, Tim. Do. Tim leaned back on his heels, nodding as if he had a snow globe for a head and was shaking the snowflakes. Tannen left him standing there, nodding. Frost glanced from Tim to Tannen's back and then hurried after him. Before she was close enough to talk, he stopped at a crowded desk. Is there something of interest here? Three people jolted in unison. No. We were just talking about the, the woman dropped her eyes to her penny loafers. It's not important. Frost sensed her embarrassment laced with dismay. She longed to reach out a steady hand to the woman and ease her troubled mind. Clearly, this was not a good day for Frost to profess her love. Back to work, everyone. Tannen set the example, striding off. Frost was once again forced to make haste to catch up with him. The path was made clear by office workers doing their best to stay out of his way. In his wake, she felt disapproval, judgment, and distress. Was this really her tannin? The man who penned sweet words of courtship and offered his heart on embossed parchment? This is your desk, Ms. Cratchit. He waved his hand to an eyesore with metal legs and a false wooden top. Frost stared at it in horror. She would no sooner work at such a desk than ask an elf to remove his pointed shoes. Not only was the desk an atrocity, there wasn't a holiday decoration in sight. It may be a few days before Thanksgiving, but that was no excuse. At the least, there should be fall leaves and pumpkins with wooden signs full of wisdom such as count your blessings and be thankful. Oh no, 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 this wouldn't do at all. If you'll start by sorting mail, that would be helpful. Once that is done, you can go through my inbox and clean out the unnecessaries. Sort. Mail? The tips of Frost's fingers tingled, and she was torn between sorting and setting Tannen straight on why she was there and who she was. The mail was all over the desk, begging to be read. Just begging. Her Kringle compulsion did a conga line right over her better sense. There was one last hope. If Tannen pulled her away, she may be able to resist. I really think we need to have a conversation. It'll have to wait. Tannen did a quick three-point turn and threw her hope out in the cold November air. He took his wonderful clean scent with him, leaving no doubt in her mind that the conversation was over, for now. Frost's workspace was an alcove off the larger office area. There wasn't a wall or a window to separate her from the other employees, yet there may as well have been a concrete barrier for all the attention they paid to her. The main floor was filled with workspaces divided by half walls that didn't offer privacy but discouraged communication. They should all be taken down so workers could chat. The letters elves would suffocate in this environment. She did her best to tune out the feelings of stress rolling like sound waves through the air. She glanced up to find an arch that was perfect for bows and red bows. And paper snowflakes, the space could use dozens of snowflakes. Her hands found the letter on the top of the haphazard pile without her mind having to leave the mental decorating. Tannen's office was as far away from his employees as it could get. No wonder he inspired fear and stress, no one in the office knew him. Like Scrooge, he sat in his counting house all day and barked orders. Bark was a harsh word. He hadn't barked at her, though his tone with the rest of the office was rather harsh. She slipped the letter out of the envelope and brought her eyes to the top of the page. A half second later, she had the advertisement for a new dentist office and envelope in a stack and was already opening the next. 
Hooking the rolling chair with her toe, she dragged it under her and sat down to the task. She learned a little about elderberry from reading. They had a bakery, a furniture store that was gearing up for a Black Friday event, and several restaurants that offered 10% off your meal. None of these things had to do with a paper mill, but she stacked them, ready to create a file, just as soon as she found the right place. There was one set of filing drawers stacked high back and to the right of her desk. She perused the folders but didn't find one that would match these letters. She tapped her chin. There had to be a place for them, so she'd just save them for later and accomplish what else she could. She flipped her hair over her shoulder, which she'd taken care to style just right, not that Tannen had noticed, and went back to work. In no time she had things sorted and moved on to email. She'd make short order of this task and then approach him again. Surely he'd be in a better mood if she made his to-do list shorter. They needed to get this misunderstanding worked out so they could hurry up and get married and get home. She had things to do back home. Agus, the tallest elf at the North Pole, would already be en route to the North Pole with the day's letters. Dad was overseeing incoming, but Frost missed her desk. She missed the elves. And she missed hearing Christmas wishes from children. Being with adults all day was boring. She would make short work of this task and then demand to speak to him. Surely he'd be in a better mood if he wasn't overwhelmed with work. Not ten minutes later, she'd sorted the email and pushed away from the computer, ready to take Tannen by the hands and introduce herself. She grinned, thinking of the shock. He might need a minute to accept that it was truly her. She'd wait for him to mentally catch up. She'd waited for him this long, what was a few more minutes? Tim half ran, half walked to her desk. He was so thin, she wondered if he'd eaten at all in the last week. He carried two styrofoam cups in his long-fingered hands. Coffee. Frost grimaced at the idea of drinking the bitter liquid, causing Tim's smile to falter. He had such a desire to do good, and she'd rained on his efforts. With a bright smile, she reached for the cup. I'm more of a hot chocolate girl, but I'm sure this is delicious. He pulled back, not allowing her to fully grasp the drink. We have hot chocolate. I'll make you some. An overwhelming need for approval smacked her in the face. She hopped up and wrapped him in a sisterly hug. Tim, you're so wonderful. She remembered Tim's letters. He'd list every single teeny tiny thing he considered a notch against him and promised to do better. The next year, he had done better, but no one was perfect. He needed to hear that he was doing a good job, that he got credit for trying and didn't have to be perfect. I'm sure your coffee is wonderful. Thank you so much for caring enough about your job to do it so well. Tim stuttered, stiff as a candy cane in her arms. Embarrassment wafted off of him like the soft scent of a Christmas candle. She let him go, wondering what she'd done, and he jumped away. Th thanks. He ran into Tannen's office. Well, it's about time. Tannen's rough voice grated across Frost's skin like poorly made tinsel. What's going on out front? The protesters have moved out to the main road. They've been warned not to block traffic. Frost breathed a sigh of relief at the news. She had no desire to walk through that group again. They were South Pole angry and left an icky goo on her soul with their accusatory words and black feelings. Fine. Fine. Get on with your job. Yes, sir. Tim came out slower than he'd gone in. He tried not to look at Frost. She'd have none of that. He was a good kid and was on his way to becoming a good man. The type of person she would want to know and be friends with. So what if she'd said the wrong thing? She'd shower him with compliments while she had the chance. Frost flagged him over to her desk so she could talk quietly. You handle him so well. Is he always like this? 
She pointed discreetly towards Tannen's office. Tim nodded and then hurried away. Frost pulled her lips down into a frown, an expression she rarely used because frowning causes wrinkles and wrinkles didn't go with any of her outfits. She looked around the sterile room and shuddered. This place needed a serious dose of Christmas cheer. She'd be ornery too if she had to come to work here every day. She had to act. With great Christmas spirit came great responsibility to share that spirit, no matter what time of year. Pulling out her Kringle bag, she stuck her hand inside and wished for a garland for her desk. The purse produced exactly what she pictured, with ribbons and silver and red glass balls dangling at just the right length to hang across the front of the drab excuse for office furniture. Next, she pulled out several packages in different sizes and grouped them by the front right corner. Of course, the papers and ribbons matched the garland. Nutcrackers in all different shapes and sizes, including one that looked like the scrumptious young Elvis, because why not, stood sentry along the edge. From there, her imagination took over. A tree sprang up in the corner, hiding that ugly filing cabinet, a green tree skirt inlaid with gold encircling the trunk. A three-foot-tall ceramic set of Santa boots held a bouquet of plastic candy canes. Wreaths took up as much wall space as she could find. Hey. Hey. A stack of folders with legs approached. The stack landed on her desk, slid to the side, and toppled onto the ground, spreading paper in every direction. The woman who spilled them pushed her glasses up on her nose with her pointer finger. Sorry. I thought I could make it to my desk. She took in a couple quick breaths, her hand on her chest. Well, this is just great. After a moment of surveying the jumble, her eyes went wide. Is that Christmas? She spun in a slow circle in shock. When she stopped, she blinked slowly while looking at Frost. Frost could feel her surprise and then a tinge of envy of her purple eyes. She blushed slightly because she always liked them, but they were so different that she was almost afraid to. Frost pressed her palms together in front of her chest and bounced. It's great, right? I need a train to circle the tree, but that will have to wait. Until you're gone and I can pull it out of my purse without arousing suspicion. She sniffed, her nose wrinkling. It smells like sugar and spice. Frost giggled. She was the one who smelled like sugar and spice, but she couldn't tell this woman that. It's just a Christmas scent. Did Mr. C. Boo tell you to do this? Nope. She grinned, pleased at herself for taking the initiative. The woman's face paled and she muttered, Well, it's been nice knowing you. Frost leaned forward, sure she'd misheard. I'm sorry, what? Never mind. I'm Zuzu. She shoved her no-rim glasses up her nose again. Nice to meet you. Frost didn't offer her name. Until she worked things out with Tannen, she wanted to remain anonymous. If she was going to spirit him off to the North Pole, the fewer people who remembered her, the better. What's all this? She waved her hand across the folders. Zuzu shoved her blonde, chin-length curls away from her face. It's last quarter's orders. I'm supposed to file them in the storage room, but she tugged at her hair. A new sense of excitement bubbled in Frost. Filing room? They have one of those? Zuzu nodded slowly as if teaching a baby reindeer how to balance in the snow. It's just down the hallway. Frost's energy level climbed like the temperature on a candy thermometer in a batch of suckers. Is that where these go? She dug out the dentist, furniture, and other letters that didn't need to go into tannin. Zuzu looked them over. I know right where to put those. She took them from Frost, walked around the desk, picked up the trash bin, and dropped them inside. Frost gasped in horror. You, you throw them away? Yeah. They're junk mail. Junk mail? Yeah, you know. Ads and things that are junk, clutter. 
Frost's jaw fell open. Seriously? We don't have that where I come from. You're lucky. We have it in droves. But I guess I should be glad, because it's job security. How so? Zuzu laughed. Who do you think makes the paper that they print those bad boys on? Oh. Frost glanced around the office at the many people hunched over their computer screens or scratching words on legal pads. Then I guess it isn't junk after all. Zuzu pulled her eyebrows together. I guess, though she had agreed, it sounded like she was skeptical. Her gaze fell onto the files all over Frost's desk. I've made a mess of things. Tannen took that moment to step out of his office. What in the... He gaped at the decorations and then glared at the mess on Frost's desk. All her hard work this morning tidying up and organizing was hidden under the rainbow of folders. So much for chilling Tannen's stress level. Zuzu straightened to her full five-foot-three height. I'll get it cleaned up right away. And who is going to clean up these decorations? His nose wrinkled in distaste. Frost planted her hand on her hip. What's wrong with the decorations? It's not Christmas. For those who believe, Christmas is all year long. He stared at her for a moment as if trying to figure out if she was serious. She lifted one eyebrow, telling him she was serious. So serious about Christmas. He narrowed his eyes. Did you sort the mail? She was not his personal assistant, and she wasn't exactly pleased with his tone either. Trying to remain Kringle cheery, after all, that was the whole point of decorating, to bring some holly jolly into the office, she replied, yes. And your emails are done too, and I still had time to decorate the office. I didn't approve the expense. You didn't have to. I'll take care of it. I expect you to ask me before you do something like this again. Then you're going to be disappointed. The words were out so quickly that she barely had time to register she'd said them before his surprise hit her like a westerly wind. Zuzu giggled. She clamped her hand over her mouth to smother the sound. Tannen sized up Frost. She lifted her chin and smiled the smile of an innocent child caught peeking under the tree. Get these files cleaned up, now. This is an office, not a Christmas soiree. Zuzu bent her head and gathered up files. Yes, Mr. Cebu. See that you do. He glanced at Frost once before stepping backwards and shutting the door in his own face. Zuzu sent her a questioning look. I've never heard anyone stand up to him like that. She glanced over her. And you're so sweet looking. Who knew there was a bit of spice in you? Christmas magic had an idea. That's why she smelled like sugar and spice. At least, that was her theory. Her sisters were as baffled by the spicy scent as Zuzu. Little did they know. Frost lifted her shoulders in reply. Let me help you get this picked up. The amount of filing on the floor was sensational, a challenge she couldn't pass up. Nothing got this disorganized at the North Pole. I couldn't let you do that. You have your own work. Frost rubbed her hands together and laughed in her throat. It'll be done before you can sing an eighth note. She dropped to her knees, her plaid pants stretching over her rear end. Heaven help her if Tannen were to come out of his office at this moment. Tannen was different than she'd pictured him. He was more handsome than she dared wish. When a girl daydreams of her prince, he's always handsome. Somehow she'd kept the details fuzzy enough in her head that his strong jaw and intelligent eyes were a surprise. The biggest shock was his gruffness. Her adorable pen pal was as unrefined as scrap paper. Could she really spend the rest of her life with a man so stormy? She set aside a pile of straightened files and stood. The big question she needed answered was, which Tannen was the real Tannen Cebu? Chapter 6 
Tannen pressed his palm against his office door and held it shut as he backed as far away as he could while still ensuring Ms. Cratchit didn't come after him. He couldn't afford to have that woman too close. She was startlingly beautiful. Her hair, as white as a blanket of snow, framed her heart-shaped face to perfection. And those eyes! Purple if they were any color at all, they had gripped his thoughts and not let go even as she defied him. How was a man to concentrate when a woman as intoxicating as Ms. Cratchit was around? Even as his mind registered that she wasn't in the room, he could smell her sugar and spice scent. The smell was familiar, as if he'd caught the memory of it before, though he couldn't remember where. Pleasant emotions and thoughts associated with the scent, and it was difficult to shake off the deja vu. Maybe a girl in college had worn that fragrance. Yes, that had to be the answer. He dated some then, kissed a few women, but once Brody came into the picture, they didn't stick around. Beautiful women had options, and time and again he was considered option number two. He have to let Ms. Cratchit go, tell her that she wasn't working out. That would take care of his worry that she was there as a spy for the foreman as well as the strange mix of attraction and fascination she stirred inside of him. Settling behind his desk, he steeled himself against the task of searching for the reports he needed. With a click of the mouse, he was in his inbox, his surprisingly empty inbox. There were eight unopened emails, all of them relevant to his daily tasks, and everything else had been deleted or filed. Ms. Cratchit had cleaned out his inbox in under a half hour and turned the foyer into a Christmas boutique. How on earth? He clicked on the daily emissions report and read through. With that done, he moved on to the next item on his list. By lunch, he felt as though he was back on top of things. He'd need to tell her she'd done well and give her another task. If he was paying her for a day's worth of work, he'd be sure to get his money's worth. Perhaps she was up to something more challenging than sorting mail. Striding purposely across the room, he yanked the door open, bracing himself. His efforts to fortify himself against her infectious smile and innocent air were in vain because Ms. Cratchit was nowhere in sight. He stepped cautiously into the area, looking both ways. The decorations hadn't been moved. She'd put them up in the blink of an eye but wasn't able to take them down as quickly? What kind of game was she playing? He frowned. Not a glimpse of Ms. Cratchit or her wild pants could be found, and yet a nutcracker the size of a large dog stood outside his door. James, a man as bald as Tannen and as round as he was short, waddled by. James. Tannen's voice was like a whip cracking through the office. The soft sound of typing ceased, and heads ducked below their half walls. James stood at attention, the tips of his ears turning red. Why, yes. Have you seen the temp? He refused to call her his assistant. She'd only be there for the rest of the day. Something inside of him was saddened by the fact. It wasn't like he hadn't been around pretty women before. He had. But the last woman who'd made his heart thud like a big bass drum had left him with a bundle and blue blankets to raise. He'd kept track of Heather for a few years, it was easy while she was at college. After that, she disappeared, and Brody was four. He never asked about his mom, so Tannen let her go for both their sakes. James's three chins bounced. She's in the filing room with Zuzu. I believe they're reorganizing. Tannen scowled. He could only imagine what Ms. Cratchit considered organization. Fairy lights over the FS? Bells over the BS? He'd better get in there. Thank you, James. James hurried off as fast as his short legs could take him. Tannen watched him go. People hadn't always run away from him. At one point in his life, people liked to be around him. Some of the people in this very office. While he'd interned under his father, he'd smiled and said hello, talked around the water cooler. Now the employees averted their eyes when he passed their desks. 
Some kept their backs to him, staring at their computer screens as if they were deep into their tasks. But he could see their eyes follow him in the reflection from the computer screen. The file room was near the empty kitchen, which smelled like bleach. This will save me so much time. Zuzu was on the floor, her feet out in front of her as she filled out labels for legal-sized file folders. I hope so. A properly filed document should be a snap to find. Ms. Cratchit snapped her fingers. A few hours of work hadn't dimmed her beauty nor her smile. In fact, she appeared to be in her element, more at home here than he'd ever felt. She pulled order forms from folders and arranged them into neat piles along the far wall. Tannen blinked several times, amazed at how quickly the piles grew. They had almost half a year of order forms laid out there on the floor. The corners of his mouth tugged even farther down than they had been as he walked through the office. What's going on here? Zuzu scrambled to her feet. Her wiry curls sprang out in all directions and a deep red blush crept up her neck. Mr. Cebu. We were just overhauling the filing system. Ms. Cratchit had this idea, her arms dropped limp at her side. Tannen had no choice but to face Ms. Cratchit. Meeting her gaze had the same effect on him as it had that morning. She took his breath away. He was suddenly very aware of his lack of hair and slight limp. They didn't bother him as a boss. He could manage the company as well as any man, he wasn't missing half his brains. But when it came to women, he was less than the ideal in so many ways, and for some reason, he didn't want her to see him as less than anything. Ms. Cratchit didn't scramble as if he were a green and hairy monster that had climbed out from the supply closet. Her movements were as graceful as a dancer in the Nutcracker Ballet his mother made them attend every Christmas. And she didn't shy away from looking at him, really looking at him with her head tipped to the side, adorably inquisitive. Despite how at home she appeared, she didn't belong here. She didn't belong in this office. She belonged in the forest, singing with forest critters and birds like one of those animated princesses. For some reason, the thought made him happy. He started. She was doing something to him. If she was a spy, which he wasn't saying she was and he wasn't saying she wasn't, but part of her job would be to get him to trust her, he couldn't let down his guard. He was going to sell this company and take Brody and move far away, where they could start over. No one in the new town would know of his fight for his life, his mistakes, or his father's shadow. I didn't hire you to restructure our filing system, he said by way of reprimand. That whip was still in his voice and he couldn't seem to shake it. The tone was much too harsh for someone as soft as Ms. Cratchit, and he felt like a heel. He couldn't take it back, though. He needed barriers between them and they would be stronger if she put up a few of her own. Actually, you didn't, she started. He held up a hand to cut her off. I thought the mail would take you longer or that when you were done you would inquire after another task. A tiny line appeared between her eyebrows. Do you need more help? He shifted. It wasn't that he needed help so much. I need you to do the job. I have several letters to compose. A spark of interest lit her eyes and made him instantly wary. Why was she so interested in his correspondence? Then let's get to it. She marched right past him, leaving a trail of sugar and spice scent for him to follow. Where workers had ducked their eyes when he walked by, they stared after Miss Cratchit in open wonder. Like she was some princess in their midst. She grinned at James. Thanks for helping Mr. Cebu find me. How had she known about that? Why you're welcome. James bent slightly bowing as she passed. If the man had on a hat, he would have doffed it out of respect. His office was going mad. Tannen glared at James briefly. Miss Cratchit snagged a mini candy bar from Cheryl's desk with, you are so kind. Thanks for the treats. Cheryl's cheeks glowed. You're welcome. 
Ms. Cratchit stopped next to Bob's desk and handed him the candy. Here. You look like you could use a pick-me-up. He sighed. Thanks. I just found out my daughter can't come home for Thanksgiving. Ms. Cratchit poked out her bottom lip and crossed her fingers. Here's hoping for Christmas. Bob held up his crossed fingers too, a huge smile on his face. Had he always had that gold tooth? Tannen couldn't remember the last time he'd seen Bob smile. A few more encouraging smiles and one wink later and they were back in his office. He folded his arms. She'd wasted his time, and time was money. You've been busy socializing, I see. She looked innocently at him, her amethyst eyes broadcasting honesty. I've never met these people before. Before today, you mean. He motioned for her to follow him into his office. Well, I guess if you count the last thirty seconds as today, then yes. He rounded his desk and rifled through papers. I expected more from you, Ms. Cratchit. More what? She opened her arms, palms up. That darn adorable line was still between her eyebrows. More work and less socializing. But I wasn't. I don't need your excuses. You need a good lump of coal in your stocking is what you need. He snorted. What I need is an assistant who cares more about her job than she does about handing out chocolate. Why can't an assistant do both? He reached for an answer. Because it's unprofessional. I disagree. In let, she clamped her mouth shut, and her eyes zoomed back and forth as she thought briefly and began again. At my old job, we had cookies and fudge on a regular basis, and everyone got their work done in a timely manner. He puffed out a breath. Ridiculous. She cocked a hip and folded her arms. Agree to disagree. I'm not agreeing to disagree at all. But I am tabling this nonsensical argument so we can accomplish something of use. He motioned for her to take the chair in front of his desk. I need the daily eco-report sent to the National Emissions Standards Committee. You should be able to find their contact information in Mrs. Guerin's files. You'll need to include the information from last week's final report in our ID. Ms. Cratchit nodded once. David M. Something in Manufacturing had a question about the paper coating for the wrapping paper. Tell him to use a matte finish. Ms. Cratchit made a small noise of disapproval. I assume you don't approve. At this rate, he'd spend more of his day arguing than working. She pressed her pointer fingers together and then pressed them against her lips before speaking. Christmas paper should be shiny. We're starting a trend. A high-pitched yearite sound came from deep in her throat. Do you have a problem with that? She scooted forward. You bet your bottom dollar I do. Christmas is all about traditions, and yes, there are trends. Like slap bracelets. Do you remember those? Her nose wrinkled in silliness. If you want to sell wrapping paper, go with the classics. And classic wrapping paper is always shiny. We've never used anything else. Tannen bit back his desire to ask we who. Regardless, this batch will be matte. She quirked her lips as if saying, your funeral. Tannen leaned back in his seat. He was used to people having a hard time talking to him. If they saw his half of a leg, they stuttered and stammered and fretted over saying something wrong so they often didn't say anything at all. Or, they saw him as the grouchy boss and watched every word with care. Ms. Cratchit did none of those things. She hadn't glanced at his leg even when he limped along beside her. She hadn't stared at his bald head and done mental calculations to determine if he was old enough to have lost his hair naturally or shaved it prematurely. And she didn't back down from his surliness. Every weapon he used to keep people away, she blocked. Is that all? She examined her nails and brushed them against her shoulder. For now. 
Please see me when the tasks are complete and I'll have something else for you to do. Not being familiar with the reports, this should take her an hour or more. She was on her feet and to the door before he realized she hadn't written anything down. With a low groan, he decided to skip lunch and waited for her to pop her head back in and ask him to repeat everything. While he waited, he worked on a presentation. Fifteen minutes later, Ms. Cratchit was standing in front of his desk. Just as he'd thought. She'd gone off half-cocked and cocky and fallen flat on her pretty little face. What did you forget? he asked, not looking up from the screen. Nothing. I'm here for more work. Letters if you have them. Her words tore his eyes from the screen. You're done? No way. She must have done a half job and rushed through. She nodded. I liked the letter to the NESC. Do you have any more of those I can write? He clicked on the email she copied him on and scanned through the letter. It was articulate and included all the pertinent information. Fine. If she wanted a challenge, he'd give it to her. Leaning back, he reached to the bookshelf behind his desk and retrieved a three-inch thick three-ring binder. This is the quarterly compliance report from the Surface Coding Subcommittee. We need to be in compliance with their new rules by the first of the year, if we aren't already. I need you to read this and create a bullet list of the changes we'll need to make. She reached forward, her fingers dancing. Oh. She practically snatched the folder away and skipped out the door. He shook his head. That should keep her busy for the rest of the day. An hour later, she was back with the requested information. He looked at the sheet on his desk with distrust. There's no way you read that whole report. I did. Don't lie. I expected it to take you several hours. She dropped the folder on his desk with a thud. Ask me anything. The challenging lilt to her chin was too much to pass up. He flipped open the folder to a random page. What's the HAP solvents used to the greatest extent in the manufacturing process? MAC, toluene, and MIBK. Okay. He turned an inch of pages, moving more toward the back of the document. What percent control do we have to have over air pollutants? 95%. Although your plant operates at 97%. How did you know that? I read the air quality report before I send it out. This woman was insufferable and right. Two qualities that didn't mix well. He narrowed his eyes. How did you read this so fast? Speed reading classes. Something in her purple eyes dulled. It was the first time he really felt like she'd lied and not just suspected it. Though why she'd lie to him about something like speed reading classes was unknown. Ms. Cratchit was beyond smart and he wasn't sure where her alliances lay. He didn't quite trust her, and yet, after her superb performance, he wasn't sure what he'd do without her. Sir. James rolled himself through the door. There are several reporters downstairs who want to ask you about closing the plant. His wide pant legs quivered. You're closing the plant? asked Miss Cratchit, her eyes alight with curiosity. Before Christmas? And there it was. The reason this intelligent, beautiful woman had walked into his office in the first place. She was a corporate spy. He had orders to fill, orders that would finish the year strong enough to pad the sale of the company and land to the loggers. The more the company brought in, the higher the asking price. He could sign a contract a few days before Christmas and not have the money clear his account until the next calendar year for tax purposes. Sure, that would mean a lot of people were out of a job, but that was a small price to pay when it came to his son. He'd give anything for that boy, even the company his grandfather built. If news of the sale leaked before papers were signed, the protesters out front could make life difficult at best. Lawsuits would pile up, 
and the money he planned to live off of while he raised Brody would be sucked away in settlements and lawyer fees. He had to keep this under wraps and therefore had to do all he could to keep Miss Cratchit from sticking her nose where it didn't belong. Pointing at James, he said, you can tell those self-important busybodies that I have no comment. And you, he pointed one finger at Miss Cratchit. Will mind your own business and leave all talk of Christmas out of this office. She gasped, her hands flying to her mouth. You can't mean that. He flung his hand towards the boutique she'd created. How on earth she'd managed to get the tree up here was beyond him. She must have had help. Who else was in on this plan to guilt him into keeping the company? I do. Christmas at the Bison Paper Company is officially cancelled. No decorations. No gift exchange. And no party. His pronouncement rang through the office like the loud clang of a church bell. I don't want to see a tree, a sprig of mistletoe, or so much as a, a nutcracker. James worked his bottom lip. A fire lit in Ms. Cratchit's eyes that burned shame right into Tannen's soul. I find you are quite different than I first believed, Mr. Cebu. She dug her tiny fists into her hips. You, sir, are a Grinch and a Scrooge and Old Man Potter all rolled into one. Her hands flew into the air as she spun on her heel. I can't be here with you another moment, Tannen. She said his first name as if it were a personal dig. Which it was, considering how many times he'd told her to call him Mr. Cebu. She stalked out the door, taking every ounce of cheer with her. Tannen found himself halfway out of his seat, an inner need to keep her from leaving propelling him forward. Halfway to the door, he wondered what he was doing, chasing after a woman as if she were his world. She was an assistant and nothing more. Mr. Cebu? James reached for Tannen's arm and then pulled back. The reporters? Tannen ignored him. The reporters could wait. He didn't owe Ms. Cratchit a thing, except for a day's pay, and yet he felt as though he disappointed someone whose opinion mattered very much. He expected her to stomp her way out the door, grabbing her ridiculous Elvis nutcracker on the way. Instead, she left the bunting and the ribbons and the trappings behind. Doing so was like she was saying, if you want them gone, take them down yourself. Instead of scowling or grumbling, Ms. Cratchit smiled, working the room like a politician. Had there been babies, she would have kissed them. She stopped to hug Zuzu, and they had a quick conversation that ended in another hug and a scowl his direction from both women. Good sense overrode his impulses, and he sighed, turning away from Ms. Cratchit and her bright smile, pert nose, and eyes that could see right through his pain to the man he wished to be. That was why she disturbed him so. She knew there was pain and she lived as if there was a bubble around her where nothing went wrong, no one suffered, and Santa Claus was real. Except Santa was real. As real as Miss Kringle. Today was one of those days he wished he could go home and wrap his pen pal in his arms and kiss her until he forgot about everything else. Miss Kringle was the one person who understood him, and the longer they went without meeting, the lonelier his life became. He needed to convince her to meet. With a heavy sigh, he told James, Tell them I've not received an official offer to buy the plant and that should one arrive, I will not enter into such an agreement without deep consideration. Chapter 7 Frost pulled into the rental house garage, her whole body weighed down by heartbreak. One day and Tannen had proven himself a complete Christmas cad. She could never truly love a man who banned Christmas from his company, who scoffed at nutcrackers and scowled at gingerbread houses. She rested her head against the steering wheel. And yet, a part of her still loved him. He was so handsome, much more so than she'd ever dreamed. His jaw was chiseled like Superman's, and his eyes were so deep she could spend a lifetime swimming in them. Her feelings weren't all superficial. There had been a few moments today when she thought he'd recognized her, seen appreciation and attraction in his gaze, and her heart had soared like Prancer through a sky full of stars. The man she knew was inside, hidden under layers of self-doubt. 
She groaned. Sitting in the garage wasn't going to solve her problems, so she made her way inside. The garage door closed silently and she tiptoed down the hall, ready to have a good cry. Stella's door was open halfway, and Frost looked inside to make sure the coast was clear before darting across the opening. What the fruit cake? She flattened her hand against the door and pushed it all the way open. Robin jumped. Frost. She crossed her arms in front of her chest, but there was no hiding the black lace shirt and silver miniskirt. Robin's legs went on for miles, smooth and toned and hanging out there for the world to see. What are you doing? Frost crossed the threshold. The room was in the same state of disarray Stella left it each morning as she tried and discarded clothing options. Where's Stella? Robin moaned and buried her face in her hands. She's out with some guy we met this afternoon. She threw herself on the bed as if she were going to make a snow angel in the piles of clothing and sighed heavily. Frost, feeling her disappointment, sat next to her and placed a hand on her arm. Robin sniffed and swiped at an errant tear. I just wanted to know what it feels like to be Stella for a minute. You know? To have guys look at me like they want me. She glanced at Frost, her face full of guilt. Most days, I like who I am. But we went out to lunch and it was like I didn't exist. Frost lay down next to Robin, staring up at the ceiling. Her broken heart leaned heavily against the back of her ribs. Men are confusing, she said quietly as she split her hands on her stomach and just ached for tannin. All day she'd felt this frustration and unhappiness in him, which she'd used to explain his bad behavior. Maybe he didn't like his job, he'd mentioned several times how stressful it was in his letters. And he'd talked about disappointing his dad and how that made him feel bad. But canceling Christmas? That was, personal. If he'd cared about her, the woman he'd written letters to for most of his life, not the secretary he'd hired that morning, then he never would have attacked Christmas. To ban it from his company was more than she could bear. Robin reached for her hand and clasped it with her own, resting them between their two bodies. I don't want a man who wants me to be something I'm not. And I don't want one who says one thing and does another. Robin bolted to her elbows. Where were you today? Frost sighed. I went to the paper company. Oh, Frost. There's more to life than parchment. Thank goodness her sisters didn't know how badly she'd messed up her one chance at a Christmas wedding with the only man who had ever made her heart jingle. I want to go home. Robin glanced down at her bare legs. Me too. But I don't dare leave Stella here on her own. There's no telling what trouble she'll get into. Exactly. And yet you let her go by herself on this date. I didn't have much of a choice. I'm a horrible third wheel, the older, dowdy sister. Perhaps taking her mind off her own problems and putting them on Robin's would help heal her heart and give her a chance to get over Tannen. Although, a woman doesn't get over a man like that, not when he was her best friend, confidant, and promise all rolled up into one. She sat up and tugged at the silver sparkling skirt. If you want to dress like a Martha Mayhovier, I can totally help with that. Robin twisted her lips in contemplation. I'm not sure I want to go that far, but maybe it's time I stop dressing like mom. Frost nodded. Robin smacked her arm. You're not supposed to agree with me. Oh, I kind of felt like you were in an honest mood. Robin rolled her eyes. Your mood sensor is almost as bad as Ginger's naughty and nice radar. Frost forced her cheeks back into a smile. It's not something I can help. She patted Robin's leg. We'll go shopping tomorrow and find you a new look. Something that will melt the walls of your room and have men falling at your feet. And then I want to go home. Robin laughed. If you can accomplish that, then I'll owe you one. Deal. You can convince Stella to cut our trip short. Frost got to her feet. 
Now go change clothes. You're freaking me out. Robin laughed. Fine. She hopped to her feet as if her burden had been exponentially lifted. Frost wished she could say the same thing about her troubles. When she entered her room, she ached to write Tannen a letter about today, to tell him all the details and know that he would read every line and see her side. She doubted he would see today the same way she did. She changed quickly and buried herself under layer upon layer of blankets. Squeezing her eyes shut, she prayed for sleep, because if she really thought about a life without letters on gold-rimmed paper, she'd never be able to hold back the tears. Chapter 8 Tannen waited until his car was the only one in the parking lot before leaving the office. He wasn't going to set foot outside until he was sure every reporter was off the premises. They hadn't taken nicely to his one official comment, but he wasn't willing to discuss the possibility of selling the company nor his reasons for wanting to sell the company. They were deep and went all the way back to his childhood fight with cancer, something he held so tight to his chest that it would be impossible to let it all out without creating a hole. He also didn't want to run into Ms. Cratchit, although she'd made it clear that she couldn't stand him. The looks he got from the office staff when he went for his afternoon soda in the break room could have lit his tie on fire. How on earth she managed to ingratiate herself into the hearts of nearly every employee in such a short amount of time was beyond him. He'd worked with these people for years and they could hardly stand to look at him. Worse yet, he could hardly stand to look at himself. What had he done, banning Christmas? That wasn't like him. He actually liked the holiday. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Ms. Cratchit had gotten to him, that was all. She put her nose where it didn't belong. The drive home was heavy with regret. A sense that he'd lost more than a personal assistant scratched at his mind. He attributed the feeling to his misplaced attraction to the dynamic woman. A man like him, an old man before his time, had no right feeling that way about Ms. Cratchit. She deserved someone who could match her enthusiasm for life step for step, not drag her down by limping along behind her. He ran his hands over the leather steering wheel, trying to remember the last time he'd been enthusiastic about life. Probably the day his son was placed in his arms. And the first time he'd heard him say Dada. Building a snowman together on Christmas last year with Brody was a magical day. All his best memories centered around his son. And yet a son couldn't fill the place in his heart reserved for the love of his life. He pulled through the heavy iron gates and parked near the front door. His parents' three-story house was made of red brick with black shutters and white trim. A classic look for sure, but anyone who knew his mother would expect nothing else. The cobblestone front walk was banked by neatly trimmed bushes. They didn't have a front yard as much as they had a garden. Large hedges lined the area and cedar wood chips covered the distance between flowers. Several Japanese maple trees fluttered in the evening breeze, their bare branches reminding him of the torment in Ms. Cratchit's eyes before she'd bidden him farewell. A breeze picked up his tie and flung it against his neck. A storm was coming, and by the chill in the air it would bring heavy snow with it. He entered the house, removed his shoes, and paused inside the door to listen for Brody. The boy hadn't learned the difference between inside voices and outside voices, and since he hadn't learned it by eight years old, he wasn't likely to learn it in this life. The house was quiet. Too quiet. Tannen breezed through the kitchen, snagging a roll from a bowl on the counter and tearing off a piece. His mom had some serious talent with yeast. He was on his way up the staircase when he heard voices coming from his father's office. Dad didn't go in there much since leaving the mill. Curious, Tannen headed that direction. It would make things much easier. Dad's words came out in his deep timbre. He's done everything we asked him to do, Donald. He's the man you always thought he could be, Mom replied. Tannen stopped his advance, caught in a snare. If he moved forward, his parents would know he had heard something and they'd stop talking. If he backed away, he may never know what they truly thought of him. 
A desire to please his father, one that was placed in his heart the day he was born, compelled him to stay, to listen with a sense of purpose. Had he pleased his dad? He'd invested hours of labor for a degree he didn't want and years of working a job that was slowly turning him into a, what had Miss Cratchit called him, a Grinch and a Scrooge rolled into one. What would Miss Kringle think of him if she knew the resentment that drove his daily actions? He didn't have time to contemplate the answer, as his dad was talking again. He's a sound businessman and I am proud of his work at the plant. But, prodded mom. But I see him making the same mistakes I did as a father, and I want more for Brody. We can give him more. Tannen leaned forward on his toes, his arms tingling with dread. He didn't want us to adopt Brody when he was born. What makes you think he'll do it now? Mom's tone was soft and more hopeful than Tannen would have liked. He's building a life for himself and he's never here. At least he had you when I worked late. Brody has us. And we can be great parents for him. I know we can. Tannen clenched his hands into fists. His parents would not get custody of Brody. He was Brody's father, and that was how it was going to stay. Let them ask, he'd have no trouble telling them how it was. He turned smartly and made his way to Brody's room at the top of the stairs. He pushed the door open with a flat hand, letting the light from the hallway spill across the bed. Brody faced the wall, his shoulder lifting slightly with each breath. Tannen stepped onto the plush carpet that often had lethal Lego pieces. He scooted his foot along to avoid toys and settled onto the side of the bed, the mattress sinking under his weight. Brody stirred, rubbed his eyes, and then smiled up at Tannen. Dad. Tannen released the tension in his neck and arms as he scooped up his kid. Brody smelled like shampoo and soap and laundry softener. I missed you, big guy. Brody hugged him back. How was your spelling test? I got nine out of ten. That's pretty darn good. Grandpa said I could do better. Tannen bit back his response. He remembered all too well the conversations Dad liked to have about grades. An A was for acceptable. An A plus was fine. Just fine. Never was anything brilliant. Wonderful. Great. I think you did fantastic. Brody's whole face brightened, and so did Tannen's soul. This was where he needed to be. Right here, being Dad. Tannen relaxed his hold and let Brody settle back against the pillow. He yawned, showing off the hole where one of his baby teeth had fallen out. The sight was a reminder of how fast Brody was growing up, and Tannen was missing it. His dad was right. He hadn't been around much, first because of college and now a job that just wouldn't allow regular hours. But it did allow weekends and holidays. Hey! Why don't we do something fun this Thursday? It was Thanksgiving after all. Brody's eyes popped all the way open. Can we go ice skating? Tannen cringed. His prosthetic could do many things, ice skating wasn't one of them. He tried not to let himself feel like less of a man or less of a father, but there were times when he wished for a normal body. Maybe. He just couldn't bring himself to say no when Brody was so hopeful. I'll see if there's a rink nearby. If not, I'll find something else for just us guys. Okay. Brody adjusted his position. Tannen tucked the blankets up around him and pressed a kiss to his cheek. Good night. Night, Dad. Two words was all it took to cement his desire to keep Brody. A boy needed a father. Tannen swore to himself that no matter how many reporters he had to wade through, he'd be there to tuck his son in at night from now on. Not only that, he was going to be the one to help him practice his spelling words. Once he was in his room, the door firmly shut, he scrolled through his phone to find Brad Goodfellow's number. Brad picked up on the second ring. They exchanged greetings and Tannen apologized for calling so late. It's no big deal. 
What can I do for you? I'd like to continue our conversation from the other day. They spoke for a half hour, going over sale options. Tannen needed to think carefully before he made any decisions, but by the time they were done, he'd pretty much agreed to sell. Heck, he decided the minute Brody hugged him. Only the particulars slowed him down. After hanging up the phone, Tannen sat down at his desk and retrieved a fresh sheet of gold embossed letterhead. Dear Miss Kringle Chapter 9 Frost plopped her purse on her beautiful and beloved secretary desk. The bag rolled to the side, and she caught it before it fell off the edge. That was strange. She tried again, rocking it a little before it found a stable bottom. Minus Robin's new look thanks to a wardrobe makeover, the trip to Oregon was a mistake, and she felt the weight of loss most keenly now that she was in the mail room. Welcome back, Miss Kringle, said Agus. The bell on the end of her purple hat jingled a merry tune. Thank you. Frost tucked her chair underneath her and settled into the familiar cushions, only to have to shift several times to get her balance. The desk was in order, the incoming stack only a few envelopes tall. Dad had done well while she was gone. Why wouldn't he? He'd done this job longer than Frost, although he wasn't used to the new computer system. Still, the waiting work wasn't as much as she'd feared. Cracking her knuckles, she settled into reading letters. She was so thankful she hadn't told anyone of the highly personal nature of her trip south. If the family knew what she'd done, what she wanted to do, she shuddered. The consequences would be dire. She reached for a letter on the corner of the desk, intent on burying herself in Christmas wishes and forgetting about the Scrooge who lived in Elderberry. The letter scooted away from her. She paused and tried again. This time the letter scooted right off her desk and fluttered to the floor. She stared after it, confused. It was almost as if the letter itself didn't want her to read it. She glanced over her solder to see if Agus had noticed. The elf was busy with the automated envelope opener. Frost put her hands on her hips. She'd never had a letter deny her reading before. She slowly put her hand out and ran it across the line of incoming letters. They shrank away from her as if she were going to burn their pages. With a huff, she sat back in her seat. It's not the letter's fault. Ginger came out from behind a row of filing cabinets. Her usually cheery face was drawn and her blue eyes crackled like ice. It's Christmas magic. Frost stiffened in response to what she felt in Ginger, sadness, reserved anger, and disappointment. What's going on? Ginger shook her head, her auburn curls swaying with the movement, and motioned for Agus to leave them alone. Agus made her way deeper into the rows of filing cabinets. Somewhere in there was her personal space. Frost had looked for it several times, but like the rest of the cave, it was tied into the magic, and unless Agus wanted her to find it, she wouldn't. I'm not even sure where to begin. With slow, steady grace, Ginger pulled her hand out from behind her back. In her delicate fingers was a gold embossed envelope. At the sight of communication from a man she thought she loved, tears pooled in Frost's eyes. It's not what you think. Tell me what I should think, Frost. Ginger ran her fingers across the torn opening. You opened it? Frost snatched for the letter. Ginger let her have it without a fight. This envelope didn't play keep away. It settled into her fingers as easily as a pair of mittens. It was addressed to Miss Kringle. There are five of us. And I didn't understand how anyone would know we existed or have our address, so yes, I opened it. Once I read it, I, there was a, a, shift. She twirled her fingers and a cracking breeze blew through the room, fluttering papers. Frost gripped her sister's hands to stop her from twirling the breeze in a room full of loose papers. You can't unleash the four winds in here. The seriousness of the situation catapulted her pulse over healthy limits. 
The big mail rush is less than a month away. Every day we'll fill this room with more letters, you can't blow them about. Ginger nodded seriously, crossing her fingers as if hoping for the best. From the steely look in her eye, good things were not on the way. Frost sniffed and looked down at the letter that felt foreign in her hands. The only letter Christmas magic would let her touch, perhaps because it was addressed to her. Pulled between wanting to fly high over the ocean and give the letter over to the winds and the waves and a need to read Tannen's words once more, she asked, what does it say? Enough. Ginger placed her hand on Frost's forearm. How did it go? I assume you went to Elderberry to meet with him. Frost nodded, her throat too full of emotion to talk clearly. Well? She sniffed and brushed her finger under her nose. I'm not writing him anymore. He's not who I thought he was, and his letters were a lie. All of them. It's over. Ginger hugged her fiercely. Frost's body shook with sobs that threatened to overtake her. Ginger lifted her chin. I don't want to do this, she said softly, talking to someone or something other than Frost. Frost pulled back and looked around. No one was here but them, yet Ginger's eyes were rimmed in red. You're talking to the magic now? She pressed her lips. Not in words, per se. I have this feeling, no, a compulsion, that I have to send you back. Send me back? Frost recoiled much like the letters had pulled away from her only moments before. You can't send me back. I have to. Ginger fisted her hand and pressed it into her stomach. Frost could feel the guilt inside Santa at having to banish her youngest sister. Banish. Not just send away, but prevent from coming back. What did I do that was so bad? Frost held her hands out in front of her. I helped a boy believe in Santa Claus. You told him about you, about us, about the magic. You responded to a Santa letter. Nothing he couldn't have read in a dozen books or seen in as many movies. You took away his opportunity to believe and force-fed him the truth. I gave him hope when he didn't have any in love, she cut off and clammed up, afraid she'd said too much already. You don't have to be shy. It's obvious he loves you too. Ginger pointed to the envelope, still in Frost's hand. Her features softened and the icy blue in her eyes melted. You love him. I love the man I thought he was. He's different. Downright ornery. Ginger smiled knowingly. I thought the same thing about Joseph. But under all his bluster was a carpenter with a kind heart. Tannen C. Boo wouldn't know a kind heart if it hit him in the stocking. Frost. Ginger gasped. You know, I'd expect something like this from Stella, but you. Now that her deception was revealed, Frost felt free. Free for the first time in as long as she could remember. Free to be her, to let her naughty list side shine. She lifted her chin. I've been writing Tannen for sixteen years and not one of you knew about it, how well do you really think you know me? Ginger's eyes darting around the room. You lied? Frost drew in a deep breath through her nose and grinned. With pleasure. What? I liked having Tannen all to myself. I liked having a secret. I liked flirting through letters and not telling the rest of you about my secret boyfriend. Do you know why? Ginger planted her fists on her hips. I can't imagine. Because he was mine. Just mine. He isn't part of this icy world we live in. He is normal, and he chose me. Me, the weird sister with the snowy white hair and the freakish purple eyes who sews her own clothes and enjoys reading things like government reports on paper coatings. She hiccuped as a sob built in her chest. Ginger wrapped her in a hug and held on tight. Frost. He picked you because you're amazing. 
Ginger's heart was aching for Frost, which made Frost's heart ache too. This was why Frost preferred the male room to real life. Yes, sadness crossed her desk, but there was more hope than despair. And she was so sensitive to both. The least she could do was make this easier on Ginger. I'm okay. It will be okay. She rubbed Ginger's back, flipping to the role of comforter. Ginger sniffed loudly. Stop being all noble. You're killing me. She wanted Frost to lash out, to make it easier to say goodbye, but Frost couldn't bring herself to behave badly and cause more pain. Even with her dash of spice, she wasn't one to look for ways to misbehave. Writing Tannin was her one rebellion, and look where that had gotten her, cast out of her home. I don't know what we'll do without you, Frost. I don't want to send you away. We need you. Ginger let her go and spun in a slow circle. I have no idea how this end of things works. There was too much to tell her. The filing system. The way the letter spoke to her about the trouble kids had with bullies or older siblings or parents who fought and how that played into what she entered into the computer. Ginger would be able to put them on the naughty or nice lists, but she didn't have the empathy to know which children needed an extra chocolate orange in their stocking or exactly which gift on their list would make them feel the most noticed, the most loved. Christmas would continue without her, but it wouldn't be as personal. The elves know. Dad knows. They'll help you. Frost had to believe that. The elves paid attention to her methods, surely they picked up some of her preferences. He did all this before I did. Dad's busy with Lux and Quick trying to stabilize the magic room. Stabilize? Can't you feel the floor tipping? Frost stared at the desk where her purse sat precariously. Her perfectly level desk that wasn't level now. Balance needs to be restored. Ginger nodded. They're adding shims under one side of the substation to keep it level. I can't add this to Dad's plate. I'll bring Joseph in, he planned to take November and December off of carving. Frost's guilt doubled. Now she'd ruined her brother-in-law's holiday. Not only that, but she'd hoped to be the one to get married and level everything out. She'd not only messed that up, but left a pile of reindeer droppings in her wake. Ginger took Frost by both hands. You'd better get back before Christmas. How? Frost stomped her foot. How do I undo this? She was so mad at herself for throwing away her family in Christmas and all that she held dear for a charlatan. Ginger pressed her lips together and smiled. Restore Christmas spirit. Where? How? Ginger squeezed her hands. Think, Frost. You read letters every year from all over the world, surely you can find a place that's missing Christmas spirit or know of a Grinch. Frost gasped. A Grinch. A big, tannin-sized Grinch. No. She couldn't. The door flew open and slammed against the wall, making both sisters jump. Dad stood there, almost filling the doorway. He'd recently exhibited the ability to grow when he was angry, making him look more like a Viking king out to pillage than the mild-mannered grandfather who delights children the world over. Frost. Her name bellowed through the open room. What have you done? Frost shivered. And then a thought appeared that made her question just how far Christmas magic could reach. With a firm plant of her shoe in the carpet, she shook her finger in the air. Why now? With a flip of her hair, she marched right up to Dad's face and shook that finger at his slightly red nose. I've been writing Tannin for years. Years. And Christmas magic didn't care until Ginger read my letter. Why now? Dad shrank in size, his belly growing out and his shoulders growing in. He chewed on his lower lip as he thought, making his beard dance and pop tannin? Tannin see boo, the amputee? Frost stuck her tongue to the roof of her mouth and nodded. 
They may have found out about the letters, but Dad didn't know what was in them. If this letter was like the others Tannen had written, then Ginger would have a pretty good idea of what was going on. Dad tugged on his beard as he thought. It could be that it didn't mind so much because your motives were pure. I remember when you brought me his letter, you were so upset that we couldn't fix his leg. I think Christmas magic may have looked the other way because you were spreading Christmas joy to someone who needed it very much. His blue eyes, so much like Ginger's, sharpened. What changed? Frost cleared her throat. I may have met him. Ginger shook Frost's arm. Keep talking. And he was horrible, just horrible. He canceled Christmas in Elderberry. Ginger's hands flew to her mouth and Dad clucked disapprovingly. Aware that she'd cast Tannen in the role of Christmas villain and that her family would never consider him for the good list, she backpedaled. Not for the whole town, just at his paper plant. Frost dropped her gaze to her red heels with tiny cherry blossoms on the fabric. Her black silk pants were set off by a green kimono shirt with the same blossoms stitched into the hem and around the neckline. Which employs most of the town. Ginger's face suddenly brightened. That's fantastic! She clapped her hands together, her red and white striped fingernails flashing like a Christmas sale sign on December 23rd. A warm and calming breeze brushed Frost's hair off her shoulder, and she sent Ginger a warning look. Dad's white, full eyebrows lowered. Ginger didn't wait for either of them to ask her what she meant. She plowed on ahead like she was in a sleigh pulled by eight tiny reindeer. Frost has to restore Christmas spirit somewhere, she should do it in Elderberry. No Frost sliced her hand through the air. The last place in the world she wanted to be was anywhere near Tannen Boo. Her heart wasn't fully healed from the loss of the chance to love him. Yes. Dad struck his finger into the air, ceasing Ginger's windy excitement. It's perfect. It's not, Frost insisted. But it is. Dad's eyes twinkled, all merry and bright. His heart was so full of hope that Frost had a hard time not jumping on the one-horse open sleigh and heading for Oregon. Tannen trusts you. He knows who you are. All you have to do is convince him that it's true, restore his faith in Christmas, and get him to celebrate it with the plant. Tannen didn't trust Ms. Cratchit. In fact, after the way she stormed out of his office, she'd be lucky to be allowed back in the building. Frost cocked a hip. Oh, is that all? Ginger and Dad gave her twin looks of confusion. Her cocked hip was more a Stella move than a Frost move, and she was rarely the sarcastic daughter that was more of a Robin thing. Well, she was entitled to her own feelings, and she kept herself folded into an envelope for years. She felt everyone else's feelings, why not allow herself to feel hers, too? Ginger shook off her shock first. You can do this, Frost. There's no one jollier than you in all of the North Pole. Look who's talking. Exactly. You've always been so happy, like Princess Happy. You can spread some of that around Elderberry, and they'll be singing like who's around a giant tip top -ly tree in no time. Frost liked the image Ginger painted, but she was at a loss as to how to make that happen. She'd always been happy because she had Tannen in her back pocket, a secret delight all to herself. Without him, without a letter to look forward to, she wasn't sure she was as jolly as Ginger claimed and the task ahead seemed abominable. Dad took her hand and pressed a kiss to the back. I believe in you, Frost. Those words, which meant so much to Santa, were like hot pokers edging her towards the door. She reached for her Kringle bag, half expecting it to slide away from her like the letters. It didn't, and she slipped the thin strap across her front. Maybe Christmas magic believed in her too. Good thing, because she wasn't feeling that confident in herself. Ginger and Dad hugged her before turning to the letters on her desk, which practically leapt into their outstretched hands as if they'd been dying to be read. 
Frost glared at them, traitors that they were, before making her way to the stables. The barn, normally a bustle with elves caring for the animals, was empty. The lack of jingle bells ringing was eerie, and Frost had to force her feet forward on the uneven ground. The slope was more pronounced here where the ice wasn't covered by carpet and her feet slipped easily. She walked along the individual stalls, deciding which reindeer to take with her, the straw whispering under her feet. She would need an animal that could be closed up in a barn for as long as it took Frost to complete her mission. She wasn't in a big hurry to get there, so speed wasn't much of an issue. She stopped in front of Vixen's half-door with a sprig of mistletoe carved into the wood. His chin hair was silver and his coat was dull. He didn't look like he could spend long periods of time away from the North Pole, the constant care the elves heaped upon him, and the large feedings of oats and carrots. She moved on. Prancer turned his nose up at her and flicked his antlers. Well, we're full of attitude and scorn. Now Christmas magic was turning the reindeer against her. She slunk ahead. Kennedy huffed loudly. Dunder was sympathetic but not interested in her plight. Blitz practically laughed her out of his stall. Frost was beginning to wonder if she could make it back to Elderberry without asking someone to drive her when Max poked his head over the door. His big brown eyes, rimmed with blonde lashes, beckoned her near. Max wasn't the best or brightest reindeer in the stable. His belly could rival Santa's bowl full of jelly. He was known to just lie down when he was tired and not move until he was darn good and ready. He was also known to look at the ground when he walked and run into the stable walls. Maybe his lack of common sense was why he didn't shun Frost. Hey there, Max. Frost rubbed his forehead, just below his forelock. You wanna give me a ride? He bumped her arm with his warm nose. At least you're in the mood to fly. She unlatched the door, and Max followed her out of the stall, standing in front of a rickety old sleigh. No, boy. We're going to take one of the newer sleighs. She stepped backwards, towards the same sleigh she and her sisters had taken to Elderberry. Max shook his antlers. He kicked the sleigh behind him as if to say, this one. Frost rubbed her lips together. Will that thing even fly? It'll fly, but you're in for a bumpy ride, said Selwara as she approached with a harness. Frost at her warily as she harnessed Max were all the elves. Solora's hands only paused for a second, like her hands were stuttering. They don't take to outsiders. Frost slumped against the old sleigh, earning a splinter in her arm. The sting in the flesh was nothing compared to the sting in her heart. At least she still had some of her Kringleness, healing and good health would come in handy. I'm a Kringle. Selora slapped the leather into place. Then act like one. Frost's mouth fell open and she snapped it shut. Elves are supposed to be jolly, she snapped as she climbed aboard the sleigh and threaded the leather reins through her fingers. She hadn't packed a bag and she suddenly felt unprepared without her clothing. Tilly would have created a practical outfit for restoring Christmas spirit. Every stitch was a stitch of love, and she was heading into the world without that love. Christmas magic had been her champion throughout her life, and it was her turn to champion Christmas, and she was a poor knight in tinsel armor. The only thing she had packed was Tannen's letter, still unread. She didn't feel right reading something she knew was a farce. And yet she tucked it in her Kringle bag carefully. Selora stalled away without another word. Frost didn't blame her for the slight. Christmas magic had broadcasted her indiscretion and she'd put them all at risk. No one expected the Sugar Plum Fairy sister to expose their world to a stranger or turn her back on a person in need of Christmas cheer. On top of that, she'd broadcasted an innocence she did not possess. She'd lied to her family and the elves for years. No wonder they considered her a stranger. She was beginning to wonder exactly who she was. Was she the Clark Griswold she professed to be, or was she something else? She didn't know, but she knew what she wanted to be. 
she wanted to be a Kringle. And there was only one path back to the North Pole, and that path ran directly through Elderberry, Oregon. On, Max, she called. Max shuffled forward several steps before lunging against the harnesses and lifting them into the air. He stretched his neck forward and twisted it side to side like he was working out kinks in his muscles. Frost sat on the seat and a spring poked her behind, one more punishment from Christmas magic. Seemed the mystical force was determined to make her miserable this year, and every year if she couldn't bring Christmas into the heart of old Tannen Cebu. The sleigh lurched to the left, a runner shaking with all the intensity of a Christmas storm. She corrected their course and the sleigh lurched to the right. Max turned his head and bellowed at her. I'm doing my best, but this hunk of junk is in worse shape than you, she yelled. Max snorted, and the next thing she knew, they were going down, 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 with nothing but trees and beach to break their fall. Frost screamed, gripping the leather so tight her tiny hands turned white. Max let out a strangled bugle call, and then they were down. Safe. Well, as safe as someone with a bump on the head and a bruise on her knee. She stumbled from the still-moving sleigh and landed on her hands and knees, breathing hard. I understand Lux's fear of flying now, she said to Max. His blonde lashes narrowed. He shook off his fur and took off running through the forest. Hey! Frost stumbled after him, her arm outstretched. Max lifted off, leaving her in a cloud of snowflakes. His trail turned north and she had no doubt he'd be looking for a bucket of oats back home within ten minutes. Thanks for nothing, she yelled at the sky. At least with her Kringle bag, she could improvise. There were huge trees all around her, planted close together. Yes, planted. Trees didn't grow this close on their own. That meant she was on private ground, which also meant someone could come along at any minute. Not feeling particularly chatty, okay, she had a full case of the Christmas blues, she reached into her Kringle bag and wished for a tent. She pulled one out, still in the protective bag. The charming red tag on the end said, some assembly required. Very funny. This was going to be a rough night. Part of her believed she deserved everything that came her way. Part of her resented Christmas magic, Ginger, and Max the grumpy reindeer for getting her into this predicament. And part of her needed some time alone to wallow in hot chocolate. After all, she had a broken heart and would have to face the cause of it all in the morning. If that didn't earn her some points with Christmas magic, then she was in deep reindeer dew. Chapter 10 Look at that! Tannen pointed over Brody's shoulder at the spouting mammoth gray whale. The sea was in turmoil today, gray and choppy far below them. The large rock, perched high on the cliffside overlook, was the perfect place to observe the whales without having to face the wild ocean. A light snow fell all around, adding to the magic of the moment. His heart yearned for Miss Kringle to share the moment with them. She would love the peace and the quiet and the wonder on Brody's face. In order for Miss Kringle to spend time with the two of them, he'd have to tell her he had a son, and he wasn't ready to do that. Having Miss Cratchit look at him like the worst sort of villain, he wasn't sure he was the man Miss Kringle thought he was or could be. The thought was unsettling. What if they met and she found him lacking? What would he do then? Who would love him as she did? Whoa. Brody was appropriately impressed with the blast of water and air shooting into the sky. His hazel-colored eyes went wide. He leaned back from the edge of their boulder as if the water shooting through the air, a hundred yards off the beach below, could reach him. Tannen placed a hand on his back to keep the boy from rolling off the other side of their perch. He'd intended to take Brody to the Enchanted Forest Amusement Park but didn't think about the place closing for Thanksgiving until they were already on the road. This lookout caught his eye and he pulled over out of a desperate need to entertain his son. An informational sign at the base of the rock told them that the whales could often be seen this time on year on their migration to South America. The moment he'd finished reading the words out loud, a whale had breached, 
drawing Bertie's attention and creating a complete fascination in his wonder-filled eyes. I think there's three of them. Tannen continued to point. The water was dark and the sky gray, making it harder to see the large shapes. They could only be certain of the ones who made water spouts. If this was a group of three, then that brought the total sighting to six so far. Tannen had spent most of their time together watching Brody watch the whales. This was the most fun he had in ages, and all they'd done was sit on a rock and watch the water. But Brody had opened up, talking about everything from his mathlete competition to the upcoming junior basketball season. It's a baby. Brody grabbed Tannen's chin and turned his face to the water. Sure enough, there was a smaller lump gliding through the water between the two larger ones. Tannen was just about to point out that the two larger whales were the parents when Brody exclaimed, It's like me and Grandpa and Grandma. He clasped his hands together in excitement, and Tannen's heart sank all the way down the cliff and threw itself into the frigid waters below. His son associated a family image with Grandpa and Grandma more than he did with his own father. What a dreadful outcome of working hard, or working too hard. Not that he wasn't grateful for all that his parents did for both him and Brody, he was. He just didn't want to lose his place as a Brody's father. Since he couldn't contradict Brody without stripping away the child's joy in the moment, he left the pronouncement hanging out there like rotting seaweed. Brody suddenly scooted right next to his leg. Dad, there's a lady watching us. He pointed to the trees a short distance away. This part of Oregon was covered in trees, and these particular trees belonged to the mill. They grew right up to the side of the roads, creating a topless tunnel. Tannen blinked out of his sad state and stared into the trees, finding a woman in pink with a shock of white hair. It couldn't be. Ms. Cratchit had said she didn't want to see him again. Made it clearer than ice. Yet there she was, hovering on the edge of the forest like some kind of winter nymph. He glanced up and down the road, sure he would have heard a car approaching. The lookout was graveled, not paved, and the crunch of tires on rocks would have alerted him to her presence. The way she stood there, shifting her weight from one foot to the other as if she was unsure of the next step to take, made him nervous. He scooted off the rock and motioned for Brody to come with him while staying behind his back. What do you want? He used his office voice, the rough one that got quick results and even faster answers. Brody ducked a little farther behind, startled by Tannen's tone. Tannen reached back and placed a hand on Brody's shoulder to let him know that he wasn't upset with him. It's okay, son. Ms. Cratchit was indeed wearing a bright pink, full-body snow parka lined with black fur that was clearly visible in the hood framing her heart-shaped face. Her white hair was draped over her left shoulder and hung down in soft waves, and her purple eyes shone with equal parts anger and wonder. You have a son? She practically whispered. He nodded, not sure what her intentions were. She pointed a finger at him. You have a son? He nodded again. She stared incredulously at him for a moment. Why didn't you tell me? Tannen opened his mouth to answer and then shut it again, unsure what the correct answer would be. She'd been his personal assistant for a day, and yet she acted like she was entitled to his personal information. She began pacing, stomping was more like it. Her black boots left tiny imprints in the snow. Her presence was so large and her clothing so loud that it came as a shock that she was small of stature. Best friend my stocking, she sputtered and came to a stop, looking at Brody like he was a mystery. She took him in from head to toe and then settled for looking right in his eyes. The snow stopped falling. Not that it stopped snowing, no. The snow hovered in the air as if time itself were standing still. A rush of warm wind swirled everything like the inside of a snow globe. Tannen shut his eyes against the flakes. When he opened then again, Ms. Cratchit was in front of Brody, bending slightly to be at his level, her eyes bright with wonder. Do you write letters to Santa? she asked him. Her smile was one of love and acceptance and openness. 
Watching her was like watching Christmas lights twinkle, it left him content and feeling like a boy again, a boy who didn't have to think about his next step or his lack of hair. He could just be himself. Brody stepped out from behind Tannen, not showing any of his usual reserve. Yeah. Her nose wrinkled with secret delight. What's your name? Tannen held up his hand, stopping Brody from answering. No matter how enchanting she appeared in this moment, this woman had stormed out of his office not two days ago, leaving it much more organized in her wake but still leaving in quite a state. He certainly wasn't going to hand out his son's name to a relative stranger who had called him, among other things, a Grinch. Ms. Cratchit, what are you doing out here? She blinked as if coming to herself and straightened to her full height, which was barely to his shoulder. My Slalverado broke down. She motioned behind her. He wasn't buying it. The trees were much too close together for a truck to have gotten between them, and the company paths were gated off. In the woods? Unfortunately. She stepped forward, brushing her gloveless hands against her legs as she moved, making a soft swish-swish sound. And the fact that you're the first people I've seen since then makes me wonder if my stars are truly out of alignment. She headed for the rock they'd been sitting on before, and he thought he heard her say, Christmas magic never was subtle. But that would have been ridiculous. He'd been thinking awfully hard of Miss Kringle earlier and his subconscious must have misheard her. And what were you doing in the woods, he pressed as he and Brody followed behind. She frowned. Reconsidering my life choices. Her response was full of enough sarcasm that he could be certain she hadn't enjoyed her foray into the pine boughs. He looked up and down the empty road. There hadn't been much traffic this morning, and now, when he wanted someone to come along and solve the problem of Ms. Cratchit, there were only empty lanes and stillness. Would you like me to call someone? A family member or friend? A shadow crossed her face. My family is quite busy and she accused him with her eyes. I recently lost my best friend. Tannen tossed his hands in the air. She was unreasonable. It wasn't his fault she'd lost her friend. He didn't even know her. Yet she'd caused him to feel more deeply than anyone, save his son and Miss Kringle, in a very long time. Intrigued, he waited to see what she would do or say next. She threw back her hood and pulled her hair atop her head in a perfectly messy bun, securing it with an elastic she retrieved from her small shoulder bag. A bag like that should be out of place in this environment, but it suited her. Ms. Cratchit's delicate features would not loan themselves to a great deal of outdoor adventures, yet she'd scrambled up the rock as if she climbed often, finding two footholds that worked as steps and a crevice on the top for a handhold. Brody craned his neck to look up at her. What are you doing up there? Ms. Cratchit melted under his sweet inquiry like a snowball next to a warm fire. Wondering what you were doing up here. I don't want to interrupt your outing. It looked like the two of you were having a good time. Tannen briefly wondered how long she'd been watching them and what she thought of him as a parent. There were thousands of parenting and single parenting books, and he'd read his fair share, but none of them had specific instructions for his Brody and he often felt like he was walking in a dark room with his hands out in front of him. Would she share his dad's view that he'd failed in this area, or would she see into his heart and know of his love for Brody? He shook his head. He shouldn't be worried about what the sweet and unstable person thought of him. We're watching the whales. Brody reached up, and she tugged him atop the rock with ease. Tannen wasn't about to leave his son up there with a woman he hardly knew. In order to position his foot on the first step, he had to move his leg out with his hand. His face burned as Ms. Cratchit watched. He waited for her to blurt out, You're missing a leg? Why didn't you tell me? The words never came. Perhaps she did have a filter. He never really trusted his false leg to hold him without slipping, so he used his upper body for most of the work. Which only showed him how weak he'd become working in an office every day and working out every other or every third. 
Not that he was skinny by any means, he was fit, just not as fit as he once was. He used to be able to do so much more physical activity, and he regretted letting that part of his life slide. He was almost to the top when Ms. Cratchit's hand appeared before his face. Here, I'll pull you up. If there was one thing he hated, it was looking weak in front of others. He may be slow and out of shape-ish, but he wasn't so weak that he needed a lift from a woman he could dub a snowflake. I don't need your help. She rolled her eyes. Fine. Be a stubborn man and do it alone. She marched over and sat on the far side of Brody, leaving Tan and Les Rock to clamber over to find a seat. He appreciated her thoughtfulness and resented it at the same time. Who was she to pity him the loss of a leg? He didn't ask anyone to make exceptions for him, and he wasn't about to start now. Lowering himself with as much grace as he could while keeping his prosthetic stretched out in front of him, he landed next to Brody. Brody smiled up at the two of them as he clasped both their hands. Now we're like the whale family. Tannen smiled down at his son even as his stomach swirled with unease. Ms. Cratchit was a befuddled woman who made his heart race at the same time he wanted to yell, Shields up, Captain. Being near her was a confusing experience. Tell me all about them. Ms. Cratchit crossed her legs at the ankle and leaned back on her hands as if she had all the time in the world to listen to a nine-year-old recount his morning. Brody started with the last whales they'd seen and worked all the way back to what he'd had for breakfast. Do you have waffles with whipped cream or syrup? She asked. Syrup. Interesting. I once had a pancake with bacon cooked inside. Brody's nose wrinkled. Gross. Oh, but it was lovely. She smiled easily, and he returned the gesture. Though Tannen was on the outside of this conversation, he didn't feel like an outsider. The quick looks Ms. Cratchit shared with him over Brody's head, as if the boy was melting her heart, kept him quite involved. What's your favorite class in school? She prompted Brody to continue talking, soaking him up. Recess. Brody spoke with all seriousness and knowledge gained in four grades. She tipped her head back and laughed, the sound ringing out like jingle bells. Brody's eyes lit with wonder and he grabbed Tannen's hand as if needing something to keep him grounded. Tannen held tight, he could use a little grounding himself. I loved recess too. She tapped his nose. There was something off, she wasn't wearing gloves. Both he and Tannen had on knit gloves to ward off the chill. Yet her hands weren't pink with cold or chapped. They were smooth and beautiful. Tell me what you want for Christmas. Ms. Cratchit's request was so genuine that Tannen could believe she would deliver. His thoughts went to Miss Kringle, to her job in Santa's mail room. He supposed Ms. Cratchit and Miss Kringle would be good friends. The air around them hung heavy with expectation as they waited for Brody to answer. His small hands grabbed his stomach. I'm hungry. Ms. Cratchit glanced up at Tannen. Their eyes met briefly, and a spark shot through his system. Though she'd taken great offense at his behavior in the office, she had been nothing but wonderful to Brody, and there was a connection, a magic wrapping up the three of them. Before he thought better, he said, would you like a ride into town? Ms. Cratchit glanced back at the trees where her silver rotto had broken down. He still wasn't sure what she was doing tromping over his private property. Her appearance was like something out of the book of strange coincidences. And now that he had a moment to think about how they'd all come to be sitting atop a rock, warm and comfortable despite the howling wind below and the snow that slowly accumulated around them, he wished he could pull the invitation back. He should drop her at the nearest mechanic and let them figure out this crazy woman. I'm almost afraid to say no, she muttered. What was that? he asked. She mumbled a lot. I said I'd love to. She hopped up and offered Brody a hand and pulled him to his feet. With an eyebrow raised in challenge, a look that said even a child knew better than to be rude in this instance, she offered Tannen a hand. 
he removed his glove to get a better grip. The only thing more embarrassing than needing help was falling. Falling was horrible. He expected Miss Cratchit's skin to feel cold since she hadn't worn gloves all day, but her palm was warm and soft. His heart seemed at their touch and he caught himself staring into her eyes as she looked down at him. Her hair fell forward and he reached up with his free hand to tuck it behind her ear. The chill that had nipped at him all morning disappeared. She blushed, a pretty dusty pink color that brought to mind the hint of rose paper line. Thank you, she said softly. Stepping back, she braced her feet and tugged on his arm. He popped up without any trouble, landing exactly right on his feet to have balance, but standing precariously close to Ms. Cratchit. His hands still held hers, pressing it against his chest. She was so exotic with her white hair and amethyst eyes, he could look at her all day and not get bored. She had a pert nose that turned up slightly at the end. Her prominent cheekbones were the perfect accent to her wide eyes. And her pink lips were full and inviting. Wait, that wasn't right. Her lips were not at all inviting. They were just lips like every other woman's in the world. Although he had a hard time looking away from them when she was close enough that he could smell the faint scent of sugar and spice on her skin, he had to remind himself that she was, quite possibly, mentally unstable. After making their way back down the rock, mostly sliding on his part, they buckled into the rover with Brody in the back seat. Can I watch the Santa Claus movie? he asked. It's barely Thanksgiving. Tannen put on his signal and pulled onto the deserted, twisty road. The blacktop swerved and turned, staying parallel with the beach. In the summer, couples brought their convertibles along this road, the top down and their hair flying in all directions. It was ranked as one of the country's most romantic drives, but he preferred it with the trees heavy with snow and a blanket of quiet. Christmas isn't a time of year, it's a feeling of the heart. Miss Cratchit twisted in her seat to ask Brody, Do you like Christmas? It's my favorite. What do you like about it? Wait. Let me guess, the presents. Brody's smile filled the rearview mirror. Nope. Nope? Is it decorating the tree? He shook his head. Singing Christmas carols? Another shake. Okay, you're going to have to give me a hint. Brody grinned, having bested her at the guessing game. My dad gets the whole day off and we get to play. Miss Cratchit's hand covered her heart. You just keep getting better and better, kid. She reached back and patted his knee. I'll bet you're at the top of Santa's good list this year. Something in the way she said good list created a sense of deja vu in Tannen. Miss Kringle had often teased about putting him on the naughty list. She wrote with the same conviction that the list actually existed that Miss Cratchit used when speaking. He studied her out of the corner of his eye as she turned back around and adjusted her seatbelt. She was about the right age. Can I, Dad? Can you what? Brody's chin jutted forward in exasperation for having to repeat his request. Can I watch the Santa movie? He tapped a few buttons and the screen that dropped down behind his seat. Brody put on the headphones he used in the car and settled back, leaving the adults to their conversation. Tannen traced a leather seam in the steering wheel as he worked to come up with a way to approach a subject he thought he'd never have to discuss. He'd never actually asked someone if they were Santa's daughter before. You're uncomfortable, observed Ms. Cratchit and I thought I was hiding it so well. He gave her a rueful smile, the one he used to use with his mom when he was in trouble. She blushed that delightful pink again. You were. I'm just sensitive to these things. Oh. The corners of her mouth lifted, but her lips were firmly shut. She wasn't going to divulge much about herself unless he asked. They had another 45 minutes until they reached the outskirts of town. Have you seen this one? Tannen pointed to the movie screen hanging from the ceiling just behind the driver's seat. 
She laughed lightly. Yeah. Do you like it? She giggled. Yeah. He blew out a breath. Things had been going well, she seemed normal for a moment there. And now she was giggling over a children's Christmas flick. I don't get you, Ms. Cratchit. One minute you're almost normal, and the next you're not. She glanced down at the ends of her hair, hanging over her shoulder. I know. She dropped her face in her hands. I've had a rough couple days. He couldn't believe he was about to ask this. Do you want to talk about it? She shook her head quickly and then nodded slowly. Are you really going to close the mill? If he was a level two uncomfortable before, then her question brought him up to level six. I'm not asking for the press or for the employees. I want to know. Her hand came to rest on his forearm, creating a sense of awareness in him that he hadn't known before. Tannen, can you really put people out of a job at Christmas? The sound of his given name, spoken with such familiarity and, dare he say it, tenderness was almost enough to weaken his resolve. He glanced in the rearview mirror. Brody was the most important thing. Hadn't the boy just said that his favorite part of Christmas was playing with his dad? Playing with his father shouldn't be a once-a-year treat. If the offer is right, I can't see how I can say no. She pulled her hand away from him. But it's Christmas. What does Christmas have to do with it? Would selling in February be better? Yes. She answered as if his question was silly. He rubbed his forehead. Won't you reconsider? Reconsider being a father? No. She glanced out the window. Pull over. What? Let me out. He leaned forward to see the sky through the windshield. Dark clouds threatened. They were on their way to a big storm. I can't let you out here. We're miles away from Elderberry. Your lack of Christmas spirit is giving me a headache. He laughed. I'm sorry. It's not funny. She rubbed her forehead. I'm sorry, he repeated, this time more contrite. If I promise not to disparage Christmas for the rest of the drive, will you allow me to deliver you to safety? She folded her arms. I suppose. But I'm not changing my mind. You're making a big mistake, one you'll regret for the rest of your life. He thought of the joy he'd witnessed in Brody's hazel eyes today. Agree to disagree. Fine. She began humming, tapping her fingers on her knee to keep beat. It took Tannen a few minutes to figure out the tune. Santa Claus is coming to town. She was particularly good at emphasizing that he'd better watch out, which only made him chuckle to himself. What's your name, Ms. Cratchit? The humming stopped. She glanced at him and then at her hands, twisting in her lap. My name? Yes, your first name. She caught her bottom lip between her teeth. Frost. Frost? She nodded. He was tired of the formalities, and despite her strange ways and perhaps because of her defense for Christmas, he wanted to get to know her better. May I call you Frost from now on? Do you think that's wise? Probably not. With familiarity came friendship, and with friendship came the possibility of opening his heart to her. But what was a man to do? Tannen was lonely, except for Miss Kringle's letters, he had been lonely his whole life. But I'm willing to take the risk if you are. She lifted her chin. Very well. You may call me Frost. And you'll call me Tannen? She flipped her hair over her shoulder, her eyes sparkling with triumph. I already did. I noticed. He winked. She pressed her fingertip to her lips as if trying to hold back a smile. Her eyelids lowered demurely. Can we start over? Start over, she echoed. 
Yeah. Can we pretend that you didn't come to work on the worst day possible and that I didn't stumble upon you in the woods on one of yours? Can we just, I don't know, call a truce? Frost smiled shyly. Technically, I stumbled upon you in the woods. He chuckled. What is it about our worst days that brings us together? Frost's breath caught. I, I don't know. Well? He stuck out his hand. Can we try to be friends? Frost chewed her bottom lip as she looked from his hand to his eyes. Friends. They shook, and Tannen's body tingled with warmth. His thoughts went back to kissing her, to how good it felt to stand close to her, the warmth that surrounded him. Who was he kidding? Women like Frost had their choice of men. He may be the wealthiest man in Elderberry, but he wasn't a man she would consider for anything more than a ride into town and a free meal. Chapter 11 Frost was a messy box of Christmas candy. The kind with rock candy, baby ribbons, pillows, straw, chips, and pinwheels in a multitude of flavors, all mixed up in one shiny display of sugar shock. Tannen's request to start over had taken her off guard. The man had racked up offense after offense, and he wanted her to wipe those clean and start over? He had a son, for the love of fudge. All this time, he had a life she didn't know about. And she thought they'd told each other everything that mattered. He was the one person on earth she'd trusted with her secrets and her love. And he betrayed her by pretending to be something he wasn't. Wait, was this how Ginger felt when she found out Frost had been writing Tannen for years? Ugh. She was the worst Kringle ever. She pushed the thought to the back shelf for a time when she was ready to face her own ugly. And that time was coming, because she couldn't go home with it still inside of her. If she made it home. She glanced at Tannen's dignified profile. What he must have been going through as a single parent all on his own made her heart ache. Unless, unless he had a whole family, a wife, and more kids at home. What if she'd been the other woman? Her skin crawled at the thought. She glanced into the back seat to make sure Brody couldn't hear. Is he your only child? Sounding nonchalant was so much harder than Grandma's fruitcake in July. Tannen glanced in the rear view. Yep. Frost blurted out the next question. And his mother? His mean office face was back, the deep line between his brow. Is out of the picture. Her breath whooshed out of her as if Ginger had summoned the four winds. She wasn't the other woman. Her heart rocked around the Christmas tree and she felt so much better about agreeing to a truce. They needed to start over, but she was starting way away over, going clear back to their letter-writing days, because if they'd been the type of friends she thought they were, he would have told her about Brody. When he'd asked her name, she'd thought about telling him who she was, but something Ginger had said held her back. She'd said that by telling Tannen everything, she'd taken away his opportunity to have faith. Maybe, if she could get him to believe in Christmas, to have some faith without Miss Kringle, then his Christmas spirit would soar. That was a pretty big maybe, but it was all she had, so she kept her last name to herself and decided to remain Miss Cratchit. And if he didn't know who she was, then she could keep him far enough away from her heart that she wouldn't fall in love with him again. Last night, she'd held her warm cocoa cup between her palms and contemplated her past and how she would go about restoring Christmas spirit in the drab little town of Elderberry. She decided to put Tannen behind her. It was the only way to move forward. But she was finding that she was happy when she was with him. Well, when he wasn't storming around the office in a black cloud. She'd watched him with Brody, and the way his eyes lit up when Brody smiled endeared him to her in a way that no letter ever could. Tannen's emotions surrounding her in the vehicle were just as scattered as her own feelings for him. Most of the time, he didn't trust her. That was both understanding and upsetting. She'd said some pretty awful things to him at the office before she'd left, so she could understand why he would think she was out to get him. But then, there were moments when he softened. 
Then there was the zing of attraction that appeared without warning. Frost had to work doubly hard to keep her own emotions under control when Tannen looked at her with hunger in his eyes. Like she was a white chocolate peppermint truffle he couldn't wait to taste. Feeling his emotions feed her emotions created this circular cotton candy effect in her brain. She couldn't afford to go all spun sugar. She needed to stay focused on the goal and get back home. Tannen's phone rang through the Bluetooth speakers. The caller ID popped up on the radio console and read Mom. He cringed. Sorry, I need to take this. No problem. He fished his phone out of the inside of his coat. Hi, Mom. Frost looked out the window to afford him what little privacy one could get when having a conversation in the car. They passed a diner with pink and blue neon wrapping around the building. There were huge windows facing the parking lot, and the inside had teal booths and silver accents. A picture of a pumpkin pie had been painted on one of the windows, along with an invitation to come on in and try a slice. I have to stop somewhere first. He turned and lifted his shoulder as he paused. Someone who needed a ride. Frost pulled her lips in to keep from giggling. He was trying hard not to tell Macy Boo that he had a woman in the car. She could feel the heat under his collar as his mom prodded. She turned back to look at him pointedly, enjoying watching him squirm. He rolled his eyes. My, uh, assistant. Pause. No, not Mrs. Garen. Pause. Mom, no. I'll be home soon. He hung up and gave Frost an apologetic shrug. Mothers, right? They entered Elderberry city limits, and homes started popping up. I didn't ask you where you want me to drop you off. Frost threaded her fingers together and hooked them around her knee. She hadn't thought too much about where she was going to end up, but she didn't have to think hard. The rental was theirs for the month. Stella had booked an extended stay in case she met a man and needed a place to pretend was home. You can take me home. Turn right at the next light. He nodded, turning on his signal. A few turns later and they pulled into the rental. The lights were off, the house dark and foreboding. Frost drew in a breath to fortify herself. It was Thanksgiving and she was all alone. This is your house? It's a rental. She continued to stare at the empty structure. The dark front porch was a stark reminder that she betrayed her family and Christmas's trust. I suppose your car breaking down has kept you from a Thanksgiving dinner. She smiled sadly. Something like that. He frowned. Do you want me to drive you to your parents? She shook her head. We aren't on the best of terms this year. She knew exactly what the family was doing at that moment. Robin and her mom would put the finishing touches on the feast to end all feasts. They'd wear aprons over their evening gowns. In the Kringle house, Thanksgiving was a formal affair. Dad, Joseph, and Oliver would wear tuxes, and Quick would wear his army dress uniform. She had it cleaned and pressed not long ago, knowing how much Lux enjoyed seeing her husband in his shiny shoes. The dining room would burst at the seams this year. She sniffed, missing her family more than she missed reading letters. Layla had come to her apartment to get ready last year, they'd had such fun finding the perfect accessories for their dresses, and she'd added a dab of peach-colored gloss to Layla's lips. Pretty soon, the girl would be old enough to wear proper makeup, and if Frost didn't appease Christmas magic, she'd miss it. Because you lost your job? Tannen asked, his eyes wide. She huffed and then sniffed again. Something like that. Tannen shoved the car into reverse and backed out of the driveway. What are you doing? We can't have you missing Thanksgiving dinner. It's my fault you don't have a job so I guess I'll just have to feed you. It was my fault. She patted her chest. He chuckled. You may have quit, 
but who can be expected to work for Scrooge? She folded her arms, acting upset but secretly smiling. You can say that again. Hey! He reached over and squeezed her knee, making her jump. She playfully smacked his hand away. Be nice, or I'll put you on the gnaw, she caught herself. Tannen's playfulness died away quickly, his eyes becoming sharp. On the what? She tucked her hair behind her ear. Nothing. I don't know what I was going to say. Uh huh. He regarded her out of the corner of his eye. Frost held her breath, praying he didn't prod or push her. She was trying to do right by Christmas here. If she was going to do this right, she needed to stop flirting and start Christmasing Tannen. Chapter 12 Tannen pulled into the garage so Frost and Brody could get out of the car without being covered in snowflakes. The black clouds had rolled right into town and were unloading their cargo. Thankfully, there wasn't any wind. The palm-sized flakes drifted from the sky like flour through a sifter. He hesitated in the car, not sure if bringing Frost home was a good idea or not. He didn't want his parents to get the wrong idea about him and his assistant, ex-assistant. He really should hire her back. The office had never been so organized, nor so cheery. The contrast between her arrival and the place after her departure was too marked to ignore. That was a conversation for later. Now, he needed to get inside and explain things to his parents. Frost wasn't a romantic interest of his, she was a charity project. Romance wasn't something he excelled at in life, hence Bertie's mom taking off before the hospital had a chance to send the bill. Although, Frost was easy to tease. She'd sure jumped when he'd squeezed her knee, and he wondered if she was ticklish anywhere else. Brody's laughter brought him out of his thoughts, and he climbed out of the car to find his efforts at keeping snow off their shoes completely wasted. Frost stood in the middle of the driveway, her arms stretched out to the side and her head thrown back. Her mouth was open as she tried to catch snowflakes on her tongue while spinning in a circle. One, she called as she swallowed. Her eyes danced, inviting him to join them. I got two! Brody wasn't spinning. He was jumping after snowflakes, biting at them like a puppy in his first snowfall. Tannen laughed. Two, counted Frost. She stopped and then spun the other direction. No hands, Brody. She laughed that beautiful jingle bell sound, and both Brody and Tannen stopped to just watch her. One huge snowflake landed right on her tongue and she threw her arms in the air. 3. I win. Her smile faltered. What? Do I have snow on my face? She brushed at her cheeks. Wait. Tannen stepped forward. He removed his gloves and brushed the snow off her eyelashes, his fingers tingling at the contact. Her lashes tickled his skin, and he grew warm all over. Her amethyst eyes deepened in color and his heart quickened. Check me. Check me, Dad. Brody tugged at his coat sleeve and Tannen glanced down at him, breaking the spell. He brushed his fingers over Brody's eyes, even though he didn't have a snowflake on them. You're all clear. Let's go inside. Ah. Brody kicked at the snow as they walked to the garage. Once they were next to the car, they all stomped off their boots. The snow was up to their ankles. At this rate, the snow will be up to the rooftops before morning. Tannen pushed open the door to the mudroom and unzipped his coat. We'll be living in a snow fort. He tugged Brody's hat off and dropped it into the basket. That would be sick. Brody wiggled out of his snow gear. Frost giggled and knelt down to help him with his boots and then his snow pants. He took off running, his stocking feet slipping on the hardwood floor. Tannen sighed. What would it be like to have that much energy? Frost laughed. Let's give it a try. 
She ran a few steps and then planted her feet to slide across the recently waxed floor, sending her tumbling into Dad, who happened to be coming around the corner at the wrong time. He caught her with a noof. Frost's face turned red. Cinnamon sticks. I'm so sorry, Donald. I mean, Mr. Cebu. She tucked her hair behind her ear and sent Tannen a pleading look. Tannen shook his head. Dad, I'd like you to meet Frost Cratchit. She was a temp in my office last week, and I found her stranded on the side of the road today. Dad rubbed his side where Frost had hit into him and scowled. Tannen decided to lay it on thick. She's alone for the holiday, so I invited her to dinner. I didn't think you would mind. Dad's demeanor changed immediately. He was a sucker for someone in need. Welcome, Ms. Cratchit. Please, call me Frost. What an unusual name. She lifted her shoulders and bit her lip. You can hang your, uh, jumpsuit there, and we'll take you in to meet Mary. Thank you. Brody slid back into the room and took Dad by the hand. Grandpa, come help me build the train tracks. Dad hesitated. Tannen shooed them along. I can introduce Frost to Mom. You two go ahead. He turned back in time to see Frost shimmy out of her jumpsuit. Her back was to him and he had a view that he was suddenly thankful for. She might be petite, but she had the right curves in the right places. Her shapely legs were wrapped tight in a pair of brown leggings and she had on a fitted, long-sleeved cream-colored shirt. She snapped open her purse and brought out a long, emerald green cardigan that she shook the wrinkles out of quite easily. Without turning around, she pulled her hair out of the messy bun from earlier, and perfect waves cascaded down her back. Tannen's hand had come out in front of him, as if it needed to touch her hair. He struggled to pull it back to his side just as she flipped around. She slung her purse strap across her body. He glanced at the purse. He could have sworn that it was black to match the fur on her pink jumpsuit, but now it looked dark brown. He blinked. It must have been the lighting. He thought about holding out his arm to escort her to the kitchen, but that was ridiculous. He tucked his hands in his pockets and jerked his head. Come on, kitchen's this way. Frost fished a lip gloss out of her purse and applied it quickly. I must look a fright. You look wonderful, Tannen said, his voice much too low and intimate. He cleared his throat and threw open the kitchen door. Mom was at the oven, checking the turkey. She stood up, laughing because her glasses fogged over from the steam. Frost covered her giggle with her hand. Mom paused, ripping her glasses off and blinking at Frost. Tannen Cebu, you should have warned me you were bringing a guest. She marched over to Frost and shook her hand. Welcome to our home. My, but aren't you a pretty thing? Frost ducked her head. Thank you, but you should see my sisters. She glanced at Tannen. Don't be mad at your son. He didn't know I was tagging along until just a few minutes ago. Still. She reached up to hug Tannen. A text? Sorry. He hugged her back. She moved quickly back to the oven. Frost hugged herself as her eyes roamed over the spotless appliances and granite countertops. Like Mom needed to worry about a guest, the place was always clean. Your home is beautiful. I love the use of color. It's so refreshing to have things so bright and cheerful. Thank you. A lot of homes are going with white these days, but I've always loved color. Mom pointed to the turkey in the oven. Tannen, this is done. Can you get it out? Put it on that platter. Frost rubbed her hands together. What can I do? Would you mind peeling those potatoes so we can mash them? They should be cool by now. I'm afraid I'm running behind today. Sure. Frost went to work. 
Tannen bent carefully to get the turkey out of the oven. He braced himself with his good leg as much as he could. The pan landed with a crash on the top of the oven anyway as his balance was thrown off. Neither Mom nor Frost said anything about his clumsiness. At least he hadn't dropped the turkey. Who knew a bird with all the trimmings weighed so much? But it wasn't the weight that was the problem, it was the odd angle. Thank you, dear. Help Frost with the potatoes, will you? He turned to find Frost scooping the fluffiest mashed potatoes he'd ever seen into a serving dish. Once again, she'd accomplished a task much faster than anticipated. He grinned at her. You're like an elf the way you get things done. She nudged him with her elbow. Why, thank you very much. That's the sweetest thing you've ever said to me. He sobered. She was right. Despite her high performance on the job, he hadn't complimented her once. Frost, I'm sorry for the way I treated you, at the office. She blinked. Her voice dropped down to private conversation level. You said it was a bad day. We're all entitled to one every now and again. Tannen's chest warmed. Oh, good, you got them done. Mom took the bowl from Frost. Okay, let's take everything into the dining room. Follow me. She bumped the door open with her backside and disappeared. Tannen smiled down at Frost. She was so different from, well, from everyone. Yes, her beauty was beyond compare, but there was more to her than that. She had a happy innocence, like Brody. Or maybe it was a sense of wonder and the ability to just run with life they shared. In his son, the quality was endearing. In Frost, it drew him in and made it easy to be around her. Most of the time, he could scowl away someone's smile. But not Frost. She was happy in spite of his bad moods and mistrust. What's your secret? he asked. A small line appeared between her brows. Am I secret? Yeah, how do you stay so upbeat? I mean, here you are, alone on Thanksgiving, and you're smiling and dishing up mashed potatoes like you aren't bothered at all. She twisted her sweet-looking lips. I am bothered by it. It doesn't show. Then I must be good at hiding it. He leaned closer, his eyes tracing the small indent on her cheek, her jaw. He picked up a strand of her hair and found that it slid between his fingers like silk. Your hair is stunning. The air grew warm and heavy, pushing them together. For a moment, Tannen forgot all about himself. He didn't feel his prosthetic rubbing against his skin. He didn't feel the draft on his head, and he didn't feel the pressure of running a paper mill. Instead, he was light, floaty, big and strong, capable and enough. It's white, Frost whispered. Stunningly white, he gently corrected her. He inched closer, threading his fingers into her hair at the base of her skull and then combing down. Frost sighed and her lips parted slightly as if they were inviting him to taste them. He wanted to. Wanted to wrap her in his arms and hold her against him while he let himself get lost in a kiss. Suddenly, he was aware of himself again, of the dull ache in his leg, the bareness of his scalp, and the responsibilities he had to the company, but more importantly to Brody. Frost wanted him to keep the mill going, and he had to remember that. She may not be the enemy, but she certainly wasn't on his side in his plan to unemploy hundreds of people right before Christmas. He jerked tall, his heart thudding against his ribs so loudly his mom could probably hear it through the closed door. I'll take the rolls out to the dining room. Yeah. Um, she glanced around quickly, looking for an escape. I'll get the stuffing out of the turkey. Tannen grabbed a basket of rolls off the counter and followed his mom out the door. Their conversation, the shared moment, left him feeling like he was on the heavy end of a teeter-totter. 
The dining room, with its high back chairs, crystal chandeliers, polished floors, and drafty windows, was a cold contrast to the warm kitchen. Or maybe he was just chilled without frost around. She's pretty. Mom grinned at him from where she folded napkins. She's an employee. He needed some kind of boundaries. Frost was much too fun, too lighthearted, too jolly for him. And she was a temptation he couldn't afford right now. He needed to stay focused on Brody and selling the company. He needed to be a dad, wanted to be a dad. A pretty employee. Mom smiled smugly just before Frost came in balancing a casserole dish filled with yams and a large bowl of stuffing in her tiny hands. Tannen hurriedly took the yams from her. Thanks. She grinned up at him, and he felt a piece of his heart click into place. Ms. Frost Cratchit was doing something to him, and he wasn't sure what to do about it. Chapter 13 Thanksgiving dinner with the Cebu family centered around Brody. His grandparents clearly adored him, and Tannen doted on the child. If she were home, Frost would have made sure everyone was appropriately dressed and the table decorated elaborately. Thanksgiving was the only time of year she got to pull out the brown glitter. Frost listened quietly as Brody finished recounting the whale-watching excursion. Sounds like an adventure, said Donald. He turned and must have caught something wistful on Frost's face, because he said, I'm sure your family misses you. Frost smiled without showing her teeth, her lips pressed together with all she couldn't say. I know they are. She sighed heavily. I'm the life of the party. Everyone laughed easily as if she'd made a joke, but she hadn't been joking. I'm serious. She smiled. I'm the detail person in the family. No one else has wicked calligraphy skills for the place cards, the sewing skills to make place mats, table runners, and chair swags. And if it weren't for me, there would be no overall theme, my sisters would run amok. Donald and Mary exchanged glances. Mary patted the corner of her lips with her napkin. That all sounds lovely. Her gaze roamed over the bare table filled with platters and plates. The centerpiece was a lovely bunch of dried leaves, acorns, and twigs. They'd shoved it to one end of the table so they could all see each other. Frost bit her tongue. She shouldn't have said so much. Sounds like a lot of work, muttered Donald. It is, Frost agreed quickly. But for us, Thanksgiving dinner is the holiday dinner. Mom goes all out for Christmas. Tannen tipped his glass her direction. Frost remembered begging Tannen for details about his Christmas celebrations. Children all over the world celebrated differently. Filipinos put up decorations in September and have the longest celebration on earth. In Australia, they serve their plum pudding with ice cream because of the heat. In France, holiday revelers stay up all night on Christmas Eve and have a long, lazy meal with friends and family that includes oysters. But within each of the country's customs, families also create their own traditions. That's what she'd begged out of Tannen all those years ago, so it was no surprise that everyone around her bobbed their head. Will you have a piñata this year? Frost asked. Tannen set down his glass. How did you know we do a piñata? Frost's stomach plummeted to the floor. Doesn't, she searched for an excuse for her blunder. Doesn't everyone have a piñata at Christmas? They didn't. They so didn't. Mary laughed lightly. They should. Tannen relaxed and Donald chuckled. Brody smiled wide at all of them. He was happy to eat for a bit and shoveled another forkful of stuffing into his mouth. Frost let out the breath she'd been holding. She needed to get out of the spotlight. What other traditions do you have? Donald leaned back in his seat and rubbed his belly. We do our gift exchange that night. And we read the Christmas story from the Bible, added Mary. And Mom makes a feast. Do you make who pudding and carve a roast beast? 
Frost winked at Brody, thinking the boy would get the mention of the Grinch. What's a roast beast? he asked, his nose wrinkled more than a dress shirt left in the dryer too long. You know, from the Dr. Seuss book. He shook his head. Frost glanced around the table in disbelief. You've never read him how the Grinch stole Christmas? They all consulted one another before shaking their heads. Frost placed her hand over her chest. I'm appalled! Her tone was teasing, so no one took her all that seriously, but inside she was aghast. I have a copy in my purse. I'll read it with you later if you'd like. Brody perked up. You'll read with me? Of course. He started shoveling his food, eating faster than a reindeer coming home from delivering gifts. Slow done there. Tannen put his hand out. She's not running away right after dinner. I might. Frost cupped one hand around her mouth and whispered loudly, I don't like doing dishes. Brody's mouth fell open. Grandma makes me. Mary reached over and lifted his jaw. It's good for your character. He chewed for a moment before saying, I don't have a character. Mary leaned over and touched her forehead to his. You certainly do. He continued to chew on his food while he chewed on the thought. Well. Tannen rubbed his belly, just like his dad had done only moments before. I don't like doing dishes either, but someone has to. Donald got to his feet, picking up his plate as he went. If we all chip in, it'll go much faster. And we'll get to the pie quicker, Tannen added. Frost laughed. How can you think about pie after all this food we just ate? Mary giggled. Tannen could eat pumpkin pie anytime. It's his favorite. Frost had to bite her lower lip to keep from saying, I know. It's one of mine too. She rose, gathering her utensils and plate and following Mary into the kitchen. Donald and Brody went back and forth between the table and the kitchen counters, bringing in the food it seemed that they'd just taken out. Mary opened the dishwasher and began scraping plates into the sink. Tannen found the plastic wrap and tin foil and stored leftovers in the giant refrigerator. One of your favorite pies? Tannen asked for clarification on her earlier statement. Dishes clanked together and silverware clattered. The kitchen smelled of stuffing spices and butter. Donald teased Brody about a girl in class who Brody insisted was not going to beat him at the spelling bee. Frost could easily see herself belonging here, with these people. Her gaze traveled over Tannen's broad shoulders, and she could see herself belonging with him, too. White chocolate cream with peppermint is the best. That sounds good, said Mary. She turned on the disposal and no one said anything over the grinding. It's my mom's specialty, Frost explained when it was quiet again. Tannen stared at her. Why does that sound familiar? Frost turned her back to him under the pretense of covering the salad with plastic wrap and cringed. I don't know, she managed to squeeze out past her lyometer. She knew exactly why. December 17th, six years ago, she'd bragged about the pie to him in a letter. She'd even sent him the recipe. She really needed to keep her mouth shut or she was going to give away everything. He shrugged. It'll come to me. She hoped not. She really, really hoped he wouldn't put her and Miss Kringle together. Returning home, saving her family, and Christmas depended on it. Chapter 14 Tannen headed for the stairs. The snow had accumulated to almost two feet. Frost was going to have to stay the night. He wasn't sure how he felt about that. But, he was on his way to find out how she felt about crashing with the CE bus for a night, or possibly more if the storm didn't let up. Son? Dad called from his office. Can you come in here? Tannen glanced longingly up the stairs. Brody was up there, all ready for bed. 
Frost had made good on her promise and produced a copy of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It was strange that she carried that book around with her in her purse, and yet it didn't surprise him. She was a delightfully confusing woman. He patted the banister with his palm, made a turn on his good leg, and headed into the office. His mom sat on the small leather sofa, her hands clenched tightly in her lap. His dad stood behind her, his hand on her shoulder. They were both stiff. On the table in front of them was a stack of papers. He stopped just inside the door. What's going on? We have something we'd like to discuss. Dad motioned for him to sit in the matching chair to the left of the couch. He moved, falling stiffly into the cushions, his prosthetic kicking out. His father hated it when he did that, said it was Tannen just being lazy. Tannen didn't care. Sometimes, he didn't want to have to think about how he looked to everyone else, he just wanted to sit. Dad sniffed. Your mother and I have been talking. Tannen nodded for him to continue. We think it would be in Brody's best interest, in your best interest, if we adopted him. Even though he'd had warning from the conversation he'd overheard a week ago, Tannen still wasn't prepared for the blow. He pushed back into the chair as if the words had struck him. Mom put out her hand. We're here for him 24 hours a day and you work so hard. He needs us. Tannen's hands began to shake and his stomach trembled. He needs his father. I can step in there. Dad's eyes had that drilling thing going for them. They bored into Tannen as if trying to force his will into Tannen's forehead. Tannen slowly got to his feet. The only reason you're around is because you forced me to take over at the plant. Dad's drilling gaze turned to blades and shot right into Tannen's chest. You wanted to run the plant. I wanted to please you. Tannen struggled to keep his voice under control. I don't give a fig about the plant. I hate it there. What? Dad thundered. This was the father Tannen knew. The man who came home after dark and demanded respect and perfection from a son who knew he'd never measure up. Well, Tannen wasn't the little boy anymore. I'm selling it as soon as possible. If you want it to stay in the family, you'll have to buy it back. Otherwise, the loggers will be happy to take it off my hands. Your grandfather built that mill from nothing, and you thumb your nose at it like you're the prince of the world. You thumb your nose at me when you act like taking my child is an act of mercy. I'm a good father. Tannen pounded his chest with his fist. And I'm going to be the one to raise my son. He turned to his mom. Mom, you're right. Brody does need you too. But he needs you to be grandma and grandpa, not his mother and father. If you still want that role, let me know. Mom's eyes filled with tears. Please, Tannen. We love him so much. Dad's bluster blew out and his shoulders fell forward. He's got a real chance to play soccer in high school, maybe even college. How are you? How am I going to get him there on only one leg? Tannen spit the words. That's not what I mean. It is what you mean, but it's not what you want to hear out loud, so you don't say it. Tannen filled his lungs almost to bursting. Dad, if Brody wants to play soccer, I'll make sure he has every opportunity and coach. But, and note that this is coming from the boy you raised, you're not the best dad for him. I am. Even as he said the words, a feeling of golden light filled his body. It didn't matter if he only had one leg. It didn't matter what he had been through. What mattered was his commitment to being the best dad be could be, God's grace would take care of the rest. Dad set his jaw. You're right about one thing. If you think you can be what Brody needs, then I set the bar pretty low. Mom gasped. Donald! She looked back and forth between the two of them. This has all gotten out of hand. We're a family. 
Dad's got a vision of his perfect family in his head, Mom, and I'm not a part of it. He ran his hand over his scalp. I'll never be able to play the part. Everything I've done, college, the mill, all of it was to please him, but none of it could bring my leg back. Tannen, Mom chided. Tannen lifted his chin to his father. I honestly don't know who misses it more, me or you. Dad's nostrils flared. Cancer cheated us all out of a lot of things. Yeah, but just because I was the one who had the disease doesn't mean you get to take my kid. I'm not signing over my rights. Tannen headed toward the door. He paused. Brody and I will stay through Christmas, but after that, we're finding our own place. Who's going to watch him while you work? asked his mom. I told you, I'm selling the mill. For what the loggers are offering, I'll never have to work again. He left before he could see the truth settle over them. Taking the stairs as quickly as he could, he raced to his son. He needed to see him, hold him close, and make sure he was still there. The feeling of someone snatching him away was strong and propelled him forward, but he came up short when he heard Frost's voice reading softly. In Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. She emphasized three to show how much growth that was for a Grinch. Tannen leaned in the doorway. Brody and Frost sat against the headboard. Brody was under the covers, wearing his Captain America pajamas, and he had his arm tucked through Frost's elbow. His face was shiny and Tannen would bet that even his teeth were brushed. Frost had a way of charming people into doing what she wanted. She'd make a wonderful mother for his son. Tannen began to hyperventilate at the thought, and he stepped back into the hallway so he wouldn't interrupt. He put his hands on his knees and bent over to take deep breaths and stop the world from spinning. Frost was wonderful, but she was not the woman for him. He already had a lady picked out. Miss Kringle had known him almost his whole life, and she was his perfect match. And, he'd hardly thought about her since Frost came to town. Heck, he'd almost kissed Frost in the kitchen. He rubbed his eyes. Forget the world spinning, his world was tipping on its axis. Will you read it again tomorrow night? Brody asked in his inside-slash-outside voice. Tannen braced a hand on the wall and stood, wondering if Frost would brush him off. Some women loved their own kids but only put up with others. Or maybe that was just him they didn't know what to do with. He'd been such a strange-looking child that it threw people off. I'll do even better. I'll leave the book here and you can read it to your dad. I'll bet he hasn't heard the story in quite some time, he might even find someone to identify with. They giggled together as if sharing a secret. Tannen snorted as he entered the room. If you're referring to the Grinch, I assure you my heart is the proper size. And you're not green, added Brody. Thank you for noticing. Frost smiled at him. She kissed Brody's hair. Good night, Marshmallow. Night. Brody scooted down into his blankets. Tannen got to the bed just as Frost was standing up. They bumped into one another, her body warm. They both blushed and laughed. He scooted to one side to go around and she went to the same side. In unison they went back the other way and laughed again. Frost put her hands on his arms, the contact sending pleasant shocks through his body. She nudged him to one side and went the other way, turning them both in a circle. All his life, Tannen had stayed on the edge of the dance floor, but he suddenly had an overwhelming desire to waltz with this woman in his arms. Turning quickly away, he leaned down to kiss Brody goodnight. The pillowcase smelled like sugar and spice. See you in the morning. Do you have to work tomorrow? Nope. I have the whole weekend off. Okay, then. Brody's body wiggled deeper into the mattress. Tannen turned off the lamp and made his way into the hall, where he found Frost leaning against the opposite wall. She smiled. He reminds me of you. 
Her words and the accompanying confident smile were a healing balm after his conversation with his parents. How so? He's strong-willed, determined, and kind, with a heart that is predisposed to believe in Christmas ma, she gulped. In Christmas. Tannen sighed. I was pretty bitter at his age. Nonsense. She pulled her hair over her shoulder, and he remembered how it felt sliding through his fingers. His hands twitched. It's true. I'd had my leg amputated and I was mad at the world. Not the whole world. She looked at him as though she knew the inner workings of his mind and heart. And she was right. He was mad at his parents for letting the doctors take off his leg. He was mad at the doctors, the nurses, and anyone else who tried to tell him it would be okay. But there was one person he'd reached out to. Not everyone, there was Santa Claus. Frost's smile lit up her whole face. Tell me. He joined her, using the wall against his back for support. Well, I wrote him a letter and asked for my leg back. Her smile dimmed. That must have been hard. It was. Obviously, he couldn't do that. But it helped. Writing letters helps. He frowned. How long had it been since Miss Kringle had written? A week? Maybe more. He glanced at Frost out of the corner of his eye. Would she think he was nuts if he told her he still wrote to the North Pole? I read somewhere that writing out your problems is therapeutic. I believe that. Frost pushed off from the wall. I guess I'd better get home. I'd like to call my family and wish them a happy Thanksgiving. About that, Tannen cupped the back of his neck. We're snowed in. What? Frost raced to the window and yanked the curtains back. Soft moonlight outlined her delicate body, making Tannen wonder if kisses by moonlight really were as romantic as they say. Her arms fell to her sides. It's not that deep. We have a guest bedroom, if you'd like to stay the night. I mean, it's not like you have much choice, but I thought I'd ask. He was stumbling through this. Wait, did you just say it's not that deep? He walked over and looked down at the winter wonderland. The bushes that grew as high as his chest looked like shrubs no taller than his shin. It's not that bad. He hooked a thumb towards the window. My car would disappear. I can just walk back. She pressed her lips together. The temperature is below 30. I have a coat. You'd freeze before you found the road. She folded her arms and cocked her head. Says you. Tannen liked her spunk. He liked it far too much. Staying overnight isn't all that bad, is it? Besides not wanting to search for her frozen body in the morning, he could use a buffer between him and his parents. As long as Frost was here, they'd be on their best behavior, at least in front of her. Having a guest didn't stop them from cornering him and dropping a bomb earlier. Nothing encouraged his dad to behave well like an audience, holding up the family name and all that. And he wasn't quite ready to say goodbye. Frost was strange, but wasn't everyone? There were no real normal people out there. Look at his family. He had a father who was obsessed with appearances, a mother who didn't know how to stand up to him, and then there was him. He was the least normal to look at, although, despite his childhood, he may be the most normal one among them. Wait, didn't everyone think they were the normal ones out of the group? Before his head could spin itself in theory and debate, he brought himself back to the matter at hand. I would feel horrible sending you out in the cold. Are you saying, her eyes sparkled. Baby, it's cold outside? His burdens instantly lightened with her flirty little attitude. Well, this evening has been so very nice. Are you going to hold my hands? She lifted hers and winked. 
He took hold, then relaxed and threaded their fingers together, bringing their hands to his chest as easy as pie. His breathing became shallow and he had a hard time looking away. Outside, the snow continued to fall, bright in the full moon's light. But in here, they were warm and toasty. The only thing missing was a fireplace and a glowing yule log and maybe a Christmas tree. Frost. He searched her gaze. Is there a chance, I mean, if I wasn't a Grinch and you hadn't been my assistant? And you hadn't cancelled Christmas? He chuckled. That too. Do you think maybe you and I? She hesitated, her hold tightening briefly before she pulled her hands from his. Thank you, for the offer to stay. I'd like to see my room now. He swallowed his wounded pride and nodded. She was out of his league. He should have known. But it was difficult to remember when she looked at him the way she did. It's just this way. Tannen showed her down the hallway to the guest room. Chapter 15 Frost collapsed against the door. Tannen was starting to like her, as in like her like her. She could feel his interest in her growing and his heart softening. That was bad. So, so bad. He was supposed to fall in love with Christmas again, not fall in love with her. She threw her purse on the bed and then chased it down to dig out her phone. She dialed Stella and patched in Robin. How's the single Kringles? she asked, knowing full well it would get a rise out of Robin. She wasn't disappointed. Not you too. Robin groaned. Frost smiled despite the fact that she felt like crying. Sisters were so good at cheering each other up. At least her sisters were. How was dinner? Glitterless, said Stella. We miss your sparkly self. I missed you guys. Did you get turkey? And please don't tell me you microwaved it. Robin's shudder could be felt all the way from the North Pole. I, uh, ate with Tannen's family. Oh, really? Stella's interest went up three notes, right along with her voice. Do tell. It's not that big of a deal. He felt sorry for me because I was alone, that's all. What are you guys doing tonight? She wished she was home. They usually spent Thanksgiving night in the living room watching hunky men fight off aliens and men wearing bedazzled gauntlets. I'm perusing mail-order groom websites, said Stella. And I'm avoiding Stella, added Robin. Frost chuckled. That sounded about right. She had to blink back the tears that threatened to spill over at her admission that she missed them. Of course she missed them, but when she said it out loud, the emotion was ten times stronger. That's not a real thing, is it? If you know where to look, and you know I got mad skills. Did you find someone? Frost was hopeful. An arranged marriage wasn't such a bad thing. But knowing Stella, she'd pick some guy with a nose ring and a rap sheet. Mom's rules still apply. No guys named after reptiles. Don't worry. I'm keeping it chill. Robin? Frost pleaded with her sister. Robin huffed. I'm headed to her office now. Is Tannen the guy you've been writing behind our backs for, like, ten years? Sixteen, Frost corrected, ready to come clean. And yes. I thought you liked this guy, asked Stella. She was breathing hard, telling Frost she'd grabbed her laptop and was trying to avoid Robin. He owns a paper mill, Frost. It's like your perfect match. You love paper, said Robin. Frost swiped away an errant tear. I did. And I do. Did like him, asked Robin. She was talking fast probably running through the office to catch Stella. Ginger snaps. She missed her sisters. Frost hesitated. Her feelings for Tannen were befuddled at best. He was so complicated, 
always changing depending on the situation. She couldn't love him one minute and then want to punch out his Christmas lights the next. Did like him. Stella whispered, probably hiding. Well, stop dilly-dallying and look around town for someone new. I dose are more important right now than I dids. It's not that easy. Sure it is. Bat those unfair long eyelashes of yours and the men will come crawling. You'll be kissing someone new under the mistletoe in no time. Fastest way to get over an ax. For some reason, Stella's comment ticked her off and her neck grew warm. As if sixteen years of letters, shared secrets, and feelings could be brushed away so easily. She's behind the filing cabinet, Frost told Robin. Hey! Aha! There was a scuffle and then Robin said, No way in a gingerbread house is this your future husband. Stella! What is wrong with you? Stella burst out a sob. I'm in love. With this guy? Frost pictured Robin pointing at a picture on the laptop. With someone I can't have. Give me that. She must have yanked her laptop back. Frost bit her lip. Why can't you have him? Frost was insanely curious. She had loved Tannen at one time, or thought she did, when she thought she knew him. Maybe a part of her still did. And maybe another part of her was falling for the man she'd spent time with today. If only she could trust him not to turn into an Ebenezer. Because he doesn't want me. Stella sniffed. Then he's a snowman, all body and no brains, Frost told her. Stella laughed and cried. Frost could hear it coming through both their phones, so she knew Robin had wrapped Stella in a hug. No, he's wonderful. He's just out of my reach. Well, that's just great, Robin threw out. I've got no one and nothing. Stella's in love with a man she can't have. And Frost has fallen out of love with the man she's snuck around with forever. And the palace is tipping more and more every day. How bad is it? Mom's snow globe collection fell off the shelves, said Robin. Stella was still sniffing. Holy holly, exclaimed Frost. Yeah, all of our sweets are baking lopsided because the oven's tipped. We've had to come up with some metal shims to put under the pans, but then one side of the pan cooks faster than the other. It's a pain. I'm sorry. I've ruined everything. No one blames you, said Stella. This one is on all of us. Frost glanced out the window. Well, tomorrow I'm going to go Christmas crazy on Tannen. The sooner I get him to believe, the sooner I can get home and help. Good plan, said Stella. Bring out the glitter and glitz. He's not going to know what hit him. And she'd start in this very room. Mary would be an asset. Tannen always said his mother loved Christmas. It was time to spread the love like glitter. She grinned. She was so good with glitter. Chapter 16 Frost caught a couple of hours of sleep and was up and dressed in a pair of red leggings with white reindeer silhouettes and an oversized white sweater that perched precariously on her shoulder, threatening to fall off at any moment. She usually tried to avoid white, what with her snow-colored hair and all, but she felt so festive she went with it. The black Santa boots were the perfect accessory. If Tannen didn't look at her and think Christmas spirit, then she'd failed holiday fashion 101. Frost never failed in fashion. Her Kringle purse provided makeup, a flat iron, and hair serum, so she didn't have to look ruffled at all. Tiptoeing down the stairs, she set about making cinnamon rolls and sugar cookies. The rolls were for breakfast, and the sugar cookies were for decorating after having some fun in the snow. Just as she was pulling the buns out of the oven, Mary breezed through the door. She came up short. Oh! Frost tucked her hair behind her ear. Morning. I so appreciated your hospitality that I wanted to make breakfast. 
I hope this is okay. She waved a hand to the hot chocolate station she'd set up along the bar with several flavors of hot chocolate, tree-shaped marshmallows, and a jar of candy canes. Where did all this come from? I found it in the pantry. Not a lie. She'd stood in the pantry as she wished for items from her Kringle purse. Thankfully, the purse hadn't joined the reindeer and the elves in disowning her and worked perfectly. I don't remember buying any of this. Mary inspected a raspberry hot chocolate package. Maybe you picked it up on sale? Frost spun from the stove, a pan of boiling water in her hands. She proceeded to pour the perfect amount of water into the mugs. Maybe. Mary sifted through the different flavors and settled on mocha. H.M. I haven't had a specialty hot chocolate in ages. Oh. Frost refilled the pan in case they needed more water and set it to heat. Why is that? They used to serve them at the coffee shop on Main, but the towns cut back on their celebrations. They aren't even doing a tree in the park this year. That's sad. Frost put a park tree on her list of things to do for the town. She'd set one up in the middle of the night if needed, no town should be without decorations. When do they put up the other decorations? Mary mixed her drink and nodded a thank you when Frost set a plate with a warm roll in front of her. They'll string some lights up this week. I'm sure the local businesses have their own decorations though. Some. Mary's lips tipped up. Maybe that's why I like to decorate so much. My family always had a merry holiday. I want that for Tannen and Brody. And for you, you deserve a Merry Christmas too. Frost selected a cinnamon chocolate mix and made herself a cup of cocoa. May I help you with the decorations? Mary waved her off. Oh, you don't want to do that. But I do. Frost brought her shoulders up, trying to hold in her excitement. I love decorating, and Christmas is the best time of year to make things sparkly and bright. Besides, you've been so kind to open your home to me and let me be a part of your family for a little while. I'd love to do something for you. Mary eyed her. I suppose an extra set of hands would be helpful. She took her mug with her as she led the way up the stairs. Frost wore her purse with the strap across her chest. It was black to match the boots, but not quite as shiny. At the opposite end of the hall from her room, Mary pulled on a cord, revealing a set of stairs that accordion unfolded. Frost clapped her hands. It's like magic. Mary waved a hand in front of her face. It would be if that were fairy dust and not plain old dust. She sneezed once and then climbed up first, flipping on a light as she did so. Frost's cringleness was getting the better of her, and she had to fight the urge to push Mary out of the way to get to those decorations. The boxes were labeled as to which room the decorations went to. She snatched up two with the label family room and made for the stairs. I'll get these and be back up for the rest. She was down the stairs, flying like a reindeer who'd been cooped up for the summer. She met Mary on the stairs on her way back up. Mary laughed. You don't have to rush it. Unpacking is part of the fun. Okay. Frost couldn't help herself, working quickly was in her blood. She made two more quick trips to Mary's one and they had all the front room boxes. The cream walls with white trim screened for some color, red and green, to be exact. The creamy leather couches and black side tables were the perfect backdrop for a Christmas masterpiece. And that front window screened for an eight-foot tree. Frost cocked her head. Eight feet at least. Ten would be better. She hadn't seen an artificial tree box. That meant they'd have to go pick one out. Her heart clapped with excitement. Mary opened the first box. This is the garland for the fireplace mantle. Do you want to get it up? Of course. Frost took the box over to the fireplace. The garland was one of those pre-strung with white lights. 
Her heart lurched. If all the decorations were white and cream, this was going to be a dull Christmas room indeed. She plugged in the lights to make sure they worked. Then she laid out and fluffed the garland. When Mary wasn't looking, Frost retrieved red lights from her bag and wove them expertly through the greenery. She then added gold bows and red and gold baubles. Golden candlesticks topped with cream candles adorned the mantle. She added a small Santa figurine, his coat red and white and with gold trim. Next to that, she placed a sleigh full of kisses in gold foil. On the other side of the mantle, she added three tall, skinny trees in complementary heights to the candlesticks on the other end. They had red and gold ribbons spiraling up to gold stars on the top. She stepped back and nodded once. What do you think? she asked Mary. Mary straightened. Where did that come from? What? Frost asked innocently. The candlesticks? I don't remember those. She tapped her chin with her finger. They must have been last year's edition. She laughed and cupped her hand around one side of her mouth. Don't tell Donald, but I buy a lot of this online and just put it up. He has no idea how much money I spend on decorations, and half the time I forget where I ordered them from. She put her hands on her hips. I must have thought this room needed an update and purchased the red ribbons at the end of the season last year. They look brand new. You're a true Christmas elf. Frost giggled. Mary had just given her a free card to take the decorations up a notch and not get caught. She attacked the side tables next, adding snow globes in all sizes and sprigs of holly. In the time it took Mary to do the coffee table, Frost had the rest of the room ready. She pulled a deep red tree skirt from her purse and laid it on the floor in front of the window now framed in white lights. She could see how the white and cream had been elegant, but the red added something special and she was glad she trusted her instincts. Tannen ambled in, a plate in one hand and a mug in the other. Wow. Mom, this looks great. Don't tell me, tell Frost. She's a bundle of energy. He moaned. Tell me about it. She accomplishes more in a day than anyone else does in a week. He lifted his mug to her in salute. Frost felt her face heat. Funny, she'd never noticed changes in temperature before, but when Tannen complimented her, she felt warm and fuzzy all over. He looked good this morning, all freshly shaven and smelling of soap. His broad shoulders were accented by the bird's eye pullover sweater. The collar coming up around his neck as it did made him look classy and a little dangerous. The forest green color made his eyes pop, and she had a hard time looking away even as her tongue glued itself to the top of her mouth. Well. Mary brushed off her hands. Since we have such a good start, why don't you two take Brody and Donald and go get us a tree? Frost clasped her hands together. She didn't want to appear too eager, but this was exactly the opportunity she was looking for to bring Christmas cheer into Tannen's life. That would be fun. Tannen chewed his lip. I thought just Brody and I could go. Frost's hands fell limp at her side. Yeah. That's, that's, fine. Nonsense. Mary stacked several now empty boxes. You'll need the extra set of hands to get the tree on the sled. I can cut down a tree on my own, Mom. But loading it, she cut off when she saw the set to Tannen's jaw. Pressing her lips together so tightly a white line formed around them, Mary turned her back to the group and hung the stockings from tiny hooks in the mantle. Frost saw Tannen's fierceness too. It said, Don't push me, louder than bells on Christmas Day. Brody barreled into the room, wearing a hot chocolate mustache and a smear of frosting across the front of his shirt. Frost grinned, pleased that he'd enjoyed breakfast. He slammed into her stomach and smeared his mustache across her white sweater. Frost hugged him back, not caring about the stain. A child's hug was so much more important than laundry. Good morning, Marshmallow. How'd you sleep? 
Good. He kept his arms wrapped around her, and she did the same. She grinned down at him. Good. The trust and joy that twinkled in his eyes lit something inside of her, a need to protect and nurture. She wondered if this was how Ginger felt about every child in the world, or if this was specific between her and Brody. She read millions of letters from children each year, but she hadn't hugged any of them. She wrapped him up and squeezed tight. Hugs were powerful. Brody. Tannen stepped forward and placed a hand on his shoulder. You'll ruin her sweater. It's okay, Frost insisted before they got a look at the smear. I don't mind. She kissed the top of Brody's head. You smell like breakfast, he blurted. Frost giggled and relaxed her hold on him. I supposed I do. Tannen pulled Brody closer to him. Let's get our snow clothes on and we'll go look for a tree. Brody galloped out of the room with a yay. Frost stared after him wistfully. Are you taking the car? If they were able to drive to a tree lot, then they'd be able to take her home. She wasn't ready to go yet, hadn't done half the Christmasing up Tannen's life that she had planned. She needed more time. Although time wasn't exactly on her side here. Tannen shook his head. We're still snowed under. It'll be late this afternoon before they get the roads cleared. We'll take the snowmobiles. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. I don't suppose you know how to drive one? She bit back her smile. Doesn't every girl? Tannen's lips twitched like he was fighting a smile of his own. I thought not. Then you thought wrong. I have been duly corrected. And since I made such a blunder, I'd like to make it up to you. I'm not sure you can. She lifted her chin, feigning insult. What if I let you pick out the tree? She turned quickly and stuck out her hand. Deal. This time, he didn't fight the smile but let it warm his face and his eyes. Deal. He took her hand, and Frost's world tipped, making it difficult to retain her footing. I'll meet you in the mudroom. Beal yeah, she blurted like a fool. Why did he have to have such an effect on her? Why couldn't she shake his hand or look into his eyes or almost kiss him without crumbling like a Christmas cookie? Frost watched him leave, enjoying the way his body moved. She pressed her hands to her warm cheeks, hoping to cool them down only to find that her hands were just as hot. Turning, she found Mary watching her curiously. Frost brushed self-consciously at the hot chocolate smear on her stomach. After a moment, Mary's lips outlined in white again. Thank you for your help. Though they were kind words, they were delivered with a Jack Frost nip. You're welcome. You'd better go. They won't wait all day. Frost knew when she was being dismissed. She just wasn't sure why. There was a sense of disappointment inside Mary, one that ran an ocean deep and she was lashing out at Frost because of it. There was also a fear, fear of losing her family, that drove her to plant her feet and stab at others. Frost wasn't a threat to her. Portraying that was hard without coming right out and saying, I know you're afraid I'll take your son and grandson. She had no intention of breaking up the Cebu clan. In her experience, marriage increased family, not diminished it. Mary lifted the stack of empty boxes. Have fun on your outing today, picking my tree. If you'd rather, Frost began to offer her spot. I would not. Mary brushed past her, headed for the attic. Frost shifted her weight, unsure what she was supposed to do now. I'd be happy to help you bring down the rest of the boxes, she called up the stairs. I can manage. Frost shuddered. Where she'd been warm with Tannen's touch, his mom's change from happy decorator to angry elf sent a shiver down her spine. Confused, she found the mudroom and put on the same pink jumpsuit she'd worn yesterday. Gag! 
She hated wearing the same thing two days in a row but there was no way to explain the arrival of new snow gear. Feeling grumpy and muddled, she added her gloves and hat to the outfit. Tannen and Brody appeared a moment later, and in a flurry of coats and scarves they were on their way out to the garage, where two shiny snowmobiles, a sled, and a day of adventure awaited. Chapter 17 Where are we headed? Tannen couldn't get over how downright hot Frost looked sitting on the snowmobile in her pink snowsuit, with her white hair hanging over one shoulder and her big eyes twinkling with a sense of adventure. She'd started the machine up and driven it out of the garage and down the driveway without any help from him. He'd often wondered what type of woman he liked best, and then and there he decided tough, thoughtful, smart, independent women were the best kind. The engines made it hard to communicate, so he pointed to the right and they went that direction. Brody sat in the sled that trailed behind him. As if she could read his mind, Frost slowed down so she was far enough back to keep an eye on the kid. Brody waved at her, his goggles speckled with snow, and he smiled wider than the trail they traveled. It wasn't long before they were in the pine trees and spruces. He braked and then killed the engine, the sound echoing away like a flock of birds through the trees. Frost pulled alongside him and turned off her machine as well. Small droplets of water glistened on her hair like thousands of tiny diamonds. It took a second for him to realize it was melted snow. You look like a snow princess, he said before he ran the words through his filter. Frost giggled. I feel like one today. She threw a leg over the snowmobile and hopped down. Choosing the tree is an honor. Although I think your mom was a little upset that I came along. Tannen waved his arm as if he could brush away his parents. Some days he wished he could. For a while there, things were good between them all. But this latest attack, the attempt to get Brody all to themselves, was too much. He'd promised them Christmas, not for their sake, but for Brody's. After that, who knew where they'd end up? She'll get over it. Frost's brows lowered, but she didn't contradict him. Brody scrambled off the sled. Can I chop the tree down? Tannen laughed. I think I'd better hang on to the chainsaw for today. Ah. Brody kicked up a mound of snow. Grandpa said I could do it this year. Tannen bit back his irritation. He didn't want Brody to think he had to take sides. Grandpa's not here. Frost held out her hand. Come on, I need your expert opinion. Spruce or pine? Brody took her hand, and they headed off into the woods. Pine, Brody answered. They smell more like Christmas. You think? Frost asked. Tannen busied himself getting the chainsaw out of the sled and checking the oil and gas levels. Once he was sure it was ready to go, he secured it back in the case and followed their tracks. After he'd hiked for five minutes, he began to sweat. His prosthetic was secured inside a winter boot, but it still slipped around every few steps. And the snow was deep enough that he struggled to pull his foot out of it. His underlayers gathered moisture. He wouldn't be able to stay out long if he worked this hard. It just wasn't safe. Cursing himself, he continued on. Another hundred yards and he was hit with a snowball from the right. Brody threw his arms in the air. She got ya, Dad. Frost was standing behind a snow fort, grinning. She tossed a snowball in the air and caught it again. What's the matter, Tannen? You afraid to take on a girl? She threw the ball at him. This time, he was ready and dodged it easily. Where only a few moments before he'd been worried about his body temperature and survival, he was suddenly more aware that Frost was flirting with him. He slowly set the chainsaw behind a tree. I'm not afraid of nothing, Dot. Brody squealed and dove behind a smaller fort that was between him and Frost. Tannen made a snowball and lobbed it over the edge of Brody's fort. Brody popped up like a groundhog. Missed me. 
Frost threw one at him and it whizzed by his ear. He yelped and disappeared again. While Tannen was laughing, he was pelted in the chest. Oh, is that how it's going to be? That's how it is, Frost countered, her arm cocked to throw another snowball. They spent the next fifteen minutes trying to cover one another with snow. Though they each took hits, no one did anything more than laugh and try to retaliate. If there was a score, Tannen had lost track long ago. He laughed so hard his stomach muscles hurt. Suddenly, Brody rounded the tree Tannen had marked as his fort. It was as big around as he was and provided the right amount of protection for him to stand and throw. Brody had to stand behind Tannen to avoid Frost's amazingly accurate aim. Dad, we need to rush her fort. Brody's cheeks were red and his eyes bright. Why is that? Because we can't beat her like this, she's a snowball ninja. Tannen chuckled. A snowball hit the front of the tree and exploded, showering the two of them. I'm game if you are. I'll go right. You go right in front. That means I'll get hit the most. It's a sacrifice you have to make, Dad. Tannen nodded along, sagely. I see your point. Brody counted down, and they burst from their hiding spots. Frost saw them coming and threw two snowballs at once. Brody ducked, Tannen took his and kept running. He threw himself over the top of the fort and felt his prosthetic bump against the top of the hard-packed snow. The release valve hissed. He twisted, trying to keep his prosthetic from coming all the way off, and the foot hooked on the ledge as he fell, landing on his left shoulder and face in a pile of fresh powder. Tannen! Frost yelled. Tannen's face boiled with humiliation. Brody jumped behind Frost, pelting her with several snowballs before he noticed Tannen on the ground. At that point, his mouth fell open and his arms dropped to his side. Dad? Tannen struggled to right himself and yanked when he shouldn't have, dislodging his leg. With a groan, he flopped back onto his elbows. Frost knelt on one side of him and Brody on the other. Dad! Brody looked him up and down. Tannen had spent most of Brody's life keeping his son from seeing his amputated leg. But there was no way to fix it without bearing all. He closed his eyes. Go away, he whispered. What? Frost leaned forward, holding her hair away from her ear and keeping it from tickling his face. It was a shame, because if anything good was going to come out of this moment, it would be burying his face in her hair. But he couldn't indulge in a moment like that when he was sprawled out like this. Go away. Leave me alone for a few minutes and I can get this fixed. Hopefully. Take Brody with you. Frost rocked back on her heels. I will not. Frost. He threw out her name. Grabbing her collar, he pulled her down so he could whisper. I don't want to frighten Brody. Oh, she whispered back. That's dumb. What? Sitting up again, and leaving him feeling all that much colder as he lay in the snow, she asked Brody, are you afraid of your dad's leg? He looked at her like she was crazy. No. You know he has a prosthetic, right? This time he looked at her like she was stupid. Yeah. But he's never seen it, protested Tannen. Brody shrugged. I've watched tons of videos, though. Tannen twisted so he wasn't looking at Brody upside down. You have? Yeah. I did a class report on it last year, too. You did? He nodded. You never said anything and I wondered. Tannen grabbed Brody behind the neck and crushed him to his chest, rubbing his hat right off his head. You little stink. If you wanted to know, you should have asked. Brody batted Tannen's hands away but stayed on his chest to talk to him. We don't talk about it. Nobody does. 
Tannen met Frost's disapproving look, and he knew he wasn't getting out of bearing himself to the both of them. Brody he might be able to handle. But Frost. You go. He jerked his chin away. Don't be ridiculous. If I go, you'll freeze. She flipped her hair away from her face. He moaned. Frost, I really need some privacy. She moaned too, mocking his concern. Tannen, I've seen legs before. Fine. If that was the way she wanted it, then fine. His hands began to shake inside his gloves and his thigh muscles trembled with worry, making him look like he was freezing to death when what was really after him was fear. He remembered something one of the guys at the fitting center had told him when he got his first leg. He'd said that being an amputee gave you a tool to weed out the people in your life who didn't like you because they would use the prosthetic as an excuse to treat you differently. He wasn't sure if he could handle Frost looking at him differently, wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer to that question. Frost touched his shoulder, and the chill fell out of the air. His limbs stopped shaking immediately. Brody clambered off of him and kneeled by his side, his eyes wide. Here. Frost moved behind him, pushing him up higher. I'll kneel behind you and you can use me as a brace. More like squish you. She scoffed. I'm stronger than I look. He didn't doubt her. But at least from this angle, she would only see what he saw. That was a small mercy. He shimmied out of his snow pants, surprised at how warm he felt. Only a few minutes before, his face had been red with cold. Frost's hands rested lightly on his back as he leaned forward. She wasn't being nosy or staring. She just let him do what he needed to do. Brody, on the other hand, was practically on top of him. He managed to get his thigh out of his underlayer and then wrangle the prosthetic free. Sitting in the snow, half undressed in front of his son and a beautiful woman, should have mortified him. His parents had always been strict about keeping his prosthetic covered. He'd wear pants in the summer instead of shorts, even when he was home, because he hated to see his mom tear up at the sight of him. Fittings and doctor visits were the worst. By the time he was seventeen, he drove himself, saving them all from the drama. What's that? Brody pointed to the rubber sock that hugged Tannen's leg. It's what keeps the leg in place. He traced the plastic seal that ran all the way around the sock. This creates a seal so the leg stays in place. Brody's eyes were huge. How come it came off? I must have hit this button. Tannen lifted the leg and pointed to the pressure release valve. I'm not used to jumping over snow forts. Frost squeezed his shoulder from behind. You'll have to remember to jump higher next time. Her voice was light, like reattaching a leg in the middle of a snowball fight was no big deal. Tannen twisted to look at her and found that their faces were kissable close. She still smelled of cinnamon and spice. He took a deep breath in, savoring the experience of being this close. Although he'd much rather have her in his arms than be in hers, but he wouldn't be too picky at this point, he was just thankful she wasn't running away in horror. He turned back to the task at hand. The next part would be the hardest. He'd have to remove and reposition the sock, revealing his stump and all the scars. In for a penny, he rolled the end of the sock down, turning it inside out as it came off. Brody's small fingers traced the largest scar on the outside of his thigh. There were two more. Tannen let him explore, even though it made him feel like a specimen under a microscope. He wouldn't be so curious if Tannen had let him see his leg before today. Does it hurt? Brody asked. Not anymore. Tannen repositioned his sock on the end of the stump and rolled it back up his leg. This took time. I've got to get a good fit. If I don't, and any air bubbles stay inside, then I get blisters. Like when my shoes are too big. Tannen lifted one side of his mouth in a half-smile. Just like that. 
He positioned the ceiling ring and then reached for his leg. Once his stump was inside, he needed to stand to check that it was on straight. He could do this on his own, but it would be awkward and clumsy. A war began inside his head, one that started years ago when he'd banished his mother from his room when he was getting ready. Frost leaned forward, her chin resting on his shoulder. Do you need to stand? Her nearness, the warmth coming off her body, had soothed him throughout the whole process. Had she not been here, he probably would have snapped at Brody or made him leave. But she was soothing and gentle with his ego. And having her whisper in his ear made him feel like a man, made him want to do manly things like cut down Christmas trees and carry her off to build a snow castle for two. He nodded in reply, because his tongue had suddenly become too big for his mouth. She got to her feet and offered him a hand. Brody scurried under his arm on the other side, ready to lift. Between the three of them, he was up and standing in no time. Thanks. He held her hand for longer than he should have, long enough to watch color creep across her cheeks and her eyes drop demurely. Frost's hand moved to his side to steady him as he checked the fit of his leg and then pressed down as if he were stomping to get the air out. Once it stopped hissing, he tossed his hands in the air. Done. Brody smiled. Cool. Tannen scrubbed at his hat again, making him laugh. Frost sidled up to him and snaked her arm around his middle. I think you can put your pants back on now, cowboy. He glanced down at his boxers hanging out one side of his pants and laughed. Details, details. She laughed too, and he was happy to note that she was laughing with him, not at him. Close your eyes, he told her. In order to get his pants on, he'd have to pull the other leg down and step in. Usually he put them on his prosthetic first, so this was a little backwards. She did, but smiled secretly. Once he was fully dressed, Brody scampered off. I'm going to make more snowballs. Tannen draped his arm across her shoulders and pulled her to him. Leaning over so he could whisper in her ear, he said, thank you. She pulled back, fiddling with his zipper and staring at his neck. You're welcome. He hooked his finger under her chin and lifted her face until she met his gaze. Can you not look me in the eye after that? She laid her hands flat against his chest. I'm a little overwhelmed. Oh. He moved to step away, and she grabbed his coat in her fists to keep him close. Not because of your leg. Okay? She moistened her lips. That was intimate. Not because you were half-dressed, but your trust in me. It was all so real and raw. She glanced away again. I feel like glitter is racing through my veins and shooting out of my fingertips. Relief flooded Tannen's body. She wasn't repulsed by him. He gathered her close, understanding what she meant with the glitter. His heart was beating so fast it could outfly a firework. He pressed his lips to her cheek, testing to see if she would pull away from him. When she didn't, he moved to her lips. She whimpered and melted into him, her hands sliding up his chest and around his neck. She threaded her fingers together and pulled him closer and closer still. Fireworks went off behind Tannen's eyelids and inside his chest. Boom! 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 They sounded loud enough to cause an avalanche. He leaned into frost, feeling like the world tipped beneath his feet. They pulled apart, breathing heavily and making big puffs of air float around them. I trust you. He trailed kisses up her jaw. Frost moaned and ripped herself away from him. She rubbed her forehead. You shouldn't. What? Why not? Tannen rubbed his hands together, the cold bit at them with renewed force. Frost brightened, though the effort was forced. Small, strained lines dug at the edges of her eyes. Let's find that tree. I'm sure your parents are wondering what's taking so long, and there's so much to do to get ready for Christmas. 
What had he done? Frost. She handed him his gloves and he eagerly put them on. Brody, she called loudly. Have you found a tree yet? I want to have another snowball fight. Frost trotted off into the trees, following the sound of his voice. She stopped just before disappearing from Tannen's view. Come on, somebody's got to cut this thing down. Tannen shook his head, still feeling like the world was leaning too far to one direction. They'd kissed. He could still taste her on his lips. She tasted like a spicy gumdrop. Yet she acted like nothing had happened. Well, maybe not nothing, but nothing mind-bending like that kiss. Maybe it hadn't been as amazing for her as it had been for him. The thought made him feel like he'd eaten one too many chocolate Santas. Chapter 18 Frost put as much distance between herself and Tannen as she could without making it look like she was running away from him. The kiss, as glitter-bombing wonderful as it was, should never have happened. She was here to create Christmas spirit, not make out with the hottest guy on the planet. What right did he have being so gorgeous, anyway? In all the years she'd pictured him, he didn't look this good. She'd honestly pictured a scrawny guy, though she had no idea why. Maybe because he'd been so sick and people who were sick didn't eat much. Her brain was babbling. The plain fact of the matter was, Tannen was a temptation, a delicious temptation who could kiss like a superhero. Her family, Christmas, was counting on her to brighten Elderberry this holiday and return home to answer letters, and she'd gone and messed everything up by kissing the town Scrooge. Although, he didn't act like a Scrooge when he was out here tromping through the junipers, carrying a chainsaw. Not that she needed the picture of him being all mountain man haughty. She had to work to keep her eyes looking forward instead of stealing glances back at him. He stayed far enough behind her that she had some room to think. Yet another reason why he was so wonderful. Arg! She might consider kissing him a bonus, there was still the tipping North Pole to consider, a marriage that had to happen. Someone had to get married. If it wasn't her who was married this year, then Stella would order a husband online and have him shipped north on Christmas Eve. She could end up with a serial killer for a brother-in-law. That would make for fun family dinners. She couldn't think that far in advance. Christmas magic wouldn't accept Tannen anyway, not with his lack of faith in Christmas. Before she could consider a relationship with the man, some things needed to happen and one of them was getting a stellar tree in his house. This one. Brody stood in front of a twelve-foot pine that was half as wide as it was tall. Frost put her hands behind her back and walked around it several times, considering the uneven branch on the far side and the small hole in front of Brody. It wasn't perfect. And she was going to have to present it to Tannen's mother, a woman who was as precise in her Christmas decorating as Frost, but without all the fun. Frost loved to make holidays, well, every day, really, more special by organizing and decorating and trimming because it made her family smile. She wasn't sure why Mary decorated. She claimed it was to make up for the town's less than enthusiastic efforts, but there was something else there, like she put herself and her efforts above others. That type of reasoning didn't sit well with Frost. Frost crouched so she could consider the tree from Brody's angle. From here, the evergreen looked like it could touch the sky. The hole was there. But it didn't matter to Brody, any more than his father's missing leg. Tannen was still his dad, one leg or two, and this tree was a beautiful specimen, imperfections and all. It's perfect. Brody beamed at her. Tannen set down the chainsaw case and flipped the latches up. You two go get the snowmobile with the sled, I'll get her cut down. Frost heard the slight edge to his voice. He wanted Brody out of the area, which was probably a good idea with a chainsaw going. She saluted. Aye aye, Captain. Brody giggled and copied her. Tannen winked, sending happy shivers down Frost's back. She needed to get away from him for a while, get her head on straight. 
Otherwise, she might do something foolish, like kiss him until Santa Claus came to town. Chapter 19 Tannen placed a clear glass globe near the top of the tree. He glanced past the dark green needles to watch Frost show Brody how to use a twist tie to secure a bow. She glanced up at him and then lowered her lashes quickly. He let out a sigh and paid attention to his task. Elvis crooned Santa bring my baby back to me over the speakers recessed into the ceiling and strategic places around the room. Mom had shoved the boxes of decorations at the three of them and told them to have fun while she prepared lunch. She was still upset at him for leaving Dad out of the tree hunt. He cringed. Had his father been there when his leg came off, the afternoon would have been so very different. Dad would have insisted they come right home. Or worse, he would have taken over the chainsaw, noting Tannen's unsteadiness and listing the many accidents that could happen if he toppled over. Actually, if Dad had been there, they wouldn't have had a snowball fight in the first place. They would have picked a tree just off the path and hurried home where it was safe. Tannen shoved his feeling of general disgruntledness away. There was no sense being upset at what didn't happen. He'd much rather focus on the time he had to spend with Frost and Brody. On the outside, the three of them looked like a young family, elbow deep in holiday preparations. The image was sweet and tugged at his heart. Frost was so good with Brody. She let him talk about everything from the upcoming program at school to the old jelly sandwich Grandma found under his bed last summer. They giggled together, she offered suggestions for songs for the program, and through it all she treated Brody like he was an equal, which made him feel ten feet tall. Tannen hadn't noticed how often his parents talked down to Brody, treating him like a child. Which he was, except he blossomed in a whole new way with Frost around. Tannen tucked the lesson into his heart. As for him and Frost? Well, they tiptoed around one another and the kiss they'd shared. Tannen refused to corner her and ask what it meant. Things happen when two people get close, and he'd gotten much closer to Frost than he'd intended today. That was all. Like she said, they'd shared a moment. He'd bared himself for her scrutiny, and she'd answered with tenderness and a soft caress. That didn't mean the two of them were meant for one another, or that they were suddenly an item. They'd had a moment. He could put it behind him, after something strong to drink and a hard hit to the head, neither of which he had just yet, and act like things were normal. Why couldn't she? He wanted things to go back to the way they were before the kiss, when he could talk to her. Mom sauntered into the room, brushing her palms together. Tannen, Brody, lunch is ready. Tannen gave his mom a scornful look. She didn't need to exclude Frost like that. And Frost, the plows have cleared the roads. I'm sure you're anxious to get home, so I've called you a car. Frost straightened as if someone had jabbed her with a sharp stick. Thank you, Mary. That was kind of you to think of me. I can see where Tannen gets his thoughtful nature. Tannen covered his laugh with a cough. Frost had no illusions as to his thoughtful nature, she told him so quite clearly. Her insult was cleverly veiled, Mom would have no idea. And Tannen? He wasn't insulted at all. Instead, he admired Frost for sticking up for herself. Mom drew one shoulder up and then the other. Well, I just put myself in your shoes and knew that I'd feel half put together without my makeup and personal belongings. Tannen had the strangest urge to throw himself between the two women, but he knew better than to get in the middle of things when Claus came out. Frost smirked. I'm sure you would. Bob-am. Mom folded her arms. Frost didn't give her time to throw another volley. She put her hands on Brody's shoulders. You've done excellent work today, young man. I'm certain you're on Santa's good list. He frowned. But you promised to show me how to make snowflakes. I can teach you that, volunteered Mom. But I wanted Frost to teach me. 
innocent child that he was, Brody had no idea he had just thrown gas on a simmering fire. Frost smiled at him. And I never break a promise to a child, it's against the Crin family code. She hugged him quickly. But I don't want to overstay my welcome. She sent Mom a pointed look. Brody nodded reluctantly. Frost walked right up to Mom, a smile on her face and a you-can't-get-to-me lilt to her steps. Tannen held his breath, wondering what she was going to say. He was pretty ticked off at his parents. And he was pretty sure he wanted Frost in his life in some way, although after the kiss and then the subsequent ignoring of said kiss, he wasn't exactly sure how that was going to happen. Maybe he should take it back three steps and focus on working together. Frost threw her arms around Mom's neck. You have an amazing family, and from what I've seen, you're the pivot point for all that. Mom barely hugged her back before dropping her arms. Thank you. Thank you for having me over. Do you want to take the leftover cinnamon rolls? No. It's just me, so they'll go to waste. You guys enjoy them. Mom smiled stiffly. We will. I'll walk you to the car. Tannen headed for the mudroom. Come on, Brody, lunch is waiting. Mom waved for him to go with her, and they split off in the hallway. Tannen looked over at Frost as they walked. You don't like my mom, do you? Why do you say that? Um, because your conversation was... Frosty. He winked to show he wasn't taking this too seriously. Frost let out of gust of air. She's used to running the show around here. Any woman would be seen as a threat to her status. I'm not out to take over her family or anything, but I'm not going to let her treat me like last year's evening gown. Tannen drew his eyebrows together. Don't evening gowns last for years? Frost pretended to choke. You did not just say that. You only wear them once, maybe twice. And then they've served their purpose, she said matter-of-factly as she shimmied into her pink snowsuit. He liked watching her body move. She was graceful at the same time she was efficient, and she was so small even he, with his bum leg, could carry her over a threshold. He blinked to clear the mental vision of Frost in a wedding dress, dotted with diamonds that sparkled as brightly as her eyes, and him in a tux. I shudder to think of the closet space you need. He slid into his coat and picked up a hat and gloves. She laughed. Don't ask. I won't. He wouldn't, but he wanted to know anyway. As they stepped out of the garage and into the winter wonderland, the postman pulled up to the mailbox. Tannen's heart did a little flip. Miss Kringle's letter may have found him. He didn't know how she did it, but the letter always arrived where he was that day, the office or home. Once, when they'd gone to Disneyland, it appeared on his pillow at the hotel. That made him think that his mom was the one penning the letters, but after some thought, it became obvious that she wasn't the author. He quickened his step. Are we in a hurry? Frost's legs, though long for her petite body, hurried to keep up with him. Sorry. I'm expecting a letter. Frost's hand went to her purse and she looked anywhere but at him. Oh. Anything important? Tannen slowed his pace. He'd never had to explain this to anyone outside of his parents. They'd been happy to believe it was a child he'd met while undergoing treatments and left it at that. My pen pal. Frost continued to study the opposite side of the driveway. That's nice. Her voice had an airy quality to it, like their warm breath in the cold air, floating away and not sticking. Tannen felt the need to expound, to explain to this woman he'd kissed, held, cherished for a moment. She's my best friend. She? Now Frost was looking at him. Looking at him with lots of interest in her expression. He smiled. She. We've written since we were kids. I've told her all my secrets. 
Oh! Frost blinked rapidly, her bare hands clasped behind her. Are you going to tell her we kissed? His chin dropped to his chest, struck dumb by her question. After ignoring what had happened between them all afternoon, she popped that sweetheart out like a demented Pez dispenser. Ah. Uh. She tapped her foot and waited. His mind went into a flurry of answers, none of which seemed good enough. Maybe not all my secrets. He fidgeted. The thing is, I've always wanted her to believe the best of me so I'm selective. Frost's eyes narrowed and she resembled her name. You aren't exactly believing the best in her if you're hiding things. She rubbed her lips together. Do you really think she's that shallow? No. Of course not. He glanced up at the big house with the manicured garden sleeping under a blanket of fresh snow. He'd picked up some bad habits from his parents. As much as he wanted to think he was different from them, would never hold Brody to the same standards or care what another person thought more than he cared about his son, when it came to Miss Kringle, he'd followed in their footsteps, and he hated himself for it. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I didn't mean it as an insult, I wanted to protect her from me. And all the hurt he could cause her, would cause her, if she knew what he'd done, that he'd lied throughout their friendship. Was that why his parents behaved the way they did? Because they were trying to protect him from the ugly parts of humanity? Frost shook her head, making her white hair bounce. You weren't thinking of her, you were protecting yourself. Scared of being alone and lonely. She sighed heavily. Which means you care about her a great deal, or at least care about not losing her. She landed in the cab and rotated both legs in, her knees locked together like a winter princess on parade in an open carriage rather than a woman seated in a cab. He put himself in the open door. Will you be okay getting your Silverado out of the woods? She wrinkled her brow as if didn't know what he was talking about, and then a light went on. I'll be perfectly fine. I called someone and I bet it's already home. Oh. He didn't remember her making a call, but he hadn't seen her until this morning when she was dressed and done baking. She always managed to get more done than he thought possible in a small amount of time. What are you doing Monday? He moved so he blocked the door and the wind. Although Frost didn't seem to mind the cold weather. She was always warm and warmed those around her. How could his mom not feel that? I haven't decided. It's a whole two days away. She smiled up at him, completely unconcerned about not having a job, or life in general. He'd never met someone who truly lived by the advice to take life one day at a time like she managed to. Then again, he'd met few people who would build a snow fort just for the fun of it. Will you come back to work for me? The words were out before he could stop them. He hurried to add, the office has never been more orderly, and I could really use the help until Mrs. Garen comes back, lest he seem too needy. She cocked her head. On one condition. Name it. Who cared about being needy? He had to know that this wasn't the last time he'd see her. You reinstate the company Christmas party. He rolled his eyes. It's a drain on company resources. It's a waste of time. And Mrs. Guerin usually plans the party, and she's out. She ticked off her rebuttals on her fingers as she spoke. It won't cost you a dime. We'll schedule it on the Friday night before Christmas. And I'll take care of everything. Not a dime of company money? She shook her head. I'm curious to see how you'll pull this off. Oh, ye of little faith. She patted his cheek and his stomach did a double backflip. He barely resisted the urge to grab her hand and pull her to him for a kiss that would turn this winter wonderland into a lake. Fine. You can have your party. She tipped her head back and laughed from her belly. The sight struck Tannen right in the heart, she was stunning. Stunningly happy. 
He found himself wanting to do whatever he could to put that look, that elation, on her face again. But what if she asked something of him he wasn't willing to give? He could no longer stay at the mill, it was sucking his soul away, and she was adamant that he keep it open. He'd made his decision, and nothing was going to stop him. Not even a Christmas-loving personal assistant with a laugh that filled his heart. Chapter 20 Frost waved at Tannen from the inside of the cab as it pulled away from the curb. He looked so good in his dark blue coat, his head covered by a knit hat. The hat changed his appearance in the same way a cowboy hat could change a man's look from wholesome to mysterious. It brought out his eyes, which were already his most prominent feature. Her hands trembled as she dialed Robin and Stella. That was close, she said as soon as the line connected. I almost told him who I was. What? shrieked Stella. Have you lost your marbles? Frost jerked at the harsh response, but Stella wasn't done. We're up to our belt buckles and mail around here and, according to Lux, tipping over ten percent, and you almost blow it by telling him you're his long-lost Santa's daughter love. I thought the whole point was for him to get faith in Christmas, not in you. Hey, I said almost. And what do you mean, you're up to your belt buckles and mail? Dad's supposed to be taking care of it. Robin answered, he is, but he's behind in scanning. Frost moaned and pressed her hand to her suddenly aching stomach. It's not that hard. He can scan one while he reads one. He's a man, one task at a time. Stella snapped her gum. What's Ginger doing? Her Santa sister should be able to at least organize well. She had to pack the sleigh on Christmas Eve, and that wasn't an easy task. She's doing the first check of the list, said Robin. Hey, lady, where do you want me to drop you off? asked the driver. He had a thick white mustache and a shadow across his chin, like he hadn't shaved this morning. Actually, when Frost looked at him in the rearview mirror, he resembled one of the old man Muppets who shouted rude comments from the balcony. The shorter one with the bald head. Wait, weren't they both bald? Lady? She jerked her attention out the window. He'd taken her out of the iron gates and higher-end homes and was cruising Main Street. The shops were dark and locked up tight because of the holiday. Today was Black Friday, and they'd opened, no doubt, hoping to add a banner day to the books. It being late afternoon and almost dark, the shops had closed. What a sad sight they made. The street was so bare. Not a Christmas decoration above a door nor a tree in a window. No wonder they closed early on the biggest shopping day of the year, shoppers were probably depressed by the lack of cheer. Stop! She practically shouted at the driver. He slammed on the brakes and Frost threw her hand on the seat in front of her to keep from slamming into it. You can let me out here. She rifled through her purse and came up with enough money for the ride and a tip. Keep the change. He shook his head, muttering something that an old man Muppet would have thought hilarious. Frost? asked Robin. I'm here. She turned one way and then another. There was so much to be done. Can you guys come down here? I could use some help. Sorry, quipped Stella. We're just getting going and I need to be here, I feel like everything could unwrap any second. This tipping thing has me off balance. I'm the same way in the kitchen, Robin said apologetically. What did you need help with anyway? Decorating. Frost tucked the phone between her cheek and her shoulder and framed the street with her hands, looking for the perfect spot for a Christmas tree. In that case, Robin's voice sounded farther away, like she'd pulled the phone away from her ear and was still talking. L. M. N. What did you need? Robin asked Ginger. It's not what I need, replied Robin. It's what Frost needs. Frost? Hi, Frost chirped. She wasn't slow to catch on to what Robin had in mind. 
When Ginger was wooing Joseph, she decorated the small town of Clearview, Alaska, by letting her full Santa jeans out of the box. Clearview was quite a bit smaller than Elderberry, but if anyone had the ability to make it over, it was Ginger. Feel like getting serious about the season with me? I'm listening. I want to decorate Elderberry's main street, but it's big and... Bells jingled through the phone line. I'm grabbing Joseph and Layla, and we'll be there in twenty minutes. A burst of jolly shot through frost. I'll be waiting. Not for long. Ginger hung up. Are you guys still there? Yep. 10-4, quipped Stella. Is the mail room that bad? Frost's insides crumpled like a cheap piece of paper in a fist. She'd never wanted to be home so badly. I'm not gonna lie, it's bad. Stella snapped her gum again. Robin hummed in disapproval of Stella's comment. It's nothing you can't fix when you get here. I believe in you. To a Kringle, I believe in you were powerful words, and they help smooth out the tight spots inside of Frost. Robin wasn't done. I'm sending a care package with Ginger. Be sure to eat while you're working, it will help you stay up longer without needing to sleep. Thanks. The Kringle sisters had all inherited their father's ability to stay up all night working. They had their limits, but their energy level went well beyond the average person's. Frost was counting on that ability to get her through the long night ahead. I haven't had anything since breakfast. She wrinkled her nose, thinking of Mary's obvious dismissal from her home. Then she scrunched it even tighter, thankful she didn't have to bring Tannen's mom Christmas cheer if she was going to set foot at the North Pole again. Okay, Stella announced, I have fifteen minutes and so do you. Spill everything about Tannen and how you almost ruined your one chance to make it home for Christmas. You know, Stella, one of these days you're going to have to face the Christmas music and let someone see the real you. Robin sounded like such a big sister sometimes, but it was good to hear her talk like she'd finally come to accept the inevitable. She put up so many walls over the last two years that Frost wondered if she'd be the last single Kringle and they'd have to drag her to the wedding chapel. Mind your own stocking, Stella snapped. I need a romance fix. Come on, Frost. Spill your glitter. Frost brushed the snow off a cement planter and planted her but on the makeshift seat, where she proceeded to give a full update on everything from stumbling upon Tannen and his previously unknown son to the moment Mommy Dearest shoved her out the door. Her sisters listened with rapt attention, adding squeals or groans were appropriate. So my plan is to work on the town for a couple of days until I can infiltrate the company and spread Christmas cheer there. Are you going to kiss him again? prodded Stella. Not if I can help it. Please, please, please don't help it. Stella. What? Stories are so much better when there's kissing involved. Frost giggled. Life was so much better when kissing was involved. Kissing Tannen was everything she'd ever imagined it would be and so much more. He was particularly skilled in giving her goose bumps with the brush of his lips against her jaw. Fudge frosting, she could barely breathe just thinking about it. I'll give you that one. Me too, added Robin. The distant sound of sleigh bells jingled. I gotta go, Ginger's here. Good luck, Stella and Robin chorused before hanging up. A bright red sleigh halted nearby, pulled by Starling. At three years old, she was too young to consider for the Christmas Eve ride and was still in her training harness. It would be a good ten years before she was mature enough and had the stamina to be one of the top eight, if she ever got there. Not all reindeer were cut out for the long haul, though they all seemed to think they were. All except for Max, the lump of coal who'd left Frost stranded in the woods. He'd just as soon stay behind and eat the oat supply while the others did all the hard work. When she got back to the palace, she'd make sure he ate shredded wheat for a week. Layla threw herself off the sleigh and into Frost's waiting arms. Frost spun in a circle. I've missed you, 
sugar plum. Frost set her down and took in Layla's look. She held out her arms and spun in a circle for inspection. I love the red leggings, and that plaid tunic is the most adorable thing I've seen since I got here. She reached into her purse and pulled out a matching headband. Just a few finishing touches. With the headband secured, she retrieved clip-on earrings and a set of jangling bracelets. Having a niece was so much better than having dolls, and Frost loved her dolls growing up. Layla's eyes grew brighter with each addition. She fingered the bangles hanging from her earlobes. I love them. I knew you would. Ginger alighted from the sleigh and reached for a hug. I miss you. Thanksgiving dinner just wasn't the same. Me too. Frost hugged her tightly, breathing in her cookie scent that was as familiar as snowflakes. She released her sister and hugged Joseph, even though he stood as stiff as one of the tree stumps he was so fond of carving. He was getting better about all the affections the Kringle clan heaped upon him and managed to pat Frost's back. She fought the tears that threatened to form. If she missed Joseph, who teased her relentlessly about her clothing choices like any good brother would, then she was more homesick than even she knew. Ginger rubbed her hands together. Where can I start? Frost checked her grin. Knowing full well that Ginger's need to string lights and display giant candy canes was practically eating her up inside, she took a few steps and then walked back the other direction. I'm not sure about a theme. She hummed to herself as she continued to torture her sister. Frost, Ginger warned. How about, Frost lifted her arms and spread them wide as if painting the words in front of her. Santa Claus is coming to town? Ginger gave her the don't be silly look. Never mind, I'm on it. She ran towards the sleigh, where her Kringle purse sat on the seat. Joseph went to follow her, but Frost grabbed him by the back of his flannel shirt. She tried, when he first moved to the palace, to get him into something else, anything else, and failed, finally embracing his brawny man style as if it were a real thing. We need a nativity scene. I'm thinking the empty lot over there. Frost pointed between the barber shop and the greeting card store. Think you can come up with a life-sized representation in twelve hours or less? I want something made from wood, since this is a mill town. And it needs to be good. Christ was the reason for the season, everything about Santa and his gift-giving practice pointed to the Savior of mankind and celebrated his birth. Sometimes people forgot, they got wrapped up in the presents and the trappings, and she didn't want that to happen. A life-sized crash would be a humble reminder amidst all the glamour she had planned for Main Street. Joseph ran his hand down his beard. We flew over a scrap pile of trees on the way here. I'll bet I can find what I need there. He waved for his niece. Come on, we need to take a sleigh ride. Layla hopped after him, happy to be included. Hey, Frost. I could use nutcrackers for the street signs, about this big. Ginger held her hands four feet apart. Put them in uniform. Frost smiled, thinking of the soldiers as she pulled one out of her bag for every lamp post on both sides of the street. Next, she retrieved a ladder and began fastening them in place. Can you help me with this? Ginger had disappeared behind a stunning pine tree spilling out of her Kringle bag. Frost climbed down from the ladder. How big did you picture this thing? Who sized? Ginger shrugged like it should have been an easy answer. They barely managed to get the fully decorated tree set up in the middle of the roundabout in the center of Main Street, only losing three decorations in the process. Frost found an outlet poking out of the ground. She glanced at Ginger. Any chance we can get Lux down here to check out the grid, make sure we don't knock out the power? Ginger frowned, a look that was comical on her generally jolly face. She and Quick are stuck monitoring just about everything back home. As soon as they get the production equipment level, the ice shifts again. Nutcrackers. Even a half of a percent messes with things. 
Frost pressed her palm against her forehead, said a quick prayer, and plugged in the lights. Mercifully, the town didn't go dark. Okay, any more trees? Ginger grinned gleefully. Only eleven more to go. Eleven? Ginger hurried towards the post office at the end of the street. An even dozen. I'm thinking of the twelve days of Christmas. That explains the partridges on the last tree. Exactly! Ginger threw her hand in the air in triumph. Frost hurried ahead of her. I got this one. She pictured a ten-foot-tall tree covered with pairs of white turtle doves, teal ribbons, white lights, gold baubles, and silver bells. It came out of her purse with a whoosh. Ginger oohed and awed over the details just long enough to put her hand in her purse and pull out a sparse tree. What the tree lacked in branches was made up for in bursts of burlap fabric. Red lights mingled with white lights amid the branches, and tin stars and candy cane shapes were the perfect backdrop for the red and white hens. I'm feeling like the song is a little heavy on the poultry. Frost let Ginger do the calling bird's tree, which she did with blue canaries and frosty accents. Frost was ready with an idea for the golden rings. Instead of having small rings hanging from the tree, the tree itself was made up of five golden rings in graduating sizes. The branches were welded in place. She grunted, this tree heavier than the last. Stunning. Ginger grinned as she waltzed to the next place for a tree. As much fun as this is, it's not going to be enough. Frost nodded. I know. You need something to bring everyone together. Frost's ski sailing tree was decorated with pastel eggs and ribbons. I'm working on that. Working as in thinking furiously over the problem but not getting anywhere. They were still working and Frost still thinking the next morning when shop owners turned on the lights. The sun was down, but the Saturday after Thanksgiving wasn't a day to sleep in. Most of them kept their faces burrowed into their scarves as they hurried along, carrying mugs that smelled of coffee and cocoa. Frost wiped her sleeve across her forehead. Around 2.30 she changed from her snowsuit to a heavy Christmas sweater to allow her better movement. This one had a red and white Aztec print and a fur collar secured with a big black button. Ginger wasn't slowing down. She hugged mistletoe above all the shop doors whistling as she worked. Hopefully no one got in trouble for the kissing weed. Joseph and Layla filled the manger with hay. The crash was rustic and yet beautiful, a tribute to the master carpenter and the centerpiece of all they'd done. They'd moved the sleigh and reindeer to the top of the hardware store, where they were out of sight, and Frost had finally gotten back to hanging the nutcrackers on the lampposts when she felt a tug on her sweater. She glanced down the side of the aluminum ladder that clattered with every step. She wasn't sure if her purse was mad at her for being banished and had given her a health hazard or if all aluminum ladders behaved as such. Excuse me, said the grisly older gentleman in a plaid coat and an olive green duck hunting hat, the flaps hiding his ears. What do you think you're doing? She smiled. I'm spreading Christmas cheer. Three women, holding their coats tight against them, smiled as they passed. It looks beautiful, called the one on the end. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Frost called back and waved. They giggled like schoolgirls. Merry Christmas, they chorused. Who do you think you are, griped the old man. I'm the Christmas coordinator. There's no such thing. He chewed on a toothpick poking out of the side of his mouth. Frost glanced nervously at Ginger. She could use some Santa charm right about now. Ginger was busy draping the wise men in velvet cloaks. She placed a brilliant white blanket beneath the holy child and given Mary a shawl. Frost applied a smile. It's a volunteer position. He jerked his hand towards the nutcracker lying on the ground, patiently waiting his turn to stand guard. And all this came out of my budget, I suppose. Donated, happily. Frost climbed down the ladder and brushed off her hands. 
Here was a perfect opportunity to spread some Christmas cheer. She picked up the nutcracker. Do you want to do the honors? He scowled. My hands would freeze right off. He looked at her bare fingers tightly wrapped around the stiff wire that made up the nutcracker's arm. She fought against the urge to hide them and Mr. Nutcracker behind her back. You know how it is where you're working hard. He muttered something. I'm sorry, what was that? I said, the next thing you know, they'll want to have the Christmas parade again. Her heart leapt like twelve lords. Parade? Did it for years and then just stopped. He turned to leave. Big bother, if you ask me. I was glad when they called it quits. Spent days cleaning up afterward. Frost brought the nutcracker up and held it to her chest. Sounds like a real celebration. He tossed his hand to the side as if tossing the idea in the trash. Frost grabbed onto the idea and held tight. A parade, she whispered, trying the word out loud to see if it had substance. A light parade. Her skin tingled. She reached into her bag and pulled out a banner that read Join Us for a Holiday Parade on Christmas Eve. Beneath that it said the parade starts at dusk and there was a picture of Santa on a parade float. This was it. This was what would bring Christmas back to Elderberry. She added her cell number to the bottom of the next poster along with instructions to call her for more information. Feeling like she was on the right track, finally, she attached a banner to the feet of every nutcracker. This was it, the parade was the big thing the town needed to come together for Christmas. The number of shoppers swelled, and all around her people talked about the parade and exclaimed over the decorations. Christmas was back on track. Chapter 21 Christmas is totally out of whack this year. Tannen glanced up at his mom from where he read the finance section of the New York Times. Brody was sitting on the floor, playing a video game. The atmosphere at home was strained at best since mom had kicked Frost out. Tannen expressed his feelings on the matter and got an icy it's my house in reply. To which he'd said, then I guess it's a good thing we won't be living here much longer. You can have the whole big, empty house to yourself. Mom had burst into tears and not spoken to him or dad for the rest of the day. She'd gone out early Saturday morning to start Christmas shopping and just now dropped her bags onto the couch. Apparently, they'd moved on from the silent treatment. You should see Main Street, they've turned it into a Hallmark keepsake Christmas village. It's completely overdone and untasteful. She lifted her nose in the air. You should let the mayor know how bad it is. Dad's eyes narrowed. Maybe I will. There's no sense spending taxpayers' money on frivolous things. He pushed himself out of the chair and went into the other room to make the call. Mom rifled through her bags. She pulled out a new game for the video console and handed it to Brody, whose eyes lit up. Thanks, Grandma. He got to his feet and hugged her. I knew you wanted that one, and I couldn't wait until Christmas. Mom looked over Brody's head, challenging Tannen to take away the game and make a stink. Tannen chewed on his displeasure. He didn't like Brody on video games at all. The only way he allowed it was if Brody did equal amounts of time with a book. Mom was pushing him, but he wasn't going to give in to her underhanded tactics. Instead he said, you've got 15 minutes left on the timer if you want to switch over to your new game. Brody nodded, his hair bouncing off his forehead. I need scissors to get it out. Mom followed him out of the room. I'll make sure he doesn't cut himself. Tannen pulled the paper in front of his face so he wouldn't have to answer. Brody was nine, he could handle scissors on his own and didn't need a mother hen hanging over his shoulder. The child had the patience of job while Tannen's was thinner than an old t-shirt. Dad sat down with an old man grunt. Jeff claims he had nothing to do with the decorating. That's unlikely. 
Tannen continued to hide behind his paper, but it wasn't the words on the page that caught his attention, it was a memory. Do you remember how you used to drive me down Main Street to look at the lights? Dad's face turned white. We only did it that year, you. Tannen waited for him to finish, to actually say the words lost your leg or battled cancer, but they didn't come. He barely held on to his anger. Flicking the paper so it stood straight again, he said, I used to love the light parade. It was my favorite part of Christmas. Why'd they stop doing the it, anyway? Dad shifted in his seat as if he'd sat on an ornament hook. The mill sponsored the parade, but when you got sick, we didn't feel like celebrating. The city didn't have the money to do it on their own, and so it stopped. Tannen scowled. How did he not know this? But I got better. Dad looked at his pant leg. Not all the way better. Tannen crumpled the newspaper into a ball. When are you going to accept that my leg is gone? Son. Don't son me. I lost a leg, Dad, but you act like you lost a child. I'm still here. He pointed to his chest. I've been here this whole time, but you act like I'm some, some problem to be dealt with. Dad stared at him, open-mouthed. When he didn't say all the things Tannen longed to hear, like how much he loved Tannen, leg or no leg, like how grateful he was Tannen had survived, like the loss of a leg wasn't as bad as losing Tannen would have been, Tannen burst from his chair and left the room. Remaining under the oppression of unmet parental expectations was not an option. He headed for his room, running his hands over his head in frustration. He shut the door and made his way to the desk. The wood was smooth under his fingertips. He slid open the top drawer, bringing out Miss Kringle's letters. This stack, three fingers thick, was just this year. He'd saved them all, safely tucking them away in boxes under his bed. He could sit down right now and relive every one of her funny stories about the reindeer and her sisters, but he didn't. He hadn't received a letter in ages, days, really, but that was a long time for them to go without corresponding. He stared at the closed door. He'd said things to his father. Things he probably should have said a long time ago or never said at all. He wasn't quite sure which. He'd been in a mood ever since Frost said he wasn't being fair to Miss Kringle. He chuckled at the memory. For a moment there he'd thought Frost might be jealous of Miss Kringle, so it had taken him off guard when she defended his friend. And she was right. He should have told Miss Kringle everything. He'd said he was trying to hide the worst parts of himself from Miss Kringle, but how could he consider Brody the worst of him? Brody was the best of all Tannen ever wanted to be. He was bright, happy, loving, open, and good-hearted. If he and Miss Kringle ever met up, Tannen wanted it to be a happy meeting, no one would ever look at his son like he didn't make sense. Tannen knew how that felt. He pulled back the seat and settled in to write a long overdue letter. Dear Miss Kringle, I hope all is well with you and your family. I haven't heard from you in a while, and yet I understand it is your busy season. Which is why I'm sorry I'm sending this revelatory letter to you now. I wish I'd thought this through a long time ago, but I guess I needed to learn something about myself. I have a son. I'm sorry to spring this on you and I'm sure you're confused, especially after my declarations of affection. Brody is nine and was born when I was just eighteen. I wasn't in love with his mother, but I craved love, or what a seventeen-year-old thinks is love. It was a hard time. I was still a kid and I had a child. I'd get up with him in the middle of the night and feed him, rocking in an overstuffed chair until the two of us fell asleep. His mother wanted nothing to do with Brody, and I'm a single dad. Miss Kringle, I beg your forgiveness for not sharing the best part of my life with you. I was embarrassed and young and stupid when I decided to withhold this information. It's not an excuse, but I want you to have an answer when, or if, you ask yourself, why? Why did he lie to me all these years? 
I wish I could explain this to you in person, but maybe this is better because I won't have to see the disappointment on your face. I don't know if I could bear the weight of that for the rest of my days. He closed his eyes, trying to picture Miss Kringle. Instead of the fuzzy image, Frost came to mind. Her amethyst eyes brimmed with unshed tears and her lips trembled. He drew a ragged breath and forced the image away. I would like, very much, for you and Brody to meet. The words flowed from his pen as if they'd flowed right out his heart. In fact, I'd like to change my Christmas wish this year. I'd like you and Brody to meet. You can land your sleigh on our roof, or come with Santa on Christmas Eve, tiptoe into his room and make his acquaintance. You don't even need to tell me you're here. If he says he met you in the middle of the night, and that you enchanted his life for an evening much the way you've enchanted mine with every letter, I'll be content. He couldn't quite leave it at that. A part of him had always loved Miss Kringle, first as a pen pal, then as someone to complain to, then as a friend, and then, well, when he felt the paper slide against his hand, all the adoration and love that had built up over the years came rushing back. But what about Frost? The kiss they'd shared in the quiet hush of a stunning winter landscape had taken hold of his heart. He was interested, and she was here. He could touch her hand, feel her breath on his cheek, and smell her wonderful sugar and spice scent. Even now, it floated around him like a blissful memory. He glanced down at the sheet, already three-quarters of the way full of confessions and petitions. Miss Kringle was a part of his life, a part he wasn't ready to let go of. However, if you knock on one door over, I'll answer. And perhaps, on the most magical of nights, I will finally get to gaze into your eyes and tell you how much you have meant to me through the years. With love. Tannen. Tannen set his pen aside and stared at the page until the words blurred. He didn't want to reread it, didn't want to second-guess his decision. He stuffed the letter into one of the golden embossed envelopes and took it to the mailbox right away. As he lifted the flag to let the letter carrier know there was an outgoing letter, he felt his chest expand with satisfaction. He stood taller. He wasn't going to hide anymore. Not with Miss Kringle, and not with his decision to sell the mill. No more sneaking around and taking the coward's way out. Come Monday morning, he'd tell the world, and whatever happened, he'd face it head-on and he'd do his best to protect the employees who worked for him. He had more in common with them than he'd let himself believe, and it was time he acted like he cared, because for the first time in a long time, he did. Chapter 22 Good morning, Ms. Cratchit. Frost glanced up from the computer screen where she sorted Tannen's email. Someone's in a jolly mood today. She stood and followed him into his office. It must be the snowflakes. He waved a hand towards the decorations Frost had made that morning that hung from the ceiling. He took off his coat, admiring her handiwork. I thought they were apropos. This is a paper company. He chuckled. Imagine what you could do with one of the big rolls downstairs. Stop, you're making my fingers tingle. She wiggled them in an effort to discourage her kringleness. There aren't scissors big enough to take on that project, she said as much to herself as Tannen. But if there were... Tannen watched her for a moment. Frost glanced down at her wool skirt and matching sweater set to see if she had spilled toothpaste down the front of her. Her sweater was clear. What? I was just thinking that you look beautiful in the snow. He sat down quickly. I'm sorry. That slipped out. Frost tucked her hair behind her ear. I don't mind. He glanced up, his gaze full of heat. No? No, she grinned, knowing exactly where his thoughts were and happy to tease him a bit. But I'm a little offended that I'm only pretty in the snow. He rolled his eyes. You're especially beautiful in the snow. She put a hand on her hip. That's discouraging. Snow's not an accessory a girl can pick up on Amazon. He lifted a shoulder. 
Lucky for you, you know how to make snow. His eyes bounced up to the paper snowflakes and back. Yeah. She turned and glanced over her shoulder. I do. Adding a Stella worthy sway to her hips, she sauntered out the door. After the 48 hour decorating marathon, she'd slept for 10 hours straight and then got right back to work on Operation Christmas Spirit. Already, she could feel the difference in the town and even at the office. She'd counted three ugly holiday sweaters among the cubicles. With any luck and a dash of frost, the number would double tomorrow. Her computer dinged an alert and a small bubble popped up, announcing a company-wide meeting at 10. Sorry about the mess, said Tim the intern, who was much too eager to please as he loaded her desk with mail. Monday's deliveries are always big. Sorry. He scratched the end of his nose. Frost breathed in the dry paper and light glue scent and longed for home. Oh, how she missed the elves and their pointy hats and perpetual smiles. The rows and rows of filing cabinets and the color-coded file folders. I don't mind. Tim shrugged and headed off to do what interns do. Besides the mail, Frost wasn't sure what a personal assistant did. She kept her eyes on the stacks and reached into her Kringle bag for her favorite letter opener. Tucking herself into the task and the desk, she had created order out of chaos. Needing more, she turned to her inbox and then Tannen's. Feeling restless, she headed for Tannen's office. She stood in the doorway for a moment, observing the deep frown lines around his mouth and the heavy lowering of his brow. This version of Tannen was so different from her letter-writing Tannen, who was also different from the Tannen she'd spent Thanksgiving with. Of all the Tannen versions, her favorite was the one who played in the snow. She liked that he could be serious too, but there was an underlayer of discontent at the office. Like he was unhappy here. She didn't understand that at all, the letter's room was her sanctuary. She looked closer at him. Who was he really? Did you say something? Tannen asked. Frost cringed, hoping she hadn't spoken out loud as she often did in the mail room when she was deep in thought. The elves were used to her random thoughts flying out, but around here it might not be so easily overlooked. Sensing Tannen's admiration, she allowed her hands to drop to her sides and relaxed her muscles. I need something to do. He dropped his head as fast as Rudolph flies. Those reports need to be filed. Her pulse picked up speed, but she wasn't sure if it was the excitement over filing or a reaction to the interest coming from Tannen. He wasn't looking at her, but she had the feeling that he was aware of her every step. She hugged the files to her chest. I'll be in the filing room. Try not to rearrange it today, would you? I'll do my best. She flounced around and left the office, her high ponytail swinging. The filing room was much as she left it, with the cabinets pressed against the walls and a line of chin height ones down the middle. But the best part was Suzu, her blonde curls tamed by two barrettes, at her tiny desk in the corner. When she saw Frost, she bounded across the room and hugged her, folders and all. Oh my goodness! I thought you were fired after the way Mr. Cebu yelled at you for helping me. Frost laughed. Not fired. I quit. No. Zuzu's tattooed eyebrows lifted in an invitation to tell all. Frost did not. She did, however, give a shortened version, leaving out the part where she shared a roof with the Cebu family and pressed her luck with Tannen's mother. She hadn't meant to be so confrontational at the time, but the hostility floating off that woman was a train wreck waiting to happen. And, because of her Kringle abilities, Frost was snatched onto the train and given a one-way ticket. She finished up by telling Zuzu she'd been put in charge of the Christmas party. You came back for a Christmas party? Why do you make that sound weird? Zuzu's eyebrows lowered. I gotta tell ya. Our parties aren't all that great. I think you'll be disappointed. A niggling worry rolled through Frost's stomach. Like listening to the Jack in the Box song. 
You know Jack is about to jump out and scare you, and your body reacts long before he actually appears. That was this moment, the haunting sound of Christmas spirit withering away. Frost thought all she'd have to do was convince Tannen to keep the mill running, but if Zuzu's lack of enthusiasm was any indication, she'd have to convince the whole plant that Christmas was a time to celebrate. This one will be. You'll see. We'll have decorations galore. I'm going to transform this place into the North Pole. At the mention of home, Frost's enthusiasm dropped steeper than one of Blitz's infamous barrel rolls. Still, planning a big Christmas celebration was a cinch for a Kringle. Ginger and Joseph had already promised to swing by with a bag full of gifts. That would lighten everyone's mood. Robin promised to send baked goods. Her sugar cookies were a guaranteed hit. Lux and Stella were pretty much glued to the North Pole until Christmas was over, so they wouldn't be much help, but what else was there? A few reindeer games and the place would ring with carols just like home. She shivered and wrapped her arms around her middle. Banishment was awfully lonely. And maybe that was the point. Maybe Christmas magic wanted her to feel alone, which was awfully mean of it to do. She shook her head. Thinking about what Christmas magic was doing and why would only give her a headache. Lux was much more adept at studying the fickle force than Frost. Hey, it's almost time for the meeting. Wanna go down together? asked Zuzu. Sure. Frost shut the filing drawer with a satisfying clang. Let me just make sure Tannen doesn't need anything. Oh, it's Tannen now, is it? Zuzu nudged her with an elbow. Frost rolled her eyes in reply before hurrying from the room. There was no use telling Zuzu that since she'd kissed the man, calling him Mr. Cebu would seem weird. Of course, kissing him again, that would be weird too. Although, if the moment was right, she wouldn't object. Tannen's kisses were, well, they were magnificent, and the more she thought about his lips on hers, the gentle, demanding pressure, and the feel of their bodies pressed together, the more another kiss seemed like a good idea. Which was why she shouldn't ever think about that again. Ever. Starting now. Okay. Now. She threw her arms up in disgust. Now. Hoping her thoughts weren't plastered across her face, she poked her head into his office only to find it empty. She hurried back to Zuzu, who was waiting outside the filing room door. He must have left already. Let's go, then. I don't want to be the last ones in the room. The cubicles did seem awfully quiet. They made it with time to spare and took the end two seats on the third row from the front. Frost had a flashback to sitting in a lecture hall. She smiled at the people around her as Zuzu made introductions. She seemed to know everyone. The room fell silent as reporters filed in through the side door and took the front row. A cameraman stood and took pictures of the assembled group of workers. At precisely ten, Tannen stood and went to the microphone. He tugged on the bottom of his charcoal suit. He wore a white shirt underneath and a pale green tie that was three shades lighter than his eyes. Combined with his strong jawline and his prominent cheekbones, the look was what Stella would call alpha male hotness. Tannen exuded a level of confidence that intimidated people into not questioning him. The effect was extremely sexy, especially since she knew under all that he was tender and could feather his fingers over her cheek. Frost discreetly fanned her face to cool her burning cheeks. She'd gone a lifetime without feeling changes in external temperatures, but her internal temperature spiked every time she allowed her thoughts to stray. She needed to reset her determination to stay away from him. Okay, now. Deep breath. Now. Thank you for coming. Tannen's deep voice rolled through the speakers set up on the sides of the podium where the microphone caught all his words. As many of you know, my assistant, Mrs. Guerin, is at home recovering. We're praying for her quick recovery. Zuzu hummed. What? Frost asked. 
I've just never heard him say anything like that before. Frost lifted a shoulder. It wasn't so far off track for Tannen to offer up prayer, but maybe he'd never let the people he worked with see that side of him before. It was a small comment, but it felt like a big victory to her. Tannen continued, Mrs. Garen has planned our Christmas party for as long as I can remember. My temporary assistant, Frost, has agreed to take over planning this year. If you'd like to offer your help, please contact her. He motioned her direction. Every head in the room swiveled and hundreds of pairs of eyes stared. Feeling like a bug under a spotlight, Frost stood up and gave a small wave and as big of a smile as she could muster. She counted to three before sitting back in her seat. The head swiveled back to the front. Frost looked up in time to see Tannen give her a lopsided smile. He dropped it quickly. Now, for the big announcement. The air froze in place and everyone seemed to hold their breath. Frost clasped her hands together in her lap. I've decided to sell the mill. The whole room gasped. Frost clutched her hands to her chest as if a dart had entered her heart. It might as well have. If everyone in town was worried about their jobs, about making ends meet, about their families, then they wouldn't have the time nor the cheer for Christmas. Tannen was killing her chance of getting home. Tannen held up his hands. Selling is a personal decision and one that I haven't made lightly. I haven't signed any papers, but I felt that I owed it to all of you, as loyal employees, to share the future of the mill. A reporter from the front row stood up and lifted his hand in the air. Do you have a buyer in mind? Tannen swallowed. A logging mill is interested. Logging? shouted a large man from the middle of the room. He wore an orange safety vest with yellow fluorescent stripes running down the front. That would cut half our jobs. A shorter man jumped to his feet. If they don't bring in their own employees. People murmured to their neighbors. Frost's cringle senses filled up fast with the fear and discontent. She gripped the edge of her seat to keep from running from the room. She should have known better than to come to such a large gathering, especially one Tannen was in charge of. He tended to make big groups angry. Tannen lifted both his hands and motioned for everyone to quiet down. I understand your worries. Yeah, right, yelled an anonymous heckler. I do. You're worried about your children, how you're going to get your son or daughter through college, about the braces they need, the rising cost of living, about the baby on the way. Which is why I've reached out to several paper companies to see if they are interested in purchasing the mill. A best-case scenario would be a change in ownership with minimal disturbance. Some of the stress left the room, and Frost felt the band around her chest loosen. She took in air as if she'd been underwater for the last two minutes. Good for Tannen. Still, change was change. Tannen wrapped up the meeting and went down to talk to the reporters. Frost said goodbye to Zuzu, who was deep in conversation with another woman from the upstairs offices. They had their heads bent together and were talking right on top of one another. Frost's head started to ache. She pushed her way against the tide of people leaving the room, their emotions running into her and trying to roll over her with more force than the actual people. There was a small undercurrent of hope that kept her from going under. She grabbed onto it and held tight. When she got to Tannen's elbow, she waited for him to finish the interview. Can you tell us who you've reached out to? Tannen's jaw flexed. I'm sorry. You can understand that the information will remain confidential until an agreement has been reached. There were a few more questions, and then Tannen turned to her, took her elbow, and ushered her out of the room. Frost's skin tingled under his gentle hand. She could smell his aftershave lotion, all musky and cedarish. Okay, she had no idea what the scent actually was, except that it was manly and made her stomach want to float away. Tannen leaned down and spoke low into her ear. I need you to compile a list of our competitors who may be interested in buying the mill. 
Frost's head stuttered over the information. I thought you already contacted Mills. Tannen shook his head. I didn't think of it until I was standing up there. She felt the weight of responsibility on his shoulders as if she carried it herself. It's a good idea. Yeah. Hopefully it's not too late. He released her elbow and pressed the elevator button. Everyone else had gone back to their desks. They didn't have long before the cubicles emptied out for lunch, although some people would eat at their desks. I need this sale to go through before the end of the year. She turned so she could search his face. Why? What? He faced her, and the air between them charged. Why are you so intent on selling? Tannen looked around, making sure their conversation wouldn't be overheard. My parents want to adopt Brody. They claim that I'm not a good father because I spend so much time here. He ran his hand over his head. I can't help but agree with them. If I sell the mill, I'll become a full-time father and they won't have a leg to stand on. He grimaced as he looked down at his pant legs. Frost's heart melted right there. It puddled in her chest like molten lava. From what I've seen, you're an excellent father. How can they even think of taking him from you? Tannen lifted a shoulder as if it didn't matter, but she could feel the weight on his chest. In their eyes, I'm never good enough. The elevator finally opened with a ding and they stepped inside. It's their problem, Tannen. Not yours. It's mine if they sue for custody. Would they take it that far? I can't put it past them. He leaned back against the wall, his hands tucked into his pockets. They offered to adopt Brody when he was born, but I just couldn't hand him over. It would have been easier for me, but he's mine. I knew it all the way to my bones, and I loved him more than I'd ever loved anyone. I thought they'd given up that line of thinking, but apparently they've been biding their time. Frost twisted her lips as she thought. Mary had been gracious on the outside, and Frost had worked to keep her Kringle radar on the down low while she was there. It wasn't until the whole Christmas tree thing that she'd gotten a good shot of what was really in Mary's heart. It was ugly and twisted and not at all what Frost had pictured when she'd read Tannen's letters through the years. She didn't argue with Tannen's assessment of his parents. If they wanted Brody, they'd play dirty. So you have to sell. Her shoulders slumped. Tannen was in a no-win position, and she put her entire future as a Kringle, not to mention Christmas itself, in a tougher spot. As if echoing her fears, when the elevator doors slid open, a cloud of doom and gloom filled the office. Everyone had their heads down. Some were talking quietly on their phones, probably to their spouses, trying to figure out what this all meant for their individual families. Can you have that information to me by lunch? I'd like to make some phone calls. Tannen's hand graced the small of her back. Frost nodded mutely. As if she didn't have enough to do to save Christmas, now she had to save a paper mill. Nutcrackers. Life outside the mail room was complicated. There was a stack of mail on her desk when she got back, and her fingers itched to sort it. She glanced at Tannen's back as he made his way into his office. He left the door open. She sat, hoping her body would block most of what she was doing. She picked up a stack and began sorting into what Zuzu had called junk mail, which still seemed like an oxymoron and important information. When she came to a gold-embossed envelope with Miss Kringle printed on the front, her hands stilled. She whipped her head around to make sure Tannen wasn't anywhere near. The North Pole address had been crossed out, and written in Dad's neat block script was the paper factory's address. She rolled her eyes. You could have sent it to the cottage, she muttered as she dug through her purse for her favorite letter opener. Frost? Tannen's voice was close, too close. Frost yipped and slapped her hand over the envelope, leaning into the desk to shield it from his view. Sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. 
Frost rubbed her lips together. Hmm? I wondered if the mail had come in. I was just seeing to that. She tipped her head to the side to indicate the neat stacks lined up like toy soldiers. She felt his hope rise, and she cringed, knowing there wouldn't be an envelope from Miss Kringle because she hadn't written him back yet. There's nothing but business letters and junk mail. The words tasted like sandpaper on her tongue and she wanted to spit. Oh, well. Thanks. Yep. She kept her arm plastered over the envelope until she was sure he was gone, and then she quickly stuffed it into her purse right along with the other letters she hadn't read. Well, it wasn't like she could pull them out here. And she couldn't disappear into the ladies' room, because she needed to get going on that list of phone numbers. She blew out, making her lips buzz. So much to do, so little time. Her phone beeped a text from Lux. Another 0.5%. Hurry. Like she wasn't already feeling the pressure. Her fingers flew over the keyboard as she copied and pasted information from the three largest paper mills in the U.S. and two in Canada. She sent the email to Tannen and then typed up a quick party planning document. Her to-do list grew and grew and she fought against the desire to wilt into her chair. Chapter 23 Tannen stretched his neck and then rolled it around several times, trying to loosen the knots. He'd spent the entire afternoon on the phone with two different corporations. The first one, Sheetwork, was interested, but they had financial troubles and probably wouldn't qualify for the loan. They wanted him to personally finance at least half the cost of the mill. He'd promised to think about it but wasn't keen to gamble. The second company, Paper Leaf, was based in Canada. They had a solid financial base but didn't love the logistics of running one company in two countries. They wanted to come down and check it out before they committed, which was understandable and frustrating. They were working on arranging travel plans. Two down and three to go in Tannen was wiped out. He wasn't made to be a salesman and it drained him. Frost came in, carrying two mugs of hot chocolate. He could smell the chocolate from across the room. Hazelnut? he asked as he sniffed the steam. She'd given him a Grinch mug, her way of teasing him. He liked that they shared an inside joke, it made him feel closer to her. Of course. It's your favorite. He lifted an eyebrow. I don't remember telling you that. She blew across the top of her mug. Hers was white with glittery snowflakes in blue, lavender that matched her eyes, and pink. You don't have to, good personal assistants know these things. Her eyes smoldered, and he thought about kissing her right there in his office. He tapped the side of his mug and gave her a smirk. She smirked back. You should head home. I've got a few more calls to make. She gave him a don't be silly look. I've got a party to plan. I wanted to measure the room and draw up a layout for the refreshment tables, the DJ, and Santa's sleigh. He opened his mouth to protest, but she held up a hand. My place is empty anyway. I'd rather be here with you, it makes me feel less lonely. He liked that, liked that he could help her just by being around. She definitely lifted his spirits. You miss your family? Exponentially. She sipped her cocoa. Are you going home for Christmas? She swallowed her sip. Hopefully. She ran her delicate finger around the rim of the cup, her eyes glazing over with thoughts she didn't voice. Her phone sang I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, the song clear now that the noise of the office had died down. She set down her cup and hurried out to answer it. Tannen listened, wondering who would be calling her. Despite all the time they'd spent together, he didn't know that much about her. Come to think of it, Frost was a miracle to have come from Mr. Cratchit. He was short, thick, bald, and had a big nose. Perhaps Frost got her looks from her mother. Hello? Oh, hello, Mayor. Yes, 
that was me. Tannen's cell vibrated against the top of his desk. His father's number popped up on the screen, and he held back a groan. No doubt the old man had gotten wind of the press conference slash company meeting today and had a few things to say. Better to get it out now, while they weren't face to face, than have to see the disappointment and anger in his old man's eyes. Merry Christmas, Dad. Is this some kind of joke? Tannen got to his feet, needing to have solid ground beneath him for this conversation. I told you I was going to sell the mill. Not that, the light parade. The what? The parade. There are banners all over downtown announcing a light parade on Christmas Eve. Tannen relaxed his fist. I had nothing to do with a parade. The mill isn't sponsoring it. Although, perhaps it should. That would be a good way to get on the community's good side. Well, your personal assistant's contact information is listed on the posters. Tannen's chin came up. Hang on. He covered the microphone on the phone. Frost? She poked her head in, her phone still at her ear, and raised her eyebrows silently asking what he needed. Are you organizing a light parade? She slipped her hand over her phone. I'm trying to. The mayor is giving me grief about it right now. Tannen growled. I'll bet my dad called him. He pulled his hand away. I'm going to look into this and call you back. I'll not have it, Tannen. That light parade cannot happen. Sometimes, when his dad got like this, Tannen understood exactly why he'd rebelled all those years ago. The same old feelings of wanting to push all his dad's buttons at once and have them light up like a Christmas tree came flooding back. Lucky for him, and his dad, he'd matured. Well, at least a little. I'll let you know what I find out. They said goodbye and he waved Frost into the office. She came in, a slight frown on her beautiful face. Tannen reached for the phone, asking permission with his eyes. Frost held it out to him and shrugged. The mayor was going on about fiscal year and property taxes. Tannen's lips twitched with a smile he wasn't quite ready to let out of the box. Jeff, this is Tannen C. Boo. Jeff sputtered to a stop. While the mayor was a tentative friend and best golf buddy with Tannen's father, he was more of a distant uncle to Tannen. Tannen respected Jeff, and Jeff knew it. Tannen? What's going on over there? By over there, Jeff meant at the mill. Frost grabbed his arm and pulled him and her phone closer so she could hear the conversation too. Tannen tipped the phone out. She might as well know the trouble she'd stirred up, although he doubted very much that she meant to cause any harm. There's been a lot going on. Big changes. So I hear. But you called to talk about the Christmas parade, I assume. Yes. It seems one of your employees has taken it upon herself to reinstate the light parade. This puts me in quite the pickle. We don't have the funds for the parade, and she says there aren't any sponsors. If I tell the town the parade is cancelled, I'll go down in history as the Grinchy Mayor of Elderberry. If we do the parade, I'll go down in history as the mayor who bankrupted the town. Frost covered her mouth with her hand, her eyes expressing her horror at what she'd done. She pulled the phone closer to her. I'm so sorry, Jeff. You've worked so hard to become mayor. Do you remember campaigning for Hall Monitor when you were in the second grade? Even then, you were thinking up slogans and walking kindergartners to class to get votes. This is your calling in life, and now I've ruined it. Jeff's laughter boomed through the phone. Let's hope I'm a better politician than I was back then. The line grew quiet for a moment as they thought over their options. I can provide all the lights for the parade, Frost offered. I have connections. Well, that would cut back costs, conceded the mayor. Tannen chewed his lip. I'll bet the Smooth and Minty would set up a hot chocolate stand and Mrs. Grant would sell donuts. 
the mayor tapped in with, the high school marching band would be happy to participate. We might even get a couple of the teams to be in the parade. I'll get them all glow sticks. Frost grinned. Tannen's gaze dropped to her mouth. He knew what kissing her was like, and he wanted more. They were close enough that it wouldn't take much to make a kiss happen. There is the matter of cleanup. Tannen had an idea. Our janitorial staff can take care of that. They'll volunteer? asked Jeff. I'll pay them time and a half as our contribution to the celebration. Frost put her hand on his chest and mouthed the words thank you. Heat started under her palm and spread throughout his body, making him feel as if he'd been in a hot tub and had his muscles melted to a pleasant goo. Well, then, it sounds like we're going to have a light parade after all, said Jeff. Frost's whole face lit up. You'll go down in history is the merriest mayor. She giggled. Jeff chuckled. Call my secretary and set up a meeting. I have a feeling you're a person I should know. Frost agreed, and they said their goodbyes and hung up the phone. She squealed and threw her arms around Tannen's neck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She pressed a kiss to his cheek. He pulled her body flush with his and held her close, not wanting to let her go. She fit perfectly against him, and he couldn't help but think that she'd been made for him and he'd been made for her. Come on. She released him and hurried to her desk. We need to get downtown and talk to Smooth and Minty and Mrs. Grant's bakery. Now? Tannen glanced at his watch. Well, after we pick up Brody, of course. She tossed her coat over her arm. He'll want to see downtown all lit up. How do you do that? He asked as she retrieved his coat from the coat rack behind the Christmas tree. What? No, exactly what I'm thinking. Frost giggled. It's not hard. You've been here all day. I just guessed that you missed him. They made their way out of the building. What about measuring for the party? Tannen asked as he pushed open the front doors. An icy chill smacked him in the face, and he shuddered. I'll come in early tomorrow. Frost took his hand and chased away the chill. She pulled on his arm. If we hurry, we can talk to a few other businesses tonight, too. Tannen couldn't help but smile. All this planning and dashing around makes me feel like a kid at Christmas. Frost smiled over her shoulder. Her eyes gleamed with a secret joy. Awesome! She did a fist pump. They reached his car and he opened the passenger door for her. She climbed in, all bouncing and giggling and grinning. Unable to stop himself, or more likely unwilling to stop himself, he pressed a kiss to her cheek. She stilled, her cheeks dusting pink, and ran her hand down the side of his face. I like it when you smile. I smile a lot when I'm around you. Well, a lot more than usual. It's not me, it's Christmas. She reached for the seat belt. Tannen stepped back and shut the door. He made his way around the car. She may think it was Christmas, but he was pretty sure he hadn't had this merry of a Christmas in a long time. The ride to his house passed in a blur of stolen glances at Frost. It's a good thing he'd driven this route countless times, because his body made all the right stops and turns without his brain's help. Once he'd put the car in park in the driveway, they hurried inside. Brody must have heard the door, because he was running towards them at full speed. Frost. He ran right past Tannen and smacked into Frost, wrapping his arms around her middle. Frost rocked back but managed to keep her footing. She hugged Brody back. Are you ready to spread some Christmas cheer? Sure. How are we gonna do that? He scratched his nose. Frost released her hold on him and bent down to his level. We're going to find helpers for the light parade. Excuse me? 
Dad stormed out of the family room, his face redder than Santa's suit. Frost looked up, her eyes wide with fear. You're angry? Dad threw his hands in the air. You bet your sunny disposition I'm angry. Why? Tannen held up his hands as if he could hold back Dad's tirade. The moment continued to hurtle forward like the Polar Express sliding off the tracks and onto a frozen lake, there were no brakes to stop or even slow them down. I forbid it, that's why, Dad thundered. Frost moved Brody behind her body and gave Dad a year misbehaving glare. If Dad noticed her disapproval of his raised voice, he didn't let it stop him. We started the light parade the year Tannen was born, and we ended it the year we thought we were going to lose him. But you didn't lose him. Shouldn't that be celebrated? Frost's voice was as calm as a meadow after a snowfall. Dad looked right at Tannen, his voice lowering to a mere rumble. We lost what could have been. Tannen felt the words like a javelin to the chest. He'd always believed he couldn't be good enough, smart enough, or enough enough, and now he had proof. He placed his hand on Frost's back. He also had her. And being near her, having her believe in him, was more than enough for a happy life. You're right, Frost said. You lost what could have been, but not what was meant to be. Tannen's cancer was tragic, and the loss of his leg terrible for all of you, but God's plans for us are lifelong and you're looking at the short game for answers. Replaying the tape over and over again and missing this part of the game. She patted Tannen's arm. That's your choice, Donald, just as it's your choice to support or do your best to ruin the Christmas Eve parade. Frost reached into her ever-present purse and pulled out a flyer. She ran her fingers along the edge of it, considering Dad for a moment before handing it to him. He glanced down, seemingly shamed into silence by Frost's words. Or perhaps she'd touched his heart by acknowledging his pain. Had Tannen ever done that? Brody sneaked around Frost and grabbed his hand, looking up at him for reassurance. Tannen couldn't imagine watching his son go through what he'd gone through as a child, it would tear him in two. Had he ever apologized for putting his dad through all that? The food trays thrown at the wall in frustration, the endless nights of crying in pain and for his own loss, the teenaged rebellion. The thoughts were big and new and hard to hold on to, and it was even harder to decide what to do about them. Grand Marshal, asked Dad. He flipped the paper around. Did you know about this? Tannen shook his head. That was all frost. Of course, we'd like your whole family to ride in the convertible. It's baby blue and my family is bringing it down from Alaska just for this parade. They are? Tannen asked. He hadn't heard of the Cratchits having holdings in Alaska. Frost's answering smile wobbled. They will as soon as I ask them. He folded his eyebrows together. Dad folded the paper in half, lining up the edges and swiping his fingers down the crease with sharpness. He then folded it once again so all four corners matched up. You've given me a lot to think about. I'll have to discuss this with Mary. We'll get back to you. Frosts popped her lips. She could feign innocence and ease with the best Hollywood starlets. Tannen knew she was faking her composure, because he could feel her underlying discomfort almost as if it were his own. You're welcome to come tonight. She turned slightly towards the door. No, you all go on ahead. Dad turned slowly, tapping the folded flyer against his chin thoughtfully as he walked. His head hung down and his steps were slow. Frost had really done a number on him. Then again, she'd force-fed Tannen food for thought as well. He'd need some time to process everything, and a quiet place to do it in. Brody tugged on his sleeve, reminding him that there would be no peace until this guy had visions of sugar plums dancing in his head. Grab your coat. Brody broke into a run. Tannen watched him go, shaking his head. Where does he get the energy? They siphon it from their parents. Frost chewed her bottom lip. D 
Do you think your dad hates me? Tannen slid his arm around her shoulder. No one could hate you. You're much too perky for that. She poked him in the side. You're just saying that to make me feel better. Is that a bad thing? No, I appreciate the effort on my behalf. She leaned into him. You're kind of strong and solid, you know that? He didn't, but he liked that she thought so. I haven't worked out in ages. I can't tell. Her hand flattened against his back, sending his thoughts into a blur. Brody reappeared, his snow boots trumping loudly on the wood floors. His young jubilance broke through the lazy, hazy, romantic feeling that came on all too easy when he and Frost were alone. If he was going to take it slow with her, then he'd need to cool his thoughts. I think you forgot something. Frost pulled a knit hat out of her purse and matching mittens. She slid them on Brody's outstretched hands. They're warm. He clapped them together as she put the hat on his head. Tannen leaned forward and caught the letter K embroidered on the back of each of the gloves. What's that? Frost stammered. That's, uh, my family crest. Huh. I thought your last name started with a C. She lifted a shoulder and flipped around to open the door. Mom hadn't shown her face the whole time they were there, so Tannen sent her a text letting her know they were taking Brody. It was nice to have Brody along. He asked dozens of questions on the ride, everything from what a light parade was to how they keep all the extension cords plugged in. Frost giggled and explained about using car batteries to power the strands of lights. Tannen was happy to let them talk, he learned a lot. How do you know so much about electrical wiring? Oh, you know, when your sister is a master electrician, you pick up a few things at the dinner table. Frost blew on her fingernails and rubbed them against her shirt. You have a sister? I don't think I've heard you mention her before. You know all about Lou Bina. Lou Bina? That's almost as interesting a name as Frost. I would have thought you would be familiar with the name. It's a tree. What kind? The kind that makes incense. Oh, we don't grow those in Oregon. She giggled. I noticed. Tannen grinned. They turned off first north and onto Main Street, and it looked like the whole world lit up. Wow. Brody pressed his face and his mitten-clad hands to the back window. Tannen couldn't bring himself to scold the kid for getting nose prints on the glass. If he could press his face to the windshield, he would. He slowed down to three miles per hour. This is incredible. Frost positively beamed. I'm so glad you like it. She clapped her hands together in front of her. It took hours. Jin New York and her husband helped. He carved the nativity set. Tannen craned his neck to see the three wise men leading their camels into a store-sized stable with an open front. His mom was right, Main Street was like a movie set. The best, and only, movie set he'd ever seen. She scooted closer to him, her seat belt stretching as she peered across him. The camels are new. He must have worked on those this week and delivered them without telling me. She'd scat her tongue. I'm going to ask him to get the convertible here early. They can park it out at my house, that way I don't have to worry about bugging them closer to Christmas. She found her cell phone and started typing. Tannen's heart sank to think that Frost's family thought she was a bother. Sure, she was high energy, but that didn't mean she was a bother. What were you like as a child? She didn't look up from the screen. Shorter. He chuckled. Really? She hit send and put her phone in her lap. Really? I've always been one to plot grand schemes. I just don't usually have to pull them off on my own. Tannen laid his hand over hers. You're not alone. She looked down at their hands and then back up at him. Slowly, 
she turned her hand over and laced their fingers together. Tannen brought them up to his lips and kissed her skin. Her eyes crinkled at the corners, and his heart beat in his chest. No one seemed to mind that traffic moved so slowly and pedestrians passed them. The wide-eyed looks of wonder were enough to catch him in the Christmas spirit. A parking spot opened up two doors down from the smooth and minty, and he maneuvered the car into the spot. Brody scrambled out and opened Frost's door. Tannen shook his head at his little Casanova. Frost patted Brody's head, and they headed inside to wait their turn at the counter. The owner, a young woman named Fran with long, straight brown hair braided down her back and a slightly large nose, greeted them. What can I get for you? We'll take two hazelnut hot chocolates and one peppermint, Frost ordered. I love peppermint cocoa. Brody bounced. Who doesn't, replied Frost. Tannen put his hand on Frost's arm. Do you have a minute to talk about the light parade? Fran glanced at the line of people behind him and the three teenaged employees behind her running back and forth. Literally, a half a minute. Frost pulled a sheet out of her purse. We'd love it if you set up a cocoa stand. You could sell at your regular price points right in the middle of the street. She lifted a page and pointed. This is a request form. Basically, whatever you need for a booth, a table, lights, decorations, are provided. All you'll need to bring is your delicious cocoa and a till. Fran took the papers. Seriously? Yep, we'd be honored if you'd participate. In that case, I'm in. Their drinks arrived, delivered by a teenager with acne and bangs that had one eye. Frost lifted her glass. Wonderful. Just have that form to me by next week and I'll have your supplies in no time. Will do. Fran waved at them and welcomed the next person in line. Tannen pushed the door open. That was easy. Brody slipped under his arm, blowing across the small hole in his heat-safe cup. Let's hope Mrs. Grant is just as quick to agree. Frost also blew into her cup. They made their way down the street, weaving in and out of the people carrying bags and boxes. I don't think I've seen this many smiles in ages. Frost skipped a step. It's Christmas in action. You think? I know. When people focus on Christmas, on being with their loved ones and giving gifts that would make people happy, they feel better. Plus, there's something about sparkle that just lifts your mood, you know? She pushed open the bakery door. Tannen did know. Frost had sparkle in droves. If she could bottle her sparkle, she could sell it for millions. Women everywhere would pay to glitter as she did. Brody headed right for the display case, where cupcakes with frosting snowmen and stocking-shaped cookies were on display. He ooed and awed over them, asking Frost which was her favorite. They all look so good, but I have to say I'm partial to brownies. She fished another packet out of her purse. Your turn, she said as she shoved Tannen up to the counter. Feeling self-conscious, Tannen waited his turn in line. When he got to the front, Mrs. Grant narrowed her eyes. I wasn't expecting to see the likes of you in here, Tannen C. Boo. Not after the bomb you dropped at the mill this morning. Was that this morning? The day had taken so many twists and turns the company meeting felt like a whole different week. He shifted his weight. Mrs. Grant's three boys worked in the forests. They'd gotten degrees in arboriculture and come home to set up their families. If the mill closed, he would have single-handedly destroyed three families' incomes. Guilt was not a comfortable jacket to put on, but Tannen wore it anyway. Mrs. Grant had kneaded dough every day of her life to get those boys through school. He blew out a breath. Nothing set in stone, Mrs. Grant. Hopefully we'll come up with an answer that will satisfy everyone involved. He leaned slightly forward and held out the packet. But I'm not here to talk about the mill. 
It's the light parade I'm hoping to interest you in tonight. He went on to explain about the materials included and the expected turnout, which he made up on the spot. But after seeing the town's excitement over a few trees and lights, he was confident that the parade would have a record turnout. Well, if you're making it that easy, she begrudgingly took the packet from him. You're a regular Mrs. Claus. Tannen gave her his winning smile. She quirked her lips in reply. Frost and Brody approached, carrying several pastry boxes. Frost grinned sheepishly. We couldn't decide on one. Or ten, added Brody. So we decided to get them all. She set the boxes on the counter and reached for her purse. Tannen stilled her with his hand on her arm. I've got this. But. He leaned closer and whispered, let me. She swallowed, her head barely moving in a nod. He paid with a credit card and offered to carry the boxes back to the car. Mrs. Grant was much happier after having her stock cleared out in one sale. When Frost expressed her concern, Mrs. Grant promised she had more in the back and would put them out immediately. She took to Frost as quickly as Brody had. Brody opened the door and held it for them. Tannen stepped aside so Frost could go first. Oh! The mistletoe. Mrs. Grant pointed above their heads, where a sprig the size of a basketball hung in the doorway. It's tradition. Tannen's neck burned. He didn't have any qualms about kissing Frost again, but he wasn't happy to do it in front of Brody and an audience. Brody made gagging noises while pretending to choke on his mitten. Thanks, buddy. If Tannen had a free hand, he would have rubbed Brody's hat right off his head. Hurry, it's cold out here, said a woman waiting to get into the bakery. Her husband covered his laugh with a cough. You can go. Tannen stepped to the side. Nope, I'm not going to be responsible for breaking tradition. Elderberry needs more mistletoe kisses. She elbowed her hubby. He rubbed his side. Hey, I'll kiss you under the mistletoe. I'll kiss you right now. He leaned over and laid one on her cheek. She giggled. Come on, you too. Frost lifted on her tiptoes, leaning her hands against the boxes. Tannen stretched his neck to get over the sweet-smelling pastries, and their lips came together like two magnets finally linking up. He could swear he heard a click. And then he heard clapping. Prying his eyes open, he was met by a small group of shoppers who'd stopped to watch the show. Who's next? He called, and got a laugh. The husband and wife took Frost and Tannen's place under the mistletoe. He twirled her around, dipped her, and planted a kiss on her lips. The crowd cheered. I should have done that, he muttered. Frost leaned into him. I'm not complaining. She winked and then followed after Brody, who was halfway to the car. Tannen trailed behind, wondering what he'd ever done to be so lucky. With luck like this, he could be a very happy man. Chapter 24 The next morning Frost was on her way into work when her phone sang, You'd better watch out. Lux, she muttered as she hit the speaker button. Her sister enjoyed hacking into her phone and changing the ringtone to fit her mood. It all seemed like a lot of effort to make a phone call, especially when Lux's idea of dressing up was adding a scarf to her cargo pants and Captain America t-shirt. Although, since she'd married quick, the Avengers tees had slowly disappeared. Who needed to dream about a hot guy when you were married to one? How's my favorite sister? Frost tapped on her brakes so she wouldn't hit a picketer. They were back at the edge of the property, marching in a circle with their signs held high. And they were out early. She'd planned to arrive an hour before the first employee so she'd have time to work on the floor plan for the party. She braced herself and drove through the wall of distress and anger. That wasn't going to help Christmas spirit at the plant. Feeling a little tipsy here, Lux announced. Lay off the eggnog. 
That's not what I'm talking about. Frost could picture Lux pushing her glasses up her nose, exasperated with Frost for being purposely obtuse. All right, lay it on me. There was a power spike last night. One that fried the candy canes. Frost cringed at the mental image of the kitchen on fire. When Ginger and Lux had dated their future Mr. Kringles, too much togetherness sent Christmas magic all aflutter and they'd have power surges. Since true love fueled Christmas magic, they had to be careful. Lux had installed machinery to help regulate the power, but surges still happened because Christmas magic wasn't an exact science. Why hasn't Robin called? She said she was willing to sacrifice a batch of candy canes for your happiness. Ah, she's the best. Lux ground her teeth, the sound filling Frost's car. Frost, you've got to take this seriously. I am. Lux had no idea the number of Christmas ornaments she juggled. There was the party, the light parade, Tannen's parents, Tannen, Brody, and her duties as a personal assistant. Although, being an assistant was cake and took up so little time that she hardly thought of it as work. Plus, it allowed her to be near Tannen almost all day, and that was a pretty sweet deal. Really? Then why did you kiss Tannen? Who says it was Tannen? She quipped. Please don't make me tell you how I know. Frost panicked. Lux had married a man who was ex-army and smarter than a supercomputer. You put his brain with Lux's and they could pretty much conquer the world. Thank heavens you're on our side, Lux. I shudder to think what would happen if you went South Pole. Focus, Lux commanded. Why are you kissing Tannen? Because I like it. Plus, there was mistletoe and Christmas spirit involved. I didn't think it would light the kitchens on fire. She smirked. Okay, so maybe that's not that much of a surprise. Frost. Oh, like you're shocked. You and Quick are in crisis mode. We had to send Oliver to his grandparents because he kept sliding into the walls. Home is becoming dangerous. Frost tapped her fingers on the steering wheel. So what? I can't kiss him anymore? That's not what I'm saying. It sounds like what you're saying. What I'm saying, if anything, is be careful. Her tone softened as she continued, you're supposed to be getting him to believe in Christmas, not fall in love with you. Why can't he do both? He can. In fact, if he did, that would be great. But if he's doing all this because he loves you and not because he loves Christmas, then you can't come home. You're supposed to spread Christmas cheer. But Christmas would be okay, right, as long as we got married? Frost, a half victory is not a victory, it's a consolation prize. We need you here. Please, please try to come home. I miss my sister. Frost pouted. I miss you all too. I wish I was there, but there's a, uh, um, complication. Frost sighed. All right, what? So I thought it was elderberry and tannin that I had to, you know, infuse with Christmas, but I realized yesterday that the whole town went downhill when tannin's mom and dad, well, let's just say that I think they're the key to getting home, and they kind of hate me. Lux laughed. That's not possible. Oh, it's more than possible, it is. She ran her hand along her hair and now I've got to get them to turn away from the dark side and essentially heal the family wounds before the exile is lifted. Lux squeaked. Be careful. You're such a big sister. I've had practice. Merry Christmas, Lux. Wait! Joseph and Ginger can bring the car down this weekend. Merry Christmas, Frost. They hung up the phone, and Frost parked in the closest spot to the front doors. The building was dark and dreary. If she hurried, she could add some lights to the exterior of the building before anyone arrived. She glanced up at the roof. 
a reindeer would come in handy right about now. Instead of the roof, she settled for decorating the front doors. As she reached the end of the last bow, an envelope flipped out of her purse. She snatched it right out of the air. Clutching it to her heart, she made her way inside, opening the letter inside the elevator. This must have been Tannen's latest letter, the one that arrived while she was at work and had to hide from him. He'd come clean, telling her about Brody and reiterating how he felt about her, except this time he offered to pass on meeting her in favor of his son getting a taste of the Christmas magic they'd shared over the years. That was selfless and disheartening all at once. Where she'd been the object of his adoration for years, now he was willing to pass her on to his son like a favorite children's book. Perhaps he was falling for her, frost her, not Miss Kringle her, and that's why he was willing to let her go. Or maybe he was getting too old to believe in Santa and Santa's daughters. The thought hurt more than she cared to admit. She didn't want to give up Tannen either as Miss Kringle or as Frost, which was as twisted as one of Robin's signature candy canes. She sat down at her desk and checked the clock. She still had a half hour before anyone would arrive. Using her purse, she pulled out a sheet of North Pole paper and matching envelope. Dear Tannen, Thank you for your letter and for telling me about Brody. I've checked over his letters. He's a good kid and wants a laser target game for Christmas. I'm sure Santa will deliver, considering Brody is on the good list. She knew without logging into the system or having Ginger's naughty and nice list radar that Brody was a good kid and felt confident promising his wish would be fulfilled. I can't say I'm not disappointed you didn't tell me earlier. She was, but the feeling was tempered by the way Tannen had included her, as Frost, in their holiday traditions. At first, she'd been mad, offended, and hurt that he'd kept Brody from her, but having met his parents and discovered that there were emotional scars from his cancer that she'd never seen, her anger had been displaced by understanding. But I think, maybe, you were trying to save my feelings. She would have been devastated to know that Tannen had fallen for this other woman. She may have even stopped writing him back then. Not that honesty wasn't the best policy, but how could she judge him too harshly when he still didn't know her last name? Everyone lied about something, and they had good reasons. Or maybe that was just her head trying to convince her heart that keeping her identity a secret was worth it. At any rate, I'm not mad at you. I don't know about a Christmas Eve visit. You know I don't leave the North Pole except for extreme circumstances. But thank you for the invitation. Maybe one day we can meet, but for now, I need to focus on Christmas preparations. Know that I'll be thinking of you quite often. With love. Her pen hovered over the letter. She'd almost signed it with her first name. She wrote Miss Kringle with a flourish. Rereading the letter, she was pleased to note that nothing she'd said was a lie. Stretching the truth had been second nature when trying to hide their relationship, but she didn't want to do that anymore. She wanted things to be honest between them. As soon as her return home was secure, she'd confess everything. Later on that day, after Tim delivered the mail, Frost slipped her letter to Tannen in the stack she delivered to his desk. She pretended not to see his eyes light up at the same time he pretended not to be interested. She left him at his desk to read her words. Hopefully Tannen wouldn't be disappointed to find out his perfect Miss Kringle was just frost. Chapter 25 The days blurred together as Tannen threw himself into helping Frost plan the light parade and, yes, even the company party. She didn't do anything halfway. As soon as participation forms came in, she had a car full of supplies ready to deliver and included him and Brody as often as possible. Brody blossomed hauling boxes of lights and wreaths around town. He'd sing along with the music on the radio and could do an Elvis Blue Christmas imitation that had frost in stitches every time. The floats he'd seen didn't look like much in the light of day. Made from PVC piping wrapped in lights, they looked more like holiday skeletons than the wonder and awe frost promise they'd turn out to be. You need more imagination, she scolded him playfully. 
he pulled her close and nuzzled his nose against her warm cheek. I've got plenty of imagination. He'd kissed her then, and she'd melted against him like Frosty the Snowman on a spring afternoon. It was a good thing they spent most of their evenings over the last week in town, because things at home were difficult at best. Dad was quiet most of the time. Tannen would almost say he was depressed, except that he didn't have a sense of desperation about him, his mood was one of introspection. There was a commotion outside Tannen's office, and he made his way around the desk to see what was going on. In the middle of the cubicles was his father, shaking hands with David from accounting. It's good to see you two. He smiled, making his cheeks line deeply. Tannen blinked and then rubbed his eyes, thinking he could rub away the image, because he must be imagining his father at the mill. Dad said hello to a few more people on his way to Tannen. Frost got up to greet him. If she was surprised to see him, she didn't let it show. Tannen's ears were ringing as if a bomb had gone off in the building, so he didn't hear what they said. The next thing he knew, he was leaning against the front of his desk as Frost updated Dad on the parade. Sounds like you've got everything you need. Everything but a grand marshal. Frost winked at Tannen. He shook his head. She wasn't one to back away from the hard questions. He'd have to remember that about her. Well, that's what I've come to talk to you about. I'm flattered by the offer. Tannen held his breath. If his dad turned this down, it would be a final blow to their relationship and an admission that he couldn't move past Tannen's missing leg. Can we make a slight change? Frost folded one hand over the top of the other. And what would that be? I'd like to co-marshal with my family. He glanced at Tannen. All of them. I'd like us all to ride in the car together. I think it's time. Frost leaned back, pleased. I think we can make that change. If Tannen's willing. Tannen swallowed the emotion that clogged his throat. Trusting that his dad was sincere was harder than swallowing a ball of wrapping paper. I'd like that. Dad stuck out his hand. I look forward to it. Tannen took his hand, and they shook. Tannen was hit with the knowledge that he was taller than his dad. Didn't men shrink as they got older? Or had it been that long since he and his dad had looked one another in the eye? What a travesty. Tannen let go and leaned back again. What are your plans for the rest of the day? I have some shopping to do. Dad made his way to the door. I'll see you later. Tannen and Frost waved. Frost spun on her toes and looked up at him. I thought he was going to say no. I mean, I was hoping he'd say yes, but I thought he came in here to turn me down so I couldn't make a fuss. Tannen laughed and put his hands on her shoulders, kneading lightly. He surprised both of us, then. She cocked her head and her hip. But you're still mad at him. He dropped his hands. What do you mean? I felt it, when you shook hands. You were holding back, you don't trust him. Not quite. Tannen made his way around the desk, not enjoying the fact that she could read him so well. We have a long history to get over. She hummed. Well, Christmas is good for healing wounded hearts. He picked up a pen and tapped it against the desk. You seem to think that Christmas is the answer to all our problems. Not all of them. She headed for the door, her thin hips swaying. Only the one's laughter, time together, and love can solve. Well, there you go, he said after she'd cleared the doorway. She talked different than most people. He didn't know many, besides pastors and priests, who talked about hearts and forgiveness and love like Frost did. The words were part of her everyday vocabulary. He wished she'd tell him she loved him. He pulled up his chair and took a seat. Was this love? Had he fallen for his assistant? 
Or was he repeating the past and lapping up attention from a pretty girl who would leave him? He didn't want to think about Frost leaving. Yet, she'd talked about going home for Christmas. Maybe he would go with her. But she hadn't asked. He blew out a breath. The crazy thing was, he didn't even mind running the mill when she was around. The formerly drab office space had been brought to life by her decorations and unending optimism. There wasn't a problem that couldn't be solved when Frost was near. She saw challenges, not obstacles. And her cheer had spread. People talked over their cubicles now and still managed to get their work done. They decorated their spaces and brought in holiday-themed coffee mugs. As wonderful as all that was, it didn't get him at home with Brody. Nor did it dispel the picketers out front. They'd gotten noticed on the local news, and the story had been carried as far away as Washington. He checked the calendar on his desktop. The representatives from the Winnipeg Paper Company would be here in one week. He had work to do if he was going to convince them to take over the mill. Putting his head down, he got to work. Chapter 26 At the North Pole, Frost could sit for hours. And she would, plowing through letters as if they were mounds of chocolate and she'd been starving. But at the bison paper mill, she hardly had a moment to spend in her chair. Instead of reading wonderful government letters and regulations, she was selected to accompany the representatives from the Winnipeg Paper Company a tour of the office. The five men looked like they'd come out of a copy machine with their navy pinstripe suites, white shirts, and red ties. They all had the same haircut and the same shiny shoes. The only one who stood out was Mr. Paul. He was broader in the chest and shoulders and walked two steps ahead of his entourage. There was no doubt who was in charge, because he wouldn't let them forget. Alfred was the one conducting the tour. He'd worked for Bison for over twenty years and knew every inch of the operations. And, he managed to walk the fine line of giving a thorough tour without giving away trade secrets. Frost hadn't even thought of such a thing, Tannen explained it to her and Brody the night before over bowls of broccoli and cheddar soup. At the rate they were exposing Brody to the mill and all things parade planning, he'd be able to open his own business at thirteen. He'd certainly understood the idea that someone would come for a tour with less than honest intentions. If you don't trust them, why are you letting them inside the mill? Frost had asked. It's not that I don't trust them at all, it's that I don't trust them completely. Tannen handed Brody a napkin to wipe the soup off his chin. He did, setting his napkin in his lap like he'd been taught on another night when they'd eaten at Mrs. Grant's bakery. Mrs. Grant had thawed after Tannen and Frost kissed under the mistletoe, and she enjoyed teasing them about their shyness that first night, taking credit for the two of them being together as if her mistletoe was magic. Trust isn't something that comes in a measuring cup so you can serve the right amount, Frost protested. Tannen blew on a spoonful of soup. All I'm saying is that until they prove themselves trustworthy, we keep them at arm's length. Like you did with me when we first met. She bumped him. In my defense, you were weird. Frost giggled. Oh, like you're normal. Hey, just because I'm one-legged. She smacked his arm. That's not what I mean and you know it. His eyes filled with love so strong it was hard for her to look away. He'd been doing that a lot lately, and there were times when Frost lost herself in that look. It was hard not to when she felt his love on top of her love for him, like swimming in a chocolate fountain. She brought her attention away from the sweet memories of the night before and back to the boring, though necessary tour. They entered the gathering room, where the Christmas party would be held. She had just a few days left to finish decorating but wanted the final product to be a surprise. Grandma and Grandpa Kringle were all lined up to play Santa and Mrs. Claus, not a big stretch for the retired man in the red suit. They were going to blow the kids away. Grandpa could still pick a child's name out of thin air, and his naughty and nice radar was as strong as ever. They were also bringing all the goodies Mom had promised. 
She had to bake in the family oven to stay out of Robin's way, but promised a feast even the Who's would be proud of, minus the roast beast. The DJ's corner was decked out with a large archway wrapped in pine boughs and red ribbons and lights. She'd turned it on last night and Tannen kissed her right there in the middle. She could only imagine the power surge that caused. There seems to be a lot of Christmas cheer around town, said Mr. Paul. Thank you. Frost went right ahead and took credit. The town was buzzing with plans for the light parade. A family had signed up to sell roasted almonds. Apparently, they used to do this every year to raise holiday money and were excited to pull their equipment out of storage. Hopefully it all worked well and the street wouldn't smell like burnt nuts. That was his last name, Paul. Frost knew there were a few Pauls in Canada, but she hadn't gotten a letter from that last name in a while. She checked Mr. Paul's ring finger and found it bare. He'd winked at her, and she'd been mortified to think he thought she was checking him out. She'd put distance between them, not wanting to explain why she wasn't interested. The whole thing was uncomfortable at best. Mr. Paul laughed like she'd said something truly funny. And I thought Canadians were Christmas crazy. Frost painted on a smile. It just goes to show you that Elderberry isn't that far from home for you. Tell me, Miss Cratchit, Mr. Paul went on, but Frost cringed at the name. Tannen hadn't called her that in weeks, and when he'd introduced her to the group using a fake name, guilt plagued her conscience. Are you planning to stay with the mill when it's sold? He glanced over her red and white chevron blouse and matching red pencil skirt. She wore a green belt and matching shoes. I'm Mr. Cebu's assistant. I go where he goes. Pity. He looked away, clearly put off by her answer. Alfred finished up the tour. Frost acted as though she hadn't heard Mr. Paul's comment. We have a light lunch ready for you in Mr. Cebu's office, if you'd like to follow me. She motioned for them to follow and tried not to shiver at the feeling of Mr. Paul's eyes on her assets. Stella would know just how to put him in his place. Frost closed her eyes and tried to channel her sister. Nothing came to mind, and she silently berated Stella for letting her down. Maybe she should have gone to a club or two when invited so she could have seen Stella in action instead of hearing the stories later. With six of them in the elevator, personal space was hard to come by. Still, Frost pulled into the corner, trying to avoid Mr. Paul. He leaned close and said, you smell delectable. Scented lotion, she offered without taking her eyes off the numbers slowly lighting up in succession above their heads. He leaned over so his nose was almost touching her neck and breathed deeply. It's intoxicating. Frost's skin crawled with the feeling she was getting off of Mr. Paul, they were lusty and like tiny spiders all over her skin. She glanced around, hoping one of his minions would step in, but they were politely ignoring the exchange. The doors whooshed open and she bolted for the safety of the cubicles. I'll send a link to your assistant. Barbara, isn't it? Yes, Barbara. His answer was far enough behind her that it sounded small, like him. A small mind and a small heart. Frost slowed her feet, taking in holiday happy feelings as she could get them. The cubicles were tense, the people still worried about their jobs. They were pleased to see the buyers touring the facility, though. Everyone knew they were from another mill and not a logging company. Their hopes were high, and she had just brushed off the source of their hope for an easy buyout. Mr. Paul was a guest, and she needed to treat him well for the sake of Bison employees and Tannen. She couldn't afford, for Tannen's sake, to mess this up. He needed a win. We're back, she sing-songed as she entered his office. Delicious aromas wafted through the air. The paper snowflakes she'd hung from the ceiling swayed slightly as the heater kicked on. Along the windows overlooking the parking lot and the hills behind were two tables full of food. Mrs. Grant had catered three types of soup, soup bowls, and enough brownies and cookies to keep the letters elves happy for a week. Tannen got up from his desk. Good. 
I'm starving, he said, low for just Frost to hear. He hadn't gone on the tour because he had an important conference call with another potential buyer. From the downcast lines on Tannen's face, Frost guessed the conversation hadn't gone as well as he'd hoped. Which was all the more reason for her to be friendlier, which would be much easier now that Tannen was in the room and she wouldn't have to worry about Mr. Paul's wandering eyes. The group went through the buffet and took up their seats at the folding table Frost had covered with a navy tablecloth and decorated with silver accents. Not the classic Christmas colors, but she could appreciate the simple elegance and the darker navy set of the white snowflakes. She eyed them critically and decided silver glitter would not be amiss. After the group exclaimed upon how delicious the food was, Mr. Paul turned to Tannen. I know how much you want for bison, but what would it cost me to steal away your enchanting assistant? Tannen's spoon missed his mouth and spilled all over his dress shirt. Frost handed him a napkin and kept her glare away from Mr. Paul. She had a hard enough time liking the man when he spoke to her. When he spoke about her as if she were a Christmas goose for sale, she downright loathed him. She took a long drink of cranberry punch. Tannen swiped at his shirt, managing to look completely at ease and gorgeous as he did so. I have as much of a say in Ms. Cratchit's future as Santa Claus. Frost choked on her drink. She covered her mouth with a napkin and managed to draw in a breath without sounding like an asthmatic reindeer. You'll have to ask her. He turned towards Frost, and his expression morphed into one of concern. She must look a fright. Her eyes watered and stung and her cheeks were warm, but that could be because Tannen's fingers were on her knee. Fine. She cleared her throat. Fine. What was the question? I'd like to you fly away with me, said Mr. Paul with a grin that would have scared a snake. The pressure from Tannen's fingers doubled as he suddenly understood Mr. Paul's objective. Frost couldn't let him ruin the chances of selling the mill, not when things had gone so smoothly and Winnipeg had the means to make the purchase before the new year. I'm sorry, Mr. Paul. But I'm quite loyal. Even better, you can work for me after the purchase goes through. I plan to oversee the transition personally. I like to keep my hands on the assets. He popped a piece of cookie in his mouth and winked at her. Frost smiled sweetly. You may purchase the company, but you'll never get your hands on these assets. He swiped the corner of his mouth with his thumb. I'll take that as a challenge. Tannen came up out of his chair. You'd do better to take it as a shot down. The edge of Tannen's jaw grew hard and sharp. If Frost hadn't been so worried about saving this deal, she would have taken a moment to admire his raw masculinity. Then again, what good would she do the people of Elderberry if she left them at the mercy of this man whose heart was an empty hole? I don't get shot down. Unlike you, women flock to my good looks and charm. He ran his hand over his full head of hair, clearly insulting Tannen. Something inside of Frost reared up. If she had to put a face to it, then it would be the face of an abominable snowman with a toothache. She'd never felt anything so strong nor so, so fierce in all her life. She got to her feet, wanting to look down on the man as she spoke. If women flock to you, it's because they are like ducks in a pond looking for a free handout. Which I'm sure you're happy to provide, because you're a rotter and an eel. I am not desperate enough, nor stupid enough, to consider a man like you for even an evening's worth of my time. Small movement caught her eye, and Frost looked over Mr. Paul's head to see one of his minions clapping silently. Mr. Paul twisted one side of his mouth in amusement. You're right, they probably are looking for a handout. And I do provide. But in exchange, so do they. Get out, growled Tannen. His brow was low and his teeth bared. We're done here. Mr. Paul's face was as serene as a chocolate Santa's and as immovable. You don't mean that, see Boo. You said yourself you're motivated to sell. Motivated, not desperate. Mr. Paul got to his feet. 
could have fooled me. He buttoned his suit and strode towards the door. He motioned for his minions to leave. They set aside their half-eaten lunches and headed for the door without a word. Tannen used his desk phone to ask security to make sure they were shown out. Why do his people follow him around like that? They hardly said a word on the tour. She was baffled by their behavior as much as Mr. Paul's. They could be robots he built so he'd have friends, said Tannen. Frost grinned. You'd think he'd program personalities. Nah, because then we'd like them better than him. Tannen touched her side, and she slid closer, loving the feel of his arms. You were pretty ticked off there, Miss Christmas Cheer. He lightly kissed the tip of her nose. I wasn't the only one, you polar bear. Yeah, but people are used to seeing me angry. She ran her fingers over his smooth forehead. When she'd first arrived, he had deep lines in his face. Not anymore. Not since you came into my life. You brought Christmas back into my heart, you've made me a better man. He brought his forehead down to touch hers and wrapped her in his arms. I think I've fallen in love with you, Frost. There were a hundred reasons for Frost to run away, and only one big reason to stay. I love you too. Tannen's lips found hers and they shared a warm, tender, long kiss. If the way her heart lifted and turtle doves flew about in her stomach were any indication, then the North Pole would have flipped completely upside down. Tannen was all she'd ever hoped for, and kissing him, knowing he loved her, was a thousand Christmas wishes come true. That evening, they sat around the Cebu dining room table, decorating sugar cookies with Brody. Frost hadn't seen either of Tannen's parents since Donald visited the mill almost two weeks ago. It seemed every time she stepped through the front door they hid away. She didn't like that very much. Maybe it was the cringle in her, but she wanted people to like her and she wanted Tannen's family to like her even more. And yet, there was a spicy part of her that was grateful she didn't have to see them, because she was abominably mad at them for wanting to take Brody away from Tannen. At home, she was considered the sweetest sister, the one who never made trouble or had a bad thought about another Kringle. But the more she was away from the letter's room, the more she realized that her disposition was from a lack of association. It was easy to love her family, even the new brothers-in-law fit into the group and gelled quickly despite the weird things her family did, like fly sleighs, eat Christmas fudge year-round, and consider pine cones decorations. There was more spice to her than she had ever known, and most of it came out when Tannen was threatened, hurt, or offended, all of which his parents had accomplished the day they'd offered to adopt Brody. Still, they were Brody's grandparents and he loved them. Expressing her negative thoughts would only confuse him and perhaps make him feel as though he needed to choose between them. Which was why, even though she would have preferred to decorate cookies at her house, she agreed to do it here. Why did we make bell cookies? Brody smeared yellow frosting across the cookie while making a face. They aren't very Christmassy. Frost gasped and pressed her palm to her chest dramatically. Clearly you've never been to England for Christmas. Brody giggled at her antics. Nope. She playfully swatted Tannen's arm. And you call yourself a father. He laughed. Yes, because all fathers take their children overseas for the holidays. He said the last bit in a snooty British accent. What happens in England? asked Brody. Well, Frost used a tube of green frosting to add a stripe to the bell just above the curve. She then reached for the red to add holly berries. At exactly midnight on Christmas Eve, all the bells in the city ring out wildly to pronounce Christmas has come once again. It's chaotic and yet beautiful. She paused, remembering back to the night when she was fifteen and Ginger and Stella convinced her to leave the letters room and experience the sound of churches calling Christians to midnight mass. The air was crisp and held their breath like a promise. Vendors lined the streets, selling everything from warm cider to mince pies. Warm scarves covered faces, but smiles could be seen in the eyes of people passing. 
Frost had linked arms with both her older sisters, floating along on the holiday chair and wishing strangers a happy Christmas. Life was simple and simply beautiful that night. She leaned closer to Brody, wanting to share some of the magic. Santa can hear the bells from the sleigh. Brody tipped his head. He can? Yep. The bells help to keep her on schedule, and they've been doing it for hundreds of years. Brody picked up another bell cookie, holding it carefully in his hands as he stuck his tongue out the side of his mouth in concentration so he got the frosting just right. Tannen was looking at her, but she couldn't meet his eye. She'd slipped up and said her instead of him when talking about Santa. Of course he knew about Ginger taking over the big sleigh, but he didn't know she knew. Here. This cookie will be for your grandma. She handed Brody an angel cookie. If you'll cover her in white, I'll add blue accents and a halo. Brody took to his task. Tannen finished slathering a reindeer cookie with chocolate frosting, broke off the head, and popped it into his mouth. You're eating more than you're decorating, she scolded him. I can't compete with you two. He waved his arm over the completed cookies. Even Mrs. Grant would be impressed with your skills. Frost blushed. This is nothing. My mom can make them look like they belong in a museum. Tell me more about her. Tannen ate the reindeer belly. Frost frowned for just a moment. She oversees our family's holdings and is pretty shrewd, and yet she's always fair. Her first priority is creating jobs for women, single mothers especially, because being a mom is the hardest job in the world. Agree to disagree. Tannen winked at her. I suppose you think being a father is the hardest job, she challenged. I was going to say Sherpa. Frost lifted her eyebrows. Have you seen those documentaries on climbing Everest? He shuddered. There's a dozen different ways to die on a trip like that. Frost was about to respond when Donald's voice interrupted. I would agree with Frost. Being a father is the hardest job in the world. She whipped around in her seat to see Donald and Mary standing in the doorway. Do you mind if we join you? asked Mary. Of course not, answered Tannen. Frost slid a plate of undecorated cookies their direction. Just grab whatever you need. She pointed to the frosting bowls and tubes with decorative tips. Speaking of mountain climbing, she felt like she was walking over one of those ice shelves that could give way at any minute. You have enough here to decorate twelve dozen cookies. Mary selected a rocking horse cookie and went to work. I had to stop her from baking more. Tannen winked her direction as he finished off the reindeer. Well, the way they keep disappearing, you should have let me bake more. What are they for? asked Donald. Frost concentrated on adding feathers to the angel's wings. The company Christmas party. She felt more than saw the CE bus exchange glances. All this work for the company party? Mary prodded. We're trying to keep costs down, Tannen explained. And this way, Brody gets to help. Brody nodded. I wanted to make snowflakes with Frost, but she had them all made. Don't worry. We'll get quality time with paper and scissors soon. Donald cleared his throat. We've been talking about your invitation to the parade. That brought Frost's head up. She forgot to stop squeezing and ended up leaving a long blue trail of frosting across the whole angel. Have you decided, then? She handed the ruined cookie to Tannen with a might-as-well look. He bit off the end of the wing with glee, making her roll her eyes. Donald glanced at Mary. We've decided that we'd like to do it. He paused, adding ten pounds to his next words. As a family. Tannen stopped chewing and swallowed heavily. What you said, Donald told Frost, about being stuck in the past was true. Mary leaned forward. We were afraid to move on to believe it would work out okay, because, well, that made us vulnerable. 
she muttered the last word as if afraid to say it out loud. No, not fear. Fear was like tiny ice darts. This was different. This was shame squiggling out of her like gummy worms. Frost's first reaction was that they should absolutely feel shame for what they'd done to their son. But then her sugar side jumped up in their defense. They had honestly done their best, and what they'd gone through, well, it was an unspeakable horror. The kind of thing that mutilated a person on the inside. Just because they still had their legs didn't mean that they were whole on the inside. She needed to give them room to be human. I'd like to make a new memory with my son. Donald kept his chin down, like he was expecting a blow. Frost focused on Tannen, on his feelings. She was getting better at singling him out, and thankfully, his emotions were stable and mostly upbeat. Now, he was in turmoil, a blender of mistrust, anger, hope, and love. She placed a hand on his, hoping to instill some of her understanding in him. I think that would be nice. The very room sighed in relief. Brody hopped up. We're going to be in the parade. His little face was so full of expectation that it spread throughout the room, infusing all of them and further relieving the tension. Tannen Play punched him in the arm. Yep. Frost too. Frost's mouth dropped open. I don't want to presume. Mary smiled tentatively at Frost. You're here as much as Tannen. I think it would be appropriate if you were there. Frost smiled in return. Mary was still holding back judgment of her as a possible daughter-in-law, but she was back to being the polite hostess. Some would say that was progress. Some would say it was a trap. Frost wasn't sure who to believe. And this was a big healing moment for old wounds. She didn't want to get in the way of that. Thank you so much for the offer, but since I'm organizing the parade, I'm needed elsewhere. Of course. Mary's smile still didn't reach her eyes, and Frost wondered what it would take to make her truly happy, to shut down all the old wounds and allow for happy memories to be made at Christmas time. Sparklers lit up her brain as if Christmas magic poured understanding into her head. It wasn't the town or tannin that needed a hefty dose of Christmas healing, it was his parents. They were the ones Christmas magic wanted her to make jolly. She looked back and forth between the two CE bus. How in the name of Santa was she supposed to get these two grim creatures in the Christmas mood? Donald chomped off one point of a star. He made happy eating sounds. These are really good. Thanks. It's my grandma's recipe. She tried to feel what he was feeling, see if there was any hope for Christmas. All she met was a wall. A red brick wall. Oh. You know, come to think of it, I don't think we know your family. Frost giggled. Everyone knew her family, they just didn't know they knew her family. My grandparents are coming for the Christmas party. They'll be PL, she glanced across the table at Brody. They're Santa's special helpers. Understanding dawned on the adults' faces. Tannen winked, and her heart did a loop. You should come. I'd love for you to meet them. And maybe Grandpa can use some of his naughty and nice radar to figure out Mary. That would be nice. Mary finished her cookie and moved on to a stocking. She started by adding white to the heels and toes. She was much easier to read than her husband because she was a giant stay-out sign in neon green. Was there any way for the dragon-thick scales to fall away from her heart? Donald seemed as happy as Tannen to consume instead of produce. That was fine. She'd planned on making more once she got home anyway. As she looked around the table, she couldn't help but smile at the picture they made. If there was any way to get inside Donald's and Mary's hearts, it was through Brody. Tannen leaned close and spoke low. Donald was giving his opinion on Brody's snowman, and Mary was busy adding finishing touches to the stocking. Why are you grinning? he asked. 
Frost lifted her shoulders. This feels a lot like a holly jolly Christmas. Tannen lifted her hand and kissed the back. Thanks to you. You brought Christmas into my heart, Frost. She cupped his cheek, tears gathering on her lashes. You couldn't give me a better compliment. How about this? He brushed his lips across hers, sending merry shivers down her back. That's pretty great, too. She laid her head on his shoulder, reveling in the knowledge that she'd done what she came here to do, she'd given Tannen Christmas. She'd spread Christmas cheer all over Elderberry. And she'd fallen in love. There were a few things left on her list, Donald and Mary riding in the parade was at the top. She couldn't rest until they were in the back of that convertible riding down Main Street. Her whole being knew that that was what Christmas magic was waiting for. The second thing on her list was telling Tannen who she really was and convincing him to get married before Christmas Day. Piece of Fruit Cake Chapter 27 The Friday before Christmas was full of frenzied last-minute details for the company party. Tannen's cheeks were going to hurt from smiling so much. They had twenty minutes to go before the party officially began, and Frost's grandparents weren't here yet. He stood outside the bay door, ready to pull it up when they arrived. Frost said they had a sleigh to bring in, and there was no way it was getting through the front doors. Snow fell all around, the flakes as big as his fingertips and as perfect as a Christmas movie. He didn't feel the cold air, he was too happy. In his pocket was a diamond ring. Was it silly to believe he could love Frost for the rest of his life? Maybe, but since he almost died once, he didn't see the need to waste time on frivolous things like conventional expectations. He was smart enough to know that when he found someone that made him happy, he should put a ring on her finger and start the rest of his life. He checked his watch, ten minutes to go. When he looked up, he was staring a reindeer in the face. He blinked several times, wondering if someone had already spiked the punch he'd sampled earlier. The animal had gray around his muzzle and velvety antlers. A ho-ho-ho had him leaning around the reindeer to see a tan Santa and Mrs. Claus waving from the seat of a stunning red sleigh. Somewhere in his memory was the thought that her grandparents had retired to Mexico. He smiled, his heart lifting like a child's on Christmas morning. Waving, he stepped around his fuzzy friend and approached the sleigh. You must be Frost's grandparents. He chuckled. Call us the Kringles. Santa held out a mitten-covered hand, and they shook. For an old guy, he had a strong grip. Tannen couldn't help but think of Miss Kringle. He hadn't heard from her in over a week, and he hadn't written in more time than that. They were drifting apart. Or maybe he was outgrowing the need for a pen pal to share his secrets. Mrs. Kringle took his hand between hers and clasped tightly. It's wonderful to meet you, Tannen. My, but you are handsome. Tannen's face burned. He'd never had a stranger tell him that before. Frost had told him, but not until after they'd gotten to know one another. Still, he didn't doubt that she found him attractive, because she made him feel like he could climb the Matterhorn. It's a pleasure to meet you too. He glanced at the reindeer. I'm not sure we can bring him inside. Oh, that's all right. I'll take his harness off. Will he wander away? Santa laughed, grabbing his belly as it shook like a bowl full of jelly. This guy was good. No wonder Frost was in love with the holidays, having a Santa look-alike for a grandparent. Not if I leave this out here. Santa picked up a bucket of oats and set it next to the building. He doesn't like to get too far from his food. I can't say I blame him for that. I haven't wanted to get far from Frost's cookies this week. He turned to Mrs. Kringle. Which I hear is your recipe. Mr. Kringle unhitched the reindeer and led him to the bucket of grain. She smiled wide, causing her cheeks to pull back like a set of curtains with perfectly spaced lines. There's none better. Now, 
she took his arm. Why don't you open that door and give us a little push? Tannen agreed quickly and pulled the thick rope that lifted the door high enough for the sled to go through. Mr. Kringle met him at the back. Tannen glanced down at his prosthetic. He positioned his shoulder against the back of the sleigh so that he could brace himself with his good leg. On the count of three. One. Two. Three. They shoved, and the sleigh glided across the snow and onto the concrete floor, drawing the attention of Frost, Zuzu, and Tim, who were putting the finishing touches on the decorations. Frost had outdone herself making paper snowflakes from the large rolls. She'd made them in all sizes and spent hours last night hanging them up. With the white fairy lights draped across the ceiling, the room looked like a winter wonderland. Grandma! Frost ran across the floor as fast as her heels would take her. She wore a fitted red dress with a ruffle that landed just above her knees and a matching jacket with a ruffled collar. The clothes were simple and yet drew attention. Well, they drew his attention. And the red set off her white hair beautifully. As she hugged her grandparents, he could see the family resemblance in everything except for her eyes, those were unique. Tannen was about to shut the door when he heard the jingle of sleigh bells. He ducked down a bit and saw another sleigh park next to the first reindeer. Tannen blinked, wondering if they double-booked Santas. Instead of a jolly old elf, out climbed a woman in black pants with a large bow at the waist and a red blouse with a wide collar. Her brown hair was neat and she had a corporate look about her. Mom. Frost threw herself out into the snow and her mother's waiting arms. They rocked side to side, laughing and crying and talking about a hundred things at once. Tannen couldn't keep up with their conversation, but he caught words like Christmas, factory, power conductor, and secret. Finally Frost asked, Can I come home? Her mom shook her head sadly. Not yet, sugar. Frost's face fell. The look only lasted a moment, and then she pulled her smile back up. You got here just in time, we need to set up the food. Frost grabbed several pastry boxes and turned to find him watching them. She giggled. Mom, this is Tannen Cebu, the one I told you about. Tannen, this is my mother, Gail. It's a pleasure to meet you. Tannen shook Gail's hand and offered to bring in the rest of the goodies. We need to get this door shut or our heating bill will double, he joked. Gail joined the group inside, getting right to work. She seemed like the type of woman who jumped right in with both feet, confident she'd land right where she'd planned to land. Tannen set the pastry boxes down on one end of the table. I see where you got your ability to work fast. He spoke for just Frost, who was stacking brownies in a pyramid. They smelled of rich chocolate and cream cheese frosting and had crushed peppermint pieces on top. Frost shook her head, her long white waves bouncing slightly. If you think she's fast, you should see my dad. Tannen stepped back to let the ladies get things done. They kept reaching over him to work, and he felt like he was in the way. Employees began to trickle in. They hovered around the edge of the room, looking up at the snowflakes and whispering. He understood how they felt, there was magic in the air, and no one wanted to be the one to chase it away. We're ready to start. You should say a few words. Frost nudged him towards the DJ station and the microphone. Tannen cleared his throat. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Bison Paper's annual Christmas party. His words were met with polite clapping. I know I'm not the world's most popular boss lately. Crickets. Sweat broke out on his forehead. I'm sure the water cooler conversations have filled you all and that the meeting with Winnipeg didn't go well. He glanced at Frost, who was standing next to her mom but I couldn't sell the company to someone I didn't feel would treat the employees here with respect. 
Tannen looked around the room at the men and women in worn jeans and faded tees who spent their days among the trees, the ones in steel-toed boots who kept the warehouse running, and the ones in slacks and skirts who sold paper and marketed their product. I've known most of you for a good portion of my life. We grew up together. While I still want to sell the mill, I also want you to know that I care for you. I won't toss you aside for my own gain. His mom and dad made their way to the front of the group, Brody standing between them. We're a family, here at Bison, and we watch out for one another. That's what families do, and that's my pledge to you this holiday season. The room was quiet, but not with the uncomfortable quiet that had met him when he'd first taken the mic, this was a quiet acceptance that warmed Tannen's heart. Families also celebrate together. He smiled. We have all the makings of a wonderful party here, I think we should get it started. DJ, let's rock. Tannen handed the mic back to the man in charge of keeping them dancing. A sassy saxophone intro filled the room and the DJ gave him a thumbs up. Frost approached, a huge smile on her face. You did great. I sounded like a moron. Let's rock. What am I, twelve? Frost giggled. I liked it. Hey, Frost, called Zuzu. Where's the extra punch? We're running through it pretty fast. Frost wrinkled her nose. I've got to go, I'm on party duty. Save me a dance? Of course. He didn't bother to tell her he couldn't dance, because he had the feeling she'd make him anyway. And for her, he would. For now, he needed to mingle. Frost worked alongside her mother, reveling in having her family around her. You look happy, said Mom. I'm so glad you're here. Frost gave her a one-armed side hug, her right hand adding chocolates to the three-tiered frosted glass stand. You miss us? I miss you all so much, I would have even been happy to see Max. Frost laughed. And I'm still mad at him for abandoning me in the woods. Mom chuckled. I'm sure he's sorry. He will be when I get back and ration his carrots, Frost teased. After a moment, the fun went out of her joke and she slumped. I think I'm ready to come home. Mom's hand stilled. I asked Ginger before I came down. I wanted to bring you home with me. She swallowed the emotions rising in her throat. Frost could feel them, the regret, the sorrow, the heartache that came from missing her youngest daughter. She flew over here the other night and says there's still something missing. Your job here isn't done. Frost sniffed and nodded. Have her fly by again tonight, please? The party will help. I know it has. The town has come together, and after Tannen's speech, goodwill to men has gone up fifty-fold. Mom put her arm around Frost's shoulders. I can feel it too. She pushed Frost out to arm's length to look her over. Look at you. Look at what you've done. I'm so proud of you, Frost. You've gone from a shy bookworm to a confident, strong woman who is a force for good. Frost leaned her head on her mom's shoulder. Even though moms were supposed to say things like that, Gail hadn't said anything like that to her before. Oh, Frost knew she was loved, but maybe sitting in letters all day, okay, hiding in letters, hadn't given her the opportunity to grow and expand. She'd been forced from her comfort zone and, taking in the happy faces and peace in the room, she knew she was capable of more. I think I'd like to intern with you for a while, Mom. If that's okay with you. Mom squeezed her once more. I'd like that. Zuzu ran up, her face as red as her frizzy curls. We need more divinity. Frost loved the way she said this as if it were a crisis of mass proportions. I'm on it. She hurried out to the kitchen, wondering what on earth she could do to kick Christmas spirit in the pants so she could get home. Tannen worked his way through the crowd, shaking hands, 
cooing over babies, and wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. People told him how they appreciated his speech, appreciated the fact that he hadn't taken the easy sell. He was floating pretty high when Mr. Cratchit stepped up, his hat in his hands once again. Mr. C. Boo, I need to apologize for my daughter. His head hung low. Tannen clapped him on the shoulder. I can't imagine why. She's done an amazing job. I couldn't ask for a better assistant. Mr. Cratchit lifted his head, squinting up at Tannen. But she didn't show up. I'm sorry? Tannen leaned closer, sure he hadn't heard Cratchit right. I told her all about the job and she said she'd come, but she talked to one of the picketers and decided she didn't want to work for you. I'm real sorry she left you in a lurch like that, and I hope you won't take it personal. She's young and... Tannen held up a hand. The room was spinning, or maybe he was spinning, or perhaps it was just his head trying to process information that didn't make any sense. Are you saying your daughter never came to my office? Yes, sir. Tannen put his arm around Cratchit and turned him to face the buffet tables, where Frost was putting out more of her amazing cookies. That's not your daughter? Cratchit shook his head. He pointed off to the left at a woman who looked a lot like her father, her ears even poked out. That's my Karen. Tannen leaned into Cratchit for support. Then who is that? he asked, pointing at Frost. Cratchit looked at him in alarm, and Tannen realized he needed to let the man go, this was not his concern. Never mind. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cratchit. Don't forget to get your picture taken with Santa. Cratchit stepped away from him slowly, as if he were afraid Tannen would topple over. He might, he needed something solid to hang on to. Frost, if that was even her real name, had lied to him. Lied from the first day they met. He swiped at the moisture on his forehead just as another employee stepped up to shake his hand. Tannen smiled, said the right things, at least, he hoped so, and tried not to think about what else Frost had lied about. The kisses? Loving him? He snorted, drawing attention from a woman holding a baby. Moving to another area, he tried to find a place to disappear. Brody's mom had said she loved him too, and she'd left. You don't leave people you love, so he knew she'd lied then. He stumbled over a folding chair but managed to keep himself from falling to the floor. That would look lovely, the CEO sprawled out on the floor at the Christmas party. He needed to get a grip. Ducking behind a tree, he took a breath and straightened his back. Realizing he was by the sleigh, he fixed his tie and decided the only thing he could do was have an honest conversation with Frost. He found her quickly, but one look at her sweet face and he lost his bluster. I'm here to steal you for a dance. Frost giggled. I think I can fit you in, but if we run out of baklava, I'm blaming it on you. His only response was to usher her to a not-so-crowded corner of the room. He put his arms lightly around her, only touching her as much as needed to lead her through the dance. She fit so nicely against him that his heart crumbled thinking that this was all a lie. I had an interesting conversation with Mr. Cratchit. Frost's body went stiff. Oh. Yes. He looked down at her, wanting to see if the lies were written on her face this whole time and he hadn't seen them because he'd been a fool. Love had made a fool of him before, he wouldn't let it happen again. Who are you, really? Caught off guard by the pain in Tannen's voice, Frost bit her lip to keep from telling him everything. How she longed to tell him that she was his pen pal from long ago, his best friend always, and the woman who loved him with all her heart. She desperately wanted to spill everything from her name to the way the magic worked. He would accept her, and the crazy family she came from, and living at the North Pole and all that went with becoming a Kringle, because he wanted to believe. He was waiting for her to make it all okay, to explain her deception in such a way that his heart could stay in one piece. She couldn't. 
It was imperative that Tannen and the town of Elderberry celebrate the true meaning of Christmas at the light parade, that they feel love for all mankind and a tenderness for their family that they didn't feel the rest of the year. The light parade was crucial. It was the event that Mr. and Mrs. C. Boo had funded out of the goodness of their hearts back when Christmas was important to them. Their participation in the parade was the key that would unlock all the Christmas magic that had been sealed up all those years ago. Tannen was a part of that now, and Brody too. They all had to be there, believing. Tannen's parents weren't quite there yet, but the parade would tip them over the edge. If she didn't wait until the parade to reveal all of herself and Christmas to the Cebu family, she would never get home. She'd never share Thanksgiving dinner around the dining room table, she'd lose movie nights with Lux, designing doll clothes for Stella's production machines, ice climbing with Ginger, makeovers with Robin, eating brownies right from the pan with her mom, dressing her brothers-in-law for Halloween, reading in the library with Dad, and babysitting Layla and Oliver. She briefly met Tannen's probing gaze and was overwhelmed with her love for him. Her insides pulled in all directions. It wasn't supposed to happen like this, she whispered. Tannen leaned closer. What do you mean? I wasn't supposed to have to choose. Choose what? I don't understand. If she could just put him off for a few more days. Tannen, I can explain everything, but I can't do it right now. His eyebrows came together. Because of the party? She shook her head. No, I need a couple of days. Days? He leaned back. I can't wait days, Frost. I don't even know your last name. She squeezed her eyes shut in an effort to block his growing frustration. I know, and I can't tell you that either. He dropped his arms. I'm not sure what to say. I need you to trust me. Frost lifted her hands but managed to keep them off Tannen's chest, where they wanted to rest. Tell me you haven't lied to me from the moment we met. She had zero words. That's what I thought. Tannen went to walk away, but Frost grabbed his arm. Where are you going? I've been a fool for love before and I won't do it again. She dropped his arm. You can't possibly be comparing me to Brody's mother. I didn't say I'd been fooled the same way twice. Frost's heart pounded a frantic beat against her rib cage. The muscle worked so hard it felt like it would give out at any moment. Tannen, I may have lied about some things, but I never lied about loving you. Please, believe that, believe in me, believe in us enough to wait. I can't believe in a lie, Frost. He walked away, leaving her in the middle of the dance floor while couples swayed around her, dreaming of white Christmases and mistletoe kisses. Their happiness should have went right to her soul, but Tannen's stricken look had created a fog that blocked everything. For the first time in existence, Frost was numb to all feeling except that of her throat closing over with sorrow. She fought to breathe while navigating the throng of people. She managed to make it to the kitchen before the big tears fell. Zuzu came in a few minutes later, carrying an empty tray. Sweetie, what's the matter? Frost shook her head. I have to go. Will you tell my mom I went home? Zuzu wrung her hands. Now? The party's still going. It'll be fine without me. Just leave the mess. I'll come in early tomorrow morning to clean up. With Christmas being on Tuesday, and this being Friday night, no one was expected at the mill until Wednesday morning. She'd have time to clean up and clean out her desk before Tannen came back to work. Zuzu stepped in front of her. I can't let you go without a hug, you look like you could use it. Frost hugged her back. Thanks, Zuzu. I've never had as good of a friend as you. Oh. Zuzu rubbed her back. If you want to talk, let me know. I can be at your place in 15 minutes. Thanks. Frost ducked out the door. 
The bluesy strains of Christmas just ain't Christmas without you shadowed her down the hallway, cutting off when the exterior door thudded shut. The only sound in the parking lot was the lonely crunch of snow under her shoes. She wrapped her coat tighter around her body, not because she needed the warmth, but because she needed something to hold her together. Frost climbed into her car and started it up. She drove back to the rental on autopilot. When she got there, she didn't bother turning on lights. Instead, she went straight to her room and climbed, fully clothed, into her bed. Struggling with the sheet, she managed to get her heels off and drop them on the side of the bed. It was there, in the darkness, that a truly scary thought arrived like an unwelcome holiday guest. If Tannen changed his mind about Christmas because of what she'd done, Christmas wouldn't recover. The North Pole would continue to tip until it fell apart. The elves would turn to elfin dust, the magic would fizzle out, and Santa wouldn't be able to deliver gifts. She'd messed up so much more than her love life. Out there were children in hospitals, many of them like Tannen, who needed to believe in magic. It shone like a beacon and got them through hard times. She cried harder for them than she did for herself. And as much as she took on the despair of others, breaking Christmas might just break her. Chapter 28 Tannen paced the front room, unable to sit because nothing that happened the night before sat well with him. He couldn't put two and two together. Frost was the kindest, most giving person on the planet, and yet she had lied to him. He ran his hand over his head and then scrubbed the back of his neck. Dad walked by the doorway and then backtracked. What's going on? Tannen shook his head and sat on the edge of the couch, his knees bent and his elbows on his knees. Nothing. Right. You've worn a pattern in the carpet for no reason. Tannen glanced at his dad and then looked away. If he was quiet, dad would leave. Dad sighed. He walked around the armchair and then settled in. He laced his shaking fingers together and rested his chin on top of them. When you were sick, I couldn't stand to see you suffer as you did. I used work as an excuse to miss your appointments. He dropped his chin. Bless your mother, she let me. She was the strong one. I let her carry too much. He cleared his throat. I couldn't stand the thought of the putting her through that again, so I, uh... I had a procedure done so we wouldn't have any more children. That got Tannen's attention. His mouth dropped open. Does mom know? Dad pressed his lips into a thin line. She does now. I didn't tell her back then. We're going to counseling. He cleared his throat. The counselor thought it would be a good idea to tell you, so you would understand why we've clung to Brody so tightly. Tannen scooted back into the cushions, not sure he was ready to hear more. When we saw him in the hospital, it was like we'd been given a gift, another chance. But we're coming to realize that some decisions aren't reversible and you have to figure out how to live with the consequences. He tugged his ear. It's a big pill to swallow. Wow. Tannen hadn't even begun to process the information. We'll try to back off a little give you and Frost some space to make your own family with Brody. Who knows? We might like being the cool grandparents. Tannen shook his head. Frost and I. We aren't. There was this thing. Dad stared at him for a long time. Long enough that Tannen had to shift positions so his good leg didn't fall asleep. Finally he said, if you love her, really love her, then don't let her go. But if you can see a life without her, then perhaps it's for the best. He rubbed his palms together. Dad Advice 101. Tannen chuckled. The weight of the ring-sized jewelry box suddenly heavy in his pocket. It's good advice. Dad put his hand on Tannen's prosthetic knee. Tannen sucked in. Dad had never touched his leg before. Then what are you waiting for? Tannen cringed. 
He wasn't quite sure what he was going to say to her, but he felt bad for not believing in her enough to wait her out a few days. A few days? What was that? It was a blink in the grand scheme of things, and he'd not even bothered to give her a wink. She'll be mad at me. I walked out on her. Woo her. Turn on that sea boo charm. Tannen rolled his eyes as he got to his feet. Brody's helping mom wrap neighbor gifts. Call if he needs me, will you? You bet. Dad leaned back in the chair and picked up a golf magazine off the side table. Take your time. Tannen drove to Frost's house faster than he should have. He knocked on the door and rang the bell, snapping his fingers in anticipation. The door stayed shut, the light stayed off. He turned away, feeling as though he was pulling Jacob Marley's chains along behind him. He'd come back in a little while and then a while after that until he found Frost and they worked this out. Chapter 29 Frost sat between her grandparents during Sunday services. She wore a lightweight sundress in Christmas green with beadwork around the hem that brushed her ankles and whispered the sound of jingle bells. Palm leaf fans swirled above their heads to create a breeze for those in the congregation who struggled with the heat. Thankfully, Baron, Grandpa's reindeer, didn't have the same aversion to her that those back at the North Pole seemed to have. He'd let her hitch a ride to church in Cabo San Lucas without dropping her in the ocean. Of course, Grandpa had a tight hold on the reins in Baron's feed bucket, so the old guy wasn't likely to try anything fishy. Her mom had stayed long enough to see the last guest out of the mill and put things to rights. She'd sent leftover cookies and brownies home with the managers and their families, making sure they knew how grateful Bison was for the extra time they put in at the mill. Grandma and Grandpa had helped take out the trash, sweep the floor, and remove the lights from the ceiling. Grandpa didn't say, but she suspected Baron had an antler in the process. She couldn't count how many times she had wished for a flying reindeer while hanging them up. Afterward, Grandma had swept into her rental house, gathered her into the sleigh, and flown her to Mexico for some much-needed TLC. They'd sipped cocoa with chili powder as Frost told Grandma all that had happened, from the first letter to the last goodbye. Grandma'd get her tongue and clucked about honesty in a relationship, which Frost listened to with a leaden heart. She ached for Tannen. The pastor, a man shorter than Frost with silver hair, continued his sermon. There's no mountain too tall for God. You may think things are bad in your life. You may even feel as though you are buried in the depths of the sea. But God sees you, and he calls you his. Frost took comfort in the knowledge that she belonged to someone. God would never forsake her. He loved all his children even when they screwed up. The pastor wrapped up the sermon, and they headed out for a lunch of fresh fish and mango salsa. As they were sitting around the table, Frost picking at her food, Grandpa said, I liked what you did on Main Street with the nativity. It's stunning. Thanks, but Joseph carved it. I know, I recognized his work. But I'm talking about the note board. Frost sat up. What board? The one on the stable wall. Grandpa fished his cell phone out of his shirt pocket. He lifted his nose, squinted, and then went back into the pocket to find his glasses. Frost sat on her hands and bounced in her seat. Finally, he tapped the screen a couple of times and handed her the phone. She held it close to her face. There, behind the baby Jesus, were hundreds of notes tacked to the stable wall. She zoomed in and was able to read one. Thank you, Jesus, for my children. She moved the screen to find another one. Thank you for my home. And another. My biggest blessing is being able to go back to school. I talked to my daughter for the first time since she ran away. She's coming home for Christmas. Thank you, Jesus. Her head spun. Are all these thank you notes? Grandpa nodded. Most. Some are lists of blessings. Some are prayers. 
Frost set the phone down next to her plate. I didn't do this. I had no idea. Grandma patted her hand. You did. You brought Christmas back to Elderberry, and the Holy Spirit followed. Frost's eyes dropped to her plate. I can't take credit. I wasn't honest. Grandpa's blue eyes twinkled. Well, the Lord works with who he has. And no one's perfect, sugar, added Grandma. The important thing is to keep trying to spread good in the world. Frost let that soak in. She spoke slowly as her thoughts came together, some assembly required. I wasn't doing that in the mail room, and I think that's why I behaved like a small person. But since I've been in Elderberry, trying to make a difference, I feel bigger. She smiled ruefully. I think Mom was trying to tell me that the other night. That it wasn't about organizing a party or planning a parade, it was about going through something hard and letting it refine me. Losing Tannen was hard, Grandma agreed. Frost winked. I think I may still have a shot. What do you have in mind? Grandpa loved a good show. Hang on. Frost picked up Grandpa's phone and dialed Ginger, putting the call on speaker. She picked up on the first ring. Hey, Gramps. Grandpa leaned close to the phone and yelled, Hello, Sugar Plum. Hi, Ginger. Frost? Yeah, it's me. I'm in Mexico. I'm going to patch in the others. She made short work of getting a lot of people on the phone, saving Stella for last. Stella answered with a groan. Grandpa, you know it's the day before Christmas Eve, right? Grandpa chuckled and pointed at Frost, telling her she'd better explain. It's me. What's the dire emergency, Frost? Because someone had better be stuck up a chimney for you to be calling me today. Hey, griped Ginger. Oh, good, groused Frost, we're all here. Every one of us, dear, responded Mom as a warning to keep her sarcasm to a minimum. Start talking. I've got Toxalot dolls that need shoes, Stella barked. Frost felt the rush of Christmas. If she were home, she'd be reading her eyes raw right now. She needed to make this work. I believe this is what Grandpa would call a Hail Mary. Frost rubbed her hands together and motioned for her grandparents to move in closer as she explained her plan. When she was done, she held her breath. She'd never be able to pull this off without her family. I know you're all super busy, but, well, I'm hoping this will level things off at home and we can go back to Christmas as normal. Leveling off would be the preferable course of action, said Quick. He'd been silent through her whole explanation, and she was grateful for his support. Sometimes, she didn't know what her uber-smart brother-in-law thought of her love of textiles and penchant for high-elf fashion. I'll stay here and monitor things so Lux can come. She should be there. Frost fisted her hands and pulled them against her cheeks. There's a navy ball gown in your closet. Please wear it. She bought the dress four months ago, knowing it would look stunning on her sister. And Robin, we picked up that navy dress when you were here. I know the one. I've been dying for a reason to put it on. Frost squealed. Stella. You'll be lucky to have me in whatever I have on. Christmas Eve toy production, Frost reminded herself. Cobalt blue? If you have it. It'll make your light skin glow. She threw that last part out as an incentive, hoping Stella would take 30 seconds to find the dress. Frost closed her eyes and pictured the paintings in the Hall of Santa's past. Ginger, you and Joseph will have to go into the archives to find Great Grandpa's and Grandma's blue velvet. I'm already halfway there, Ginger promised. And I'm so excited to wear old people's clothing, added Joseph, deadpan. What about me, Auntie Frost? chirped Layla. Frost chewed her lip. Wear your Halloween princess dress. 
My costume? She could picture her niece scrunching her nose. It's silver, isn't it? Yes. Then it's perfect. You are a Christmas princess, after all. Layla squealed. Frost's heart leapt. She wanted a daughter so badly. Mom. I'll take care of me and your dad. I think I get where you're going with all this. Frost nodded quickly, even though they couldn't see it. I'll whip up something for Grandma and Gramps in my Kringle bag, and we'll meet you in Elderberry. Don't forget my dress. It's in the back of my closet. I won't, dear. Mom's smile came through in her voice. Dad? He'd been silent, and she needed to hear his jolly voice. Do you think this will work? Dad sniffed. If it doesn't, he doesn't deserve you. Frost's face scrunched up. After all she'd done, the years of misleading them and breaking a Santa rule, her dad still thought she was worth defending. Love you, Dad. A chorus of I love yous came through the line, and then they all hung up. Frost giggled. I can't believe I'm doing this. Well, you aren't doing anything sitting there. We need to get back to Elderberry. Grandma was on her feet, snatching Grandpa's plate right out from underneath him. He scowled. Frost patted his tummy. Don't worry. I have cookies at my place. He smiled, his beard lifting. Let's go win the heart of this young man. Frost giggled nervously. She hoped Tannen's heart was still up for winning. Chapter 30 Tannen paced in front of the baby blue convertible. His family was in the grocery parking lot around the corner from Main Street. The marching band's rendition of Sleigh Ride rang through the air. He'd looked between buildings only to find the back of hundreds of people lined up to watch the parade. She's here somewhere. You'll find her, Mom called after him. She and Dad were all smiles tonight. They'd approached the parade with childlike glee that rivaled Brody's excitement. It seemed everyone in town floated on a wave of Christmas cheer. Tannen wasn't as cheery as the rest of Elderberry. Oh, he felt the Christmas spirit, all right, and he had a lighter heart than he had in a long time, but he wanted Frost. Wanted to hold her close and tell her how much he loved her over and over again. He'd asked everyone he'd met if they'd seen Frost. Almost all of them had seen her at some time during the day, but no one knew where she was now. Dad patted Brody on the back, encouraging him to scoot over and make room for Tannen on the back seat of the blue convertible. You're not going to find her back here. Come on. We were supposed to go first, and now we're at the end. I'm coming, Tannen grumbled. The driver, another Santa lookalike with a white beard and a blue business suit, held the front seat forward so Tannen could step into the back. He managed to get in without any trouble. The driver flipped the seat back, his blue eyes twinkling. I think you're going to like this seat. Best one in the house. Tannen nodded absently. The longer he was away from Frost, the more agitated he became. They maneuvered into position and made their way to Main Street, waiting for the announcer to give them their cue. The street, which had bustled only moments before, suddenly went quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, if you please welcome our Grand Marshals, the Cebu family. A chair went up, and Tannen's attention went to the faces in the crowd. There was Cratchit, his bowler hat perched on his head and his arm around his wife. He gave Tannen a thumbs up. There were other employees and familiar faces from church. Tannen smiled and waved, not wanting to let his pain ruin this moment for everyone else. He contemplated not riding in the parade, but in the end, he couldn't turn his back on the old and also new Christmas tradition. The float in front of them turned off Main Street, and Tannen realized there was a stage set up at the end of the square. It was all lit up and covered in snowflakes. Frost outdid herself, Tannen said. She always loved a party, 
said the driver. He parked the car right in front of the stage and got out, pulling his seat forward. Mom motioned for him to get out. She and Dad were grinning widely. Brody looked between the three of them, wondering what was going on. At least Tannen wasn't the only one who was lost. Tannen gave the driver a questioning look. He reached into his suit pocket and pulled out a gold embossed envelope. Aged and well handled, Tannen recognized his own eight year old script. He stared into the bluest eyes he'd ever seen, watched as they twinkled with Christmas magic, and believed he was staring at Santa himself. Santa spoke quietly. You captured my daughter's heart with one letter, Tannen C. Boo. Your daughter? Tannen reached for the envelope, hardly believing what he saw. You know Miss Kringle? He let out a hearty ho 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 so do you. Tannen shook his head, and it was like his thoughts tumbled into place. Frost. Santa tapped the side of his nose. The marching band played a quick burst of trumpets as if they were announcing royalty. A couple wearing blue Santa costumes climbed stairs at the back of the stage. The crowd went crazy waving at them. A young girl in a silver dress walked with them. Tannen caught sight of a tinsel tattoo on the woman's arm, glinting in the stage lights. Ginger? He glanced at Santa for confirmation. And Joseph? He's a carpenter by trade but fills out the suit nicely, don't you think? And that's Layla, she's our Christmas princess. Tannen grinned. This was Miss Kringle's, Frost's, real family. He could hardly believe what he was seeing, and yet he knew exactly who they were. Next came Lux and Robin, he'd recognize Lux's curly red hair anywhere, and Robin had a biggest sister air about her. According to Frost's letters, Lux's husband was wanted all over the world and couldn't exactly show up at a public event. Mom grabbed Dad's sleeve. They're dresses, she said reverently. Tannen laughed. He'd bet dollars to donuts Frost picked them out. There was a mad ringing of jingle bells and the sound of sled runners on concrete. Tannen only recognized the sound because he'd heard it when he pushed the sled through the big door. Half a breath later, Stella, wearing navy leggings, a silver miniskirt, and a gray fur top, stepped up on the arm of a man Tannen couldn't place. She glanced at him from under lowered lashes. He stared around in wide-eyed wonder as if he couldn't quite believe he was there. That's my cue. Santa hopped spryly onto the stage to take Gail's hand as she made her way to the growing group of Kringles. Behind her were Frost's grandparents, also dressed to the nines. Frost's touch was all over everything happening on stage, and Tannen's heart was calling for her. He rose up on his tiptoes to see over the stage, but the stairs were empty. The band leader lifted his arms, and the flutes trilled, the drumline pounded out a slow march, and then a spotlight lit up a piano set back under an awning. He hadn't even seen it there. Tim, the intern who was always a jumble of nerves, cracked his knuckles and smiled right at Tannen before plunking out the first few notes of A Thousand Years. The band picked up what would have been the vocals, and the whole square flooded with romance. The crowd in front of Mrs. Grant's bakery parted to reveal Frost in a gown of pure white. The crowd gasped. Tannen could find no words, nor could he feel his body. Seeing her had transported him to another state of being. The only sound he could hear above the music was the pounding of his heart telling him this was a dream, a perfect dream. She floated over the cobblestones, her amethyst eyes reflecting thousands of fairy lights. Her hair was plaited loosely, with wisps framing her heart-shaped face. When she was several feet from him, he fell to his knee and reached for her hand. His robotic leg poked out at an angle, but he didn't care that everyone could see his flaw, because Frost didn't once look at it. Their gazes had come together and Tannen never wanted to look away. She smiled, stepping closer and taking his outstretched hand. The crowd clapped wildly. He turned, smiling at them all, and reached into his pocket to pull out the ring box. Those in the front saw what he had, and they cheered even louder, spreading the news to the people in the back. 
Frost Kringle. He paused because he was simply too full of joy to continue. Her thumb brushed over his fingers, and he laughed. She laughed too, his joy mirrored in her eyes. I've waited my whole life for you. You've seen me at my worst, and I hope you've seen me at my best. When I'm with you, I see the joy in every moment, because you are made up of, he chuckled, of sugar and spice and holly berries and mistletoe. I can't see a future without you in it. Will you marry me? Well, I already have a dress, she teased. Yes. Tannen used her hand to pull himself up. He flashed back to the day she'd offered her hand on the rock and he'd refused her help. He'd been a fool. Frost's arms came around his neck and he pulled her close, sealing the promise with a kiss. The crowd cheered, and soon the two of them were about run over by Brody. He and Frost looped their arms around the kid and included him in the hug. You look stunning, Tannen whispered in her ear. I'm glad you think so, and I hope you don't have cold feet, because we're about to say I do. What? Tannen squinted at her. Come on. I'll introduce you to the pastor. Frost took his hand with her right and Brody's with her left and led the way to the stage. You're good with a quick engagement? she asked over her shoulder. Tannen's gaze fell over her fancy hairdo, the graceful slope of her neck, and down the dress that she wore like a queen, and then back up to the come-hither look on her face. He grinned. This woman could be his before the end of the night. The shorter, the better. She stopped at the car. Will you join us? she asked his parents. They climbed out of the car and followed them all up on stage. At the top, Frost whispered something to Brody and he scampered off to stand by Layla. Her parents motioned for his parents to join them in the line that was quickly looking like a wedding line. Frost took a microphone from Zuzu. Poor Zuzu was so overcome with emotion she had mascara running down her cheeks. She hugged Frost quickly and then ran off stage. Hello, Elderberry. Frost lifted her and Tannen's hands over her head. The crowd clapped and some yelled hello back. When I started planning the light parade, I didn't know I was planning my wedding. They laughed with her, and she turned to give Tannen a million-dollar smile. He shook his head, amazed that this woman wanted to be his. But it worked out just right. We're going to get married now. She giggled, and once again the women all sighed at the romance. The man who had come with Stella stepped forward and shook Tannen's hand. Hi, I'm Pastor Willis. From Alaska? asked Tannen. He'd read about Ginger and Joseph's big wedding and Lux's elopement. This was the man who'd performed the ceremonies. The fact that he was standing there, shaking hands with a man who had appeared only in letters from Santa's daughter, was surreal. Pastor Willis pumped his arm. Yeah, how did you? You know what, there's all sorts of things going on tonight that I don't want explained. Let's get you two married. Tannen put his arm around Frost. Sounds good to me. The pastor took the microphone. He looked lost for a moment before Stella handed him a worn and weathered Bible. He thanked her and then did a double take. Running his hand down his face, he opened to where a red ribbon lay between the pages. We're gathered here, before these witnesses, to join Tannen C. Boo and Frost Kringle in matrimony. As if on cue, large, romantic snowflakes began to fall. Tim played softly in the background, the music too pretty to put to words. Frost's finger ran across his knuckles, and Tannen was back to only hearing his heart beat and seeing Frost. She was the most beautiful bride in all of creation. And she wanted him. His mind replayed every moment from her first letter to what brought them here today. Their beginning didn't start with that letter, though, it started with a broken little boy in a hospital bed who asked for a leg but whose heart begged for a friend. He'd gotten the wish of his heart and so much more. At some point he said I do and so did Frost. 
he and Frost led the group off the stage and around the corner. As soon as they were out of sight of the family, they burst into a run, including his parents and Brody. Tannen did his best to keep up. Really, he just followed Frost. My head's in the clouds. He laughed at himself. Just you wait, called Stella, racing past them. Can you take the pastor home? She asked her parents as she ran. You flew him here? Gail scolded. Someone had to arrange for a pastor. Stella shrugged. They rounded another corner and were in an empty parking lot. Well, empty except for several sleighs complete with reindeer and jingle bells. Cool. Tannen grinned at Frost. Ginger and Joseph ran past, Ginger holding her skirts up, revealing white boots. Congratulations. We gotta go. Love you, Frost. Joseph slid across the front of a green sleigh Dukes of Hazard style. Ginger threw back her head and ho-ho-hoed at his move. That was so hot. She grabbed the reins and called, on, Dasher. With a flick of her wrist, the reindeer strained against his harness and they lifted off the ground, disappearing in a swirl of snowflakes. Whoa! Brody stared after them. Did you see that? He asked his grandparents. Tannen's parents didn't have an answer. Tannen grabbed them both in a hug, laughing heartily. I can explain everything. Stella pecked a kiss on Pastor Willis's cheek. It's been a real treat, darling, but I have to jet. She too had a red sleigh. With a wink at the pastor, she called, on, blitz, and was gone in a flash of light. The pastor stared after her, his mouth hanging open. After a moment, he reached up and touched his cheek where Stella had kissed him. Lux and Robin slowed down as they approached. Lux had her phone to her nose, reading as she walked. Quick says we're level back home. I need to help him take out the shims and make sure the substation wasn't damaged in the shift. She grabbed Frost in a hug. Congratulations on the wedding. I'll bet you wish you'd let me make you a wedding dress now. Frost hugged her back. Lux rolled her eyes for Tannen. Quick liked my cargo pants just fine. Robin didn't let them breathe before she hugged Frost too. I'm going to miss our single Kringle meetings. You're what now? Tannen asked. Frost hadn't told him everything in her letters. Nothing you need to worry about, quipped Robin. She hugged him too. I hate to run, but we still have chocolate Santas to load before the sleigh leaves. Go. We'll be right behind you. Frost shooed her and Lux into the green sleigh, and they took off. Tannen took her by the hand. We will? I have to check last-minute letters. Frost's smile was huge. Do you want to see the North Pole? She asked Brody. Can I? He breathed the question. Of course. You're a Kringle now. Brody threw his arms around her middle. That means you're my mom. Time stopped as she cupped the back of his head. Her eyes filled with tears and cascaded down her cheeks. Tannen didn't think his heart could grow any larger, but those words, spoken with such eagerness, and the sight of Frost holding his son, their son, undid him. He heard sniffing and turned around to see his parents holding on to one another as they sobbed. We'll visit, he offered. Mom swiped at her cheeks. It's not that. Then what is it? You were meant to be a family. Dad gripped Brody's hand and shook it. It's easy to see that you belong together. I don't know how we missed it before. Mom nodded. It's like God orchestrated it all from the beginning. Tannen caught Frost's gaze. I think he did. Frost's chin dipped in agreement. Dad lifted a hand. I don't want you to worry about the mill. I'm going to step in and take over. 
I heard your speech at the party, and I agree, the mill is family, and I should take care of her. Tannen pumped his hand and pumped and pumped as his mind swirled over the idea that his parents were backing off of adopting Brody and giving Tannen the space to be himself. Thanks, Dad. We can give you a ride home, Mr. and Mrs. Cebu. Clarence, Frost's dad, swung a set of keys from his finger. In style. They all laughed, releasing a little of the heaviness that had come on with Mom and Dad's heartfelt confessions. Even the pastor had stopped staring into the night and was smiling broadly at them. He was a little older than Tannen and wore heavy clothing, like what the forest guys wore to work. Wherever he had come from must have been cold. I don't know why you love that car so much. Gail slapped Clarence's arm playfully. Frost's parents were everything he pictured Santa and Mrs. Claus to be, well, they were a bit younger. It's a classic. He winked at her before telling Frost and Tannen, we'll see you at home. They all trooped back to the 54 convertible left in front of the stage, pastor included. Frost clapped her hands. I can't wait to get there. She ushered Brody into the last sleigh, the old reindeer looking over his shoulder at her and huffing out a breath. I swear, Max, if you are ornery on my wedding day, I'm going to take away your hay cubes for a month. Max shook his antlers and stamped a hoof. I'm glad you understand what's at stake. Frost motioned for Tannen to get in. Come on, it's Christmas Eve. There's so much to do. She bounced. Brody was busy running his hands over the velvet seat and tracing each carving with his fingertips in awe. His boy was about to have the Christmas of his life. For that matter, so was Tannen. He stepped into the sleigh and put his hands on Frost's hips, pulling her close. She lifted her chin, bringing her lips within kissing distance. We can't go until I've kissed the bride. Her mouth formed a small O, and she suddenly grew shy. Tannen took his time, running his fingertips over her cheekbone and down her jaw. She sighed into him, her arms running up his arms and around his neck. I can't call you Miss Kringle anymore. Nope. I'm officially a missus. He kissed her lightly. I love you, wife. I love you, husband. With those words, Tannen's heart burst through the final size restriction and swelled to a love so big he couldn't contain it. Frost moaned softly against his lips and he deepened the kiss, wanting her to feel and know and trust in his love for her. She returned his kiss and he felt it inside his whole soul, the love that had been growing for years finally bursting forth in full bloom. They broke apart, gasping for breath. Tannen whispered in her ear, Take us home. She kissed him once again. That's my home. He chuckled. Is that why I feel like we're flying? Frost blinked. We are flying. The sky and stars blurred past them. They turned in unison to see Brody holding the reins, a grin as wide as the Big Dipper stretched across his face. They burst out laughing. Frost ruffled his hair. You're going to make an awesome Kringle. She pointed to the North Star. Aim for that, and we'll be home before you can say Merry Christmas. Brody pulled on the right rein and adjusted course. Tannen pulled Frost into his arms and just held her, grateful that he could. She'd given him so much throughout his life, hope, friendship, someone to be better for, and unconditional, unequivocal love. He said the only words he could think of that would be an adequate thank you for his Miss Kringle. Merry Christmas, Frost. Her face softened and she cupped his cheek. Merry Christmas, Tannen. I hope you're ready for what awaits us. I am. He was more than ready, he was eager to take his place among the first family of Christmas. But more importantly, he was ready to be the man Frost had always believed him to be. Chapter 31 Frost rushed into the letters room to find a small stack in the incoming box. Her fingertips tingled and she ripped the first one open with wild abandon. 
I never want to be banished again. Tannen came in behind her. Then stay off the naughty list. She stuck her tongue out at him. Easy for you to say. Hard for me to do with you looking so ravishing in that gown. Her cheeks positively burned. Honeymoon? She squeaked. He put his finger on the back of his ear. What was that? His rakish smile told her that he'd hurt her just fine and that he enjoyed making her blush. Where do you want to go on our honeymoon? Hmm. Cappadocia. Why there? Because no one will bother us. He trailed his fingers up her arm, sending shivers to all the right places. Cappadocia it is. She could barely get the words past the desire coursing through her veins. You have to stand over there, or there will be thirty-five children disappointed tomorrow morning because I didn't read their letters. Tannen gave her that newly discovered rogue grin once again. Fine. He took two large steps away and then spun in a small circle. I've pictured this place a thousand times. She smiled without lifting her eyes from the page. This one was a recap, he mentioned that he'd written before. She scanned quickly for changes to his wish list, found none, and set the letter aside, moving on. Falling into her old work was as easy as putting on a glass slipper, but the whole time she read, the stack growing smaller and smaller, she was aware that Tannen was in the room. He introduced himself to the elves, saying something personal to each one. He must have pored over her letters to remember the small details in their lives that she'd mentioned in passing. She set the last letter in the finished pile for the elves to file. Frost looked at her husband, all handsome and strong, and decided he belonged here in letters all along. He filed with ease and read just a few, leaving most of the reading for her to do. When the work was over, or it took too much time, up her neck, with great skill, his kisses did climb. And then she'd forget about dear Santa's and I've been smarts. And let Tannen's kisses slowly take her apart. And the moment fluffed and grew with bliss. And they kissed and they kissed and they kissed, 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 kissed. With each kiss that came from Tannen Cebu, she fell deeper in love and her heart grew and grew. Epilogue Robin Kringle Robin Robin Kringle made her way into the family gathering room. The warm wooden paneling called to her. Though she loved living in an ice castle, the blue and white walls were too bright for her mood today. She needed walnut wood and a yule log to chase away her blues. Chocolate would help too, which was why she had a small box of hand-dipped, homemade lemon truffles in one hand and a cup of cherry hot chocolate in the other. The ovens were misbehaving, acting like they were in a tropical climate instead of the North Pole. Her strawberry candy canes had come out limp and sticky, and the watermelon ones weren't worth talking about. Baking was supposed to be the easy part of life. Recipes had specific instructions, and when followed, they resulted in beautiful confections delivered by Santa and enjoyed by children the world over. She pushed the door with her hip, but it stuck and she bounced off, splashing hot chocolate on her hand. Growling, she balanced the box on top of the cup, shook off her fingers, swiped her hand on her raspberry-colored apron, and gave the door a good shove. It popped open with a wood-on-wood -wood scrape that sent shivers over her arms. The sound also startled two of her sisters, Stella and Ginger, who had been sitting on the couch. They popped up like kids caught sneaking cookie dough. Come to think of it, Stella had a glint in her eye that said they may have raided Robin's cookie stash before hiding in the family room. What are you two up to? she asked, making her way to the large red brick fireplace. She set her cup and box on the side table, next to Mom's rocker, and faced her sisters. Stella, the only other single Kringle, as she liked to call them, picked up her laptop and hugged it to her chest. Right now? Nothing. Her black hair was past her shoulders now. 
She'd chopped it off and worn it spiky several years ago and had been growing it out since. Ginger shoved Stella. Tell her. Stella twisted her lips. I don't think it's a good idea. The two of them locked eyes and battled it out silently. Robin groaned. These two had spent the year plotting out matchmaking schemes for Robin. They'd tried online dating, a bust. Asking friends from college to set her up, epic fail. And hitting the single scene in every major city from London to Singapore, exhausting and often embarrassing, as Robin had major dance skills from the 2000s but none from this decade. Each new scheme had a higher level of desperation that scrambled Robin's confidence like a fork whisking egg yolks. Three of her younger sisters had found true love and saved Christmas in the process. As the oldest, she should have been the first to stand at the altar. Yet here she was, 32 years old and counting, with no husband, children, or Christmas hero status to her name. Stella finally broke eye contact with Ginger and flipped on Robin, her face a mask of fake serenity. How much do you love me? Instantly weary, Robin squinted. Why? Stella lifted onto her tiptoes, making her knee-high black leather boots crinkle. Because I just solved your marriage problem. Ginger cut in. The wood in the castle is swelling. Do you know what that means? That it needs an ibuprofen? Stella snarked. Ginger stuck her fists on her wide black belt. Her red velvet skirt swished around her ankles as she paced the room. It's absorbing water. She moved to the bookshelf and wrapped her knuckles on the back. It sounded thick. The castle is melting. Melting! Robin snatched up the chocolate box and popped a morsel of chocolate lemony goodness in her mouth. The milk chocolate melted on her tongue in the most soothing way, and the lemon came in with a kick that started her thinking process. How fast! Lux estimates the integrity of the ice will be at zero on Christmas Day. Ginger spoke low, as if she was afraid the walls would hear her and start to worry. In this room were items more valuable than her store of gourmet candy flavorings. The carpet they'd gathered on as children to open presents, the mantle where they'd hung their stockings every year, the family painting above the fireplace, all of it could be ruined by water. And then there were the elves and the reindeer to worry about. None of them could swim, and both were tied to Christmas magic. If the magic went away, the elves turned to dust and the reindeer couldn't fly. They'd be forced out into the frozen north to roam as a wild herd. Maybe they'd make it far enough to find food, but that was a slim possibility. The only way to save them was for either her or Stella to get married this year, before Christmas. Robin undid her apron and folded it with crisp movements. An internal battle began inside of Robin. On the one end of the field was her vast understanding of the damage rejection can do to a sensitive Kringle heart. Her longtime boyfriend had broken up with her three years ago, and she still felt insignificant inside when she thought of him. On the other end of the field was her sense of self-preservation. Stella had some looney-tooney ideas, and she loved nothing more than to involve her sisters. Robin plopped on the couch and asked in a monotone voice, what did you have in mind? I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I'm curious. Stella sat up and crossed her legs. The small bells on her boots jingled as she bounced her foot. She twirled a strand of black hair around her finger. So I was watching a movie, and I saw this commercial for a dating show. Robin shot to her feet. I'm out. She had a hard enough time flirting when there weren't witnesses, having a whole television crew watch her would be like watching the Polar Express slide off the tracks and not being able to stop it. Listen. Stella grabbed her hand to stop her from walking away. You don't have to actually go out with them on camera. They line up three possible guys, and you pick one. 
super easy. You don't even have to see them. There's partitions and stuff so you're not judging them by their looks, added Ginger. What did Joseph say about this? Robin's introverted brother-in-law preferred the solitude of his woodshop to literally anything else that involved people. Well, people except for Ginger and Layla, his niece they were raising together. And maybe the Kringle clan. The poor guy had been the first one to marry into the family of five women and spent the year hiding out. Things were better when Lux brought Quick into the family. Then came Tannen. The guys hung together and got along great. Still, if anyone thought this was a harebrained idea, it would be Joseph, and she was counting on him backing her up. Ginger twisted her fingers together. He said he'd never do it, but maybe you should. What? Robin made a mental note to stop all cinnamon cookie deliveries to the woodshop. It's low risk, high reward. Ginger shrugged. Besides, we're running out of time here. Robin considered her other options and found that there weren't any. She could hit the clubs again or reopen her dating profile, but just the thought of that was tedious. Okay, I'll do it. Ee -e -e. Stella hopped to her feet and jumped up and down, making her hair bounce. I'm going to make you a TV star. Robin held up a palm. No. We're not playing dress up. I go as myself or I don't go at all. She tried on Stella's clothing before. Not only did it not fit her the same way it fit her icicle thin sister, the leopard print skirts and black tops muffled her happiness. The clothing she and Lux picked out, with bright splashes of color and tailored seams, brought out the woman she was and the one she wanted to be. I agree. Ginger wrapped her arm around Robin's waist. The scent of ginger snaps overwhelmed Robin, and she wrinkled her nose. Not that she didn't love a good cookie, she just preferred fruity scents and flavors. People told her she smelled like vanilla bean. She'd always found that quite plain as far as scents and flavors went. Okay, fine. No drastic makeovers, Stella begrudgingly consented. But can we please, please, please ask Frost to whip up some new clothes? She got a shipment of fabric on a Black Friday deal. Robin shook her head. It's December 3rd, letters are pouring in. Yeah, but she has Tannen to help. Stella grabbed both their hands and tugged them to the door. Besides, we all know she won't sleep until after the holiday. Robin and Ginger exchanged shrugs. Frost probably would be up until the last letter was processed and the gift delivered. She had fantastic claws stamina. Even Ginger, who spent 24 hours delivering presents in an exhausting down-the-chimney, up-the-chimney routine, had to sleep every couple of days. To the mail room. Robin flopped her hand. I guess I'm going on the dating show. 30-minute match, Stella corrected. We get in, we get you a husband, we get out. Sounds like a plan. Ginger smiled. What it sounded like was a desperate attempt to trick a man into a first date. But hey, who was she to judge? She had 21 days to find a guy, fall in love, and get married. Thirty minutes was about all she had to offer. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the audiobook, please leave a comment below and hit that subscribe button for more full-length audiobooks and more of the Kringles, from USA Today best-selling author Lucy McConnell. You can find Lucy's books on Amazon. Merry Christmas!